Hello there, my name is Instructor Paul, and in this lecture, I'm going to be introducing myself to you so that you'll know a little bit more about me and who you're learning from. So let's start with my Udemy instructor experience, and there you can see my picture on the right-hand side of the screen. Now, I'm a part-time Udemy instructor, which means I go to a regular day job, I work eight hours a day, you know, 40 hours a week, and then in the evenings when I come home, I like to make course content, course lectures, and build courses on the Udemy platform for you guys. Now, I have over 100,000 students, I have over 9,000 student reviews, and I have seven best-selling Udemy courses, and all of these numbers are just at the time of this recording. So they could be higher or a little lower, just depending on what's going on in the marketplace. Now, you can follow me by going to instructorpaul.com forward slash Udemy. There you'll enter your email address, and I'll keep you current on my new course coupons for courses that I already have and course coupons for courses that I don't even teach. So let's talk about my IT experience now. Now I have 10 years of IT experience supporting various US agencies and that's ranging from the military to the DOD and so forth, you get the idea. Now most of my experience is built around Windows Server 2008, 2016, doing Linux administration, that's Red Hat, CentOS, and Ubuntu, doing mass storage with things like EMC, uh, networking both the physical, and by physical I mean actually wiring the computers through the you know patch panels in the building uh, all the way back to the, the switch closets or the network closets and then configuring the HP and Cisco switches and things like that brocade switches all that kind of idea and I'm generally also responsible for the cybersecurity of the IT systems that I work on so if I'm setting up a Windows Server operating system or a Linux operating system or maybe mass storage or some kind of networking device I'm generally responsible for making sure that I harden that system and which means I'm making it more difficult for a malicious hacker to access the system or compromise the system now we also do scripting uh, where I work you know PowerShell bash um, batch Perl PHP that kind of thing anything that can we can automate redundant tasks and do different things like that so again you can follow me by going to instructorpaul.com forward slash Udemy and I'm going to give you discounts to all the courses I teach, just like I talked about, as far as I'll let you know when I'm creating new courses. And I will also send you site-wide Udemy discounts. So those are for courses that I don't teach because I can't teach everything under the sun. I'm only one guy and I'm, I'm doing this in my spare time in the evening. So sometimes I like to recommend courses that are good for your overall IT education. All right, so that is enough about me. Let's jump straight into the course and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Now it's time to download Windows Server 2016. Thankfully, Microsoft offers a free trial version for 2016 that anyone can download for evaluation or in our case, training purposes. To download Windows Server 2016, open your preferred web browser and navigate to technet.microsoft.com. Once the page loads, click on the Downloads page on the Navigation menu. You'll see a couple of options for TechNet downloads. Choose the arrow inside of the Windows Server 2016 box. Be sure that you select Windows Server 2016 and not the Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview 5. Before you can download Server 2016, you must sign in. Click on the Sign In button. Once you are brought to the sign-in page, you will either need to log into your existing Microsoft account or you will need to create a new one. You can create a new account by clicking the Create One button at the bottom of the page. Once you successfully logged in, you will be brought back to the Downloads page. Under Windows Server 2016, choose the file type ISO and click Register to continue. Now you will be prompted to enter various personal information such as your name, email address, etc. Enter in all the required information and click continue. The download will begin and you'll need to wait for the download to finish. Make sure you know where you're downloading the file so you can access it later. Notice the complicated name of the file. It's not named simply Windows Server 2016 so it's important that you make note of this name so you can find it later. That's it for this lecture. Great job, and I will see you in the next one. VirtualBox is a powerful x86 and AMD64 and Intel64 virtualization product for enterprise use as well as home use. Not only is VirtualBox an extremely feature-rich, high-performance product for enterprise customers, it is also the only professional solution that is freely available as open-source software 
under the terms of the General Public License version 2. To download VirtualBox, open your preferred web browser and navigate to virtualbox.org forward slash WIKI forward slash downloads. Click on the x86 slash AMD64 for Windows hosts or choose the correct option for your operating system. Once the download completes, launch the downloaded installer file to begin the installation. The setup wizard will appear. Click Next to start the installation. The following screen will prompt you to select the installation directory and the features you would like to install. If you would like to install VirtualBox in a location other than the default, which is your C drive, click the Browse to do so. Otherwise, click Next and continue. The next screen will prompt you to choose if you would like VirtualBox icons on your desktop or quick launch bar. This is user preference, but make sure to leave the box checked to register file extensions. Once you've made your selections, click Next. Now you'll be notified that you will lose network connectivity briefly. Make sure that this will not affect anything you're working on and click Yes to move forward. Now click the Install button. The installation will begin. During the installation you will see several pop-ups asking you to install different types of device software. Check the Always Trust Software from Oracle Corporation checkbox and click Install. Once the installation is complete, all you need to do is leave the Start Oracle VM Virtual Box after installation checkbox checked and click finish. That's it for this lecture. Great job getting this installed and I will see you in the next one. Hi, it's Paul Hill from ITFlee.com and in this lesson we're going to create a virtual network with VirtualBox. Now thankfully this is really easy to do and it's only a matter of a couple clicks. And the reason why we want to have this network is that it will allow our VM to access the internet as well as communicate with other virtual machines if you choose to create them. Now to do this, the first thing we need to do is open the VirtualBox Manager. Once you have the Manager open, in the top left corner you can click the File menu. And then select Preferences. You can also press Left Control or Right Control and G and it will also open the Preferences window. Now we want to go down to the Network tab. And we'll see the default option or the default tab that is open is the NAT Networks. What we'll want to do is click this little plus button on the right hand side of the screen. We can see that it adds a new NAT network. So when I click on this, the NAT network has been created. Now really we could just click OK and be done, but if you'd like to rename the network or change some of the settings, you can click on this little tool wrench on the right hand side, and we can call it something like My NAT Network. Whatever you'd like to put in here, it doesn't matter, just something that you can identify it by. Under the network CIDR, we're going to change this IP address, and I'm going to use 192.168.0.0 and forward slash 24. The forward slash 24 means we're going to use the entire subnet, so all 255 IP addresses that would be available in this subnet. The CIDR, if you're wondering, stands for Classless Interdomain Routing, and it's just an IP standard that allows you to uniquely identify devices on a network. As far as DHCP goes, you can leave that enabled. What that does is when you connect a new VM, it automatically assigns an IP address. It's very convenient, and for now, we're going to leave this enabled. We don't need to support IP version 6 because we're using IP version 4. And you only need to configure port forwarding for specific services that are running on specific VMs that are attached to this network. Now that may have gone straight over your head. Now if you didn't understand that, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Nine times out of ten, nobody touches this option. So just click OK. And then we'll click OK again. And now the network has been created. So we've successfully created our first virtualized network. And we can now use this virtual network when we create our virtual machine. Great job getting through this lesson. In the next lesson, you're going to learn how to create a virtual machine with VirtualBox. So go ahead and move on to the next lesson and let's keep learning. Hi, it's Paul Hill from ITFlee.com. And in this lesson, we're going to be creating a virtual machine with VirtualBox. At this point, you've downloaded and installed VirtualBox. You've downloaded Windows Server 2016 and you've created the virtual network. Now the next step is to create the virtual machine that will use everything we've created and downloaded so far. To get started, we need to open VirtualBox. So I'm going to pop that open. And we need to click the new button in the top left hand corner of the screen. Once the create virtual machine window appears, 
we need to click expert mode at the bottom of the screen. And that's because you're gonna be an expert by the time I get done with you. In all reality, it just makes it less screens, but we'll call you an expert, so. We need to type in the name of the VM, and I'm gonna type in IT Flea, because that's the name of my company, and I just wanna talk about it in front of you. <laughs> but you can call it whatever you want. You can call it, you know, your name, uh, your fake company name, whatever you wanna call it, or if you work for a company, you can call it that. It doesn't matter. It's not the actual name of the computer, it's just the name for the inventory of VirtualBox. Now, under the type, we're gonna leave it as Microsoft Windows. We could choose Linux, Solaris, and so on. We're gonna leave it at Windows. And under the version, we're gonna choose Server 2012 64-bit. You'll notice there's no 32-bit option for this. And if you're presented with only 32-bit options, as in you don't see Windows 7 64-bit or Windows 8 64-bit, if you're only presented with 32-bit options, that means one of two things. First, which is the best case scenario, is that you have a 64-bit processor, but you do not have virtualization enabled in your BIOS. If this is your case, then all you need to do is restart your host computer, go into your BIOS, and enable virtualization. Now, I can't tell you exactly how to do that because I don't know what kind of BIOS you have and all the menus are different. So Google the name or the model of your motherboard in how to enable virtualization. If you fall under the second issue where you don't have a 64-bit computer or operating system, then you're kind of in a tough spot. What I recommend that you do is either use a newer computer that is 64-bit or you can create a virtual machine online with a service like Amazon's AWS where you can remotely access the virtual machine and it won't be hosted on your computer. I do believe you, you can get some VMs for free, but I do know that the certain options will require money. Now, I'm gonna choose Windows Server 2012. Now, we are installing 2016, but VirtualBox has not added this to the list. Don't worry, because the Windows 2012 option will work just fine. Under memory size, I'm gonna scale mine to four gigabytes. So I'm gonna dra drag the slider up, and I'm gonna stop it right around here. So that's four gigs. Now you can get away with as little as one gig if you don't have a lot of RAM. So your computer only has four gigs of memory. You might wanna lower it to one if you think you need to, or you could probably leave it at two. If you plan on running more than one virtual machine at a time, you probably wanna get away with just one gig of RAM. Under the hard disk, we're gonna leave the create a virtual hard disk now button checked and we're gonna click create. Now on this screen, we need to choose the file location. We're gonna leave this default. It's gonna put it in the same folder as the VM and we need to choose the size of the hard drive. Now I'm gonna go ahead and bump this up to 80 gigabytes. And under storage on physical hard disk, this is the most important option, the second most important. I would say that this is the most important option, but the second most important option is the storage on the physical hard disk. You wanna leave it at dynamically allocated. And what this does is if you only have five gigabytes of data on the virtual machine, but you still set the maximum size to 80 gigabytes, that virtual machine will only take up five gigabytes on your host hard drive. So as you install programs and as you install software, the hard disk file that is stored on your computer will grow. If we choose fixed size, then VirtualBox will create a file that is 80 gigabytes in size, even if there is only five gigabytes of data actually being stored on the VM. So I'm gonna go with dynamically allocated and I'm gonna click create. Now we can see that my virtual machine, IT Flea, has been created and you should see the same thing. That's all we need to do to get this virtual machine created. In the next lesson, you're gonna configure the virtual machine and get it ready to install Windows Server 2016. Great job getting through this lesson, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Hey, it's Paul Hill from ITFleet.com, and in this lesson, we're going to be connecting the virtual machine we just created to the virtual network we've created, and we're going to mount the Windows Server 2016 ISO file that we downloaded earlier. To mount an ISO means to virtually insert a CD into a virtual computer. Don't let the lingo confuse you, it's really simple. All we need to do is open VirtualBox. Once VirtualBox is opened, we're gonna select the VM that we want to mount the ISO to. In this case, I'm choosing the VM that we just created. Right click and choose settings or press Control and S. Next, go to the storage tab on the left hand side. Select the empty disk icon. 
Now under the attributes, you can see there's another disk icon on the right hand side. We're going to click that drop down and then we're going to choose virtual optical disk file. Okay, so here's the file that I downloaded. So I'm going to select it and choose open. Now we need to navigate over to the network tab by clicking here on the left. And we can see that under adapter one, the network adapter is already enabled and it's attached to NAT. Now this is not the same as a NAT network. We need to select the drop down list and choose NAT network. Now here we can see the NAT network that I created earlier. And if you chose a different name, you'll see that here. Notice that I only have one in my list and unless you created more than one, you'll also have one. If you've created more than one, it really doesn't matter at this point since we only have one virtual machine. You can choose any of them. But I do recommend that you clean them up for the future when you want to create more VMs and connect them to the same network. Now click OK. And now the virtual machine has been configured so that it's on our NAT network and it has the Windows Server 2016 ISO mounted. In the next lesson, we're going to be installing Windows Server and then we'll move on from there and configure it and learn how to work with it. Great job getting through this lesson. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. We are ready to install Windows Server 2016 on our VM. First, we need to mount or attach the ISO we downloaded earlier to our VM and then we can launch the VM and begin the installation. Right click on the VM and choose settings. Select the storage tab and click on the empty disk icon followed by the disk drop down list on the right hand side of the screen. Select choose virtual optical disk file. Browse to the Windows Server ISO that we downloaded earlier and select Open. Now you will see the ISO is mounted to the VM. Click OK to close the settings window. The next time that we power on the virtual machine, it will boot to the CD and we can begin the installation. To power on the virtual machine, right click on the VM in the inventory and select Start, Normal Start. The VM will now begin to load the Windows installation files. This shouldn't take more than a few minutes. Once the files have loaded, you'll be prompted to select your language and keyboard input method. I will select the default options and click Next. On the next screen, choose the Install Now and you will be brought to the OS installation screen. Now, if you've installed Windows Server 2012, right away you're going to notice that unlike Windows Server 2012, there is no option for server with a GUI or server core. Instead, server with a GUI is now called desktop experience. Now if you do not select one of the desktop experience options, then you're going to install what's known as server core. Server core is an advanced option that only allows users to interact with the server on a command line basis. Now you might ask why would you ever want to install server core? And the reason for this is that since there's no graphical user interface, the server is much more lightweight and less resource intensive. Now, unlike in server 2012, where the data center and standard versions contain the exact same set of features and the only difference was licensing capabilities, this is no longer the case. As before, with the standard edition, you cannot have more than two operating system environments. Also like before, the data center version allows you to install unlimited operating system environments. Now unlike before, the data center version also includes three new features not included with standard. The first feature is in regards to storage, and it includes storage spaces direct and storage replica. The second feature is shielded virtual machines and a host guardian service, which basically means more secure virtual machines with Hyper-V. The third is a new networking stack, which basically means better network performance. This is important for you to know because unlike before where standard and data center were exactly the same, only limiting how many installs and operating system environments you could have, there's actually real differences between standard and data center. For this course, we're going to select the Windows Server 2016 Data Center Evaluation Desktop Experience. On the next screen, accept the licensing agreement and click Next. On the following screen, you'll be prompted for the installation type. If you already have Windows Server 2012 installed, you may choose Upgrade. Upgrades can be nice as they will keep your files and settings intact if possible. However, even Microsoft claims that you should install a fresh or custom install if at all possible. In my experience, I've never had a single upgrade work without having things break later on. Since this is a new VM and we do not have Windows Server 2012 already installed, we have to choose Custom, Install Windows Only, Advanced. On the next screen, you'll be asked to choose where you want to install the operating system. If you have more than one hard disk drive mounted to the VM, then you will see them listed here. 
Note that it is possible to create partitions, which are subdivisions of your hard disk file, if you like by selecting the drive and choosing the new button and entering the size of the new partition. We have no need to do this, so just click next and continue the installation. Now the installation of Windows Server 2016 will actually begin. This install generally takes at least 20 minutes, so now is a good time to take a break and wait for the installation to finish. I'm going to speed up this video so that you don't have to sit here for 20 minutes and watch my installation go. If you would like, you can pause this lecture and wait for your installation to finish and then come back to this lecture and resume. The next thing that we're going to do is create a password for the administrator account and then we will be brought to the login screen. Once the installation is complete, you will be prompted to enter the password for the built-in account administrator. It is very important that you don't forget this password, so make sure you write it down if your work policy allows or memorize it and click finish. The computer installation will finish and you will be brought to the login screen. You may log in with the administrator credentials you just created by pressing right control and delete. Enter the new password and press enter. Now you should see the Windows desktop. That's it for this lecture. Great job and I will see you in the next one. Hi, it's Paul Hill from ITFlea.com, and in this lesson, we're going to be installing the VirtualBox guest editions on our new server, as well as configuring a static IP address, and we're going to rename the server. So to start, we need to open up VirtualBox, and we're going to click on the ITFlea VM that we created earlier and click Show or click Start. All right, if yours still has to start, go ahead and pause the video and wait till your VM loads up. Once it loads up, hit Right Control and Delete, or hit Input. Keyboard, insert, control, delete. Okay, so now we just need to type in the password that we created earlier. Do that now and press enter. And now we'll just wait for the desktop to load. The reason why we want to install the VirtualBox Guest Edition CD image is that it allows us to do things like copy and paste between our host computer and our VM. And it also makes this resolution dynamic so that the resolution of our VM will be adapted to whatever the size of this window is. So if I shrink down this window, the resolution of the VM will change so that it fits inside of this screen. We're going to go ahead and click yes and allow it to be discoverable. Uh, also that VirtualBox guest edition CD image will make it so we don't have to scroll up and down since it's resizing to fit the screen. So I'm just going to maximize this. And to start the installation, we need to go to devices and insert guest edition CD image. All right, and now we need to scroll down and open the Windows Explorer. Or we can click right here, I believe. So we'll click, uh, we got a pop-up here and it says, choose what to do with the disk. We're gonna say open folder to view files. We just wanna run VirtualBox Windows Guest Edition. So I'm just gonna double click on this application and we're gonna proceed with the installation. Now most of these settings will be fine at default. We're just gonna click next and install. Now we will get a couple pop-ups during this installation asking us if we want to install certain drivers and things. We will always want to say yes. So here's the pop-up. Would you like to install this device um, software? You want to say yes. It's from Oracle. Uh, make sure that this checkbox always trust Oracle software is checked and then click install. Okay, so now let's say I want to manually reboot later and then click finish. All right, so we're going to close out of this window. And the next thing we're going to do is configure a static IP on our server. So to configure a static IP address, select the local server. And we're going to click down here where it says IP version 4 address assigned by DHCP. And it says IP version 6 is enabled. So we're going to right click on our Ethernet adapter and click properties. And we'll uncheck IP version 6 because we're not going to be using that. And under IP version 4, we're going to select that option and then choose properties. Now we're going to say use the following IP address. Okay. And under the IP address, I usually use .10 as the last octet, but you need to make sure that you set it to the same network as what your NAT network is using. So I'm using the .0. So I'm going to say .10. And then for the subnet mask, we'll leave that as default. And the default gateway will be 192.168.0.1. And that's just the IP address of the network itself. All right, and now we're going to do the preferred DNS server as 
0.0.0.1. Now this may cause issues right now because our server is not actually a domain controller. So the next thing we can do is type in 8.8.8.8 and that is simply Google's DNS servers and this will allow you to reach out to the internet and, make, and resolve host names like google.com and so forth. So we're going to go ahead and click OK and we'll click close and we will close out of this window. Now the last thing that we need to do is rename the computer. So over here at computer name under local server on server manager, we're just going to select this little random generated name here. We'll click change and the, for the computer name, I'm going to call it ITFDC01. For IT flea as the first three letters and then DC is domain controller and then 01 because it's the first domain controller. And I'll just click OK. All right, so now it's saying we must restart our, chain, our computer. That's fine because we also need to restart for the VirtualBox guest edition. So we're going to click close and then we're going to say restart now. So we're just going to let the computer restart and then we'll log back in once it's done. I'm going to go ahead and speed up the video as this, re this first reboot can take a while. So if you need to pause the video and wait for your computer to come back to the login screen and then go ahead and resume the lesson. Okay, so now I'm back to the login screen. So before the screen will resize, we need to log in. So I'm gonna hit right control and delete. And I'm gonna type in my administrator password. So we can see that this little scroll bar is still here and we just need to give it a little bit longer. Sometimes you also have to resize the screen before it'll figure out that it needs to have an adjustment. So there it went ahead and automatically adjusted. So now we can see that the resolution is fitting within the window. Now also, if I hit right control and F, I will be brought into full screen mode. So you can no longer see the file or the uh, virtual box options at the top. Instead, they're down here at the bottom. So if I hover over this little bar, I can see the same set of options down here. So it's a little bit easier for you guys to see what I'm doing and it's uh, a little bit better of a setup especially for you know so you, you don't accidentally if you're trying to close server manager and i'm going to pop out a full screen real quick it can be confusing on which x to hit sometimes you'll exit the vm instead of exiting a program like server manager or something like that all right so i'm going to pop back into full screen by hitting right control and f and now let's just make sure we're connected to the internet so the way we're going to do that is by opening command prompt you could also just open the internet explorer and browse to something but why not do it the it way we're going to hit the start button and type in CMD and command prompt is going to come up. This is a program that you're going to need to use a lot. So it might be worth it to just go ahead and right click and pin it to your taskbar. Okay. So now we have it down here. So if we need to open command prompt, it's really easy. We just click it down here and we're just going to say ping google.com and we'll see if we get a reply. And we can see we do have a reply from google.com. So this VM is now connected on the internet and it has a static IP address. If we type in IP config. I can see that my IP address is 192.168.0.10. And that's what I set up as my NAT network, these first three octets, 192.168.0. So I am good to go with this VM. And that's all we need to do in this lesson. So great job getting through this. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. In this lecture, we're going to create a domain controller by installing the Active Directory Domain Services, or ADDS, role. Remember that any server running the ADDS role is considered a domain controller. We are going to add this role to our server and create a new domain called itflea.com. This is the name of my website, but you can use any name that you'd want, or if you want to keep things simple, you can use itflea.com too. You won't break my website or anything silly like that because there's no internet DNS servers pointing to the domain that we're about to create. Finally, once we add the ADDS roles, we will promote the server as a domain controller and then we'll be done. You should already know how to install a server role on the server you're currently logged into, but I'm going to cover the steps again. Open Server Manager and select Manage, Add Roles and Features. On the Installation Type screen, leave the default option Role Based or Feature Based checkbox checked and click Next. In the Server Roles list, choose the Active Directory Domain Services role. You will see a pop-up window stating that you cannot install ADDS unless certain role services or features are also installed. Click the Add Features button and then click Next to proceed to the Features screen.
We do not need any additional features as all the required features were already added. Again click Next. Now you will be brought to the ADDS screen. It tells us that we will also need to install the DNS role if we have not already set it up. Click Next and continue on to the confirmation screen. Here we can see the roles and features we are about to install. Click Install and wait for the installation to finish. Once the installation is complete, you will have post-deployment configuration steps that you will also need to complete. Once the installation is complete, click the notification flag next to Manage and choose Promote this server to a domain controller. The ADDS configuration wizard will appear giving us three options. The first option, Add a domain controller to an existing domain, is for adding additional domain controllers to a domain you've already created. This option is not suitable for us because we have not yet created a domain. The second option, Add a domain to an existing forest, is for adding a child also known as subdomain. Let me elaborate on this. We are going to create a domain called itflea.com. If that domain already existed, we could create a sub or child domain called courses.itflea.com. In theory, we could set up this domain called courses.itflea.com simply to separate our students and teachers from our administrators and developers who reside in the domain itflea.com. You could configure this subdomain so that admins from the itflea.com domain can reach into the courses.itflea.com domain and make changes but students and teachers could not reach back into the resources of the itflea.com domain. Again, this is not an appropriate option for us because the itflea.com domain does not yet exist. The third option is to add a new forest. This will allow us to create and specify a new domain. Choose this option and specify a root domain name. I'm going to enter itflea.com and click Next. It will take a second before the Domain Controller Options screen will appear, so just be patient while it processes. The first two options, Forest Functional Level and Domain Functional Level, specify which operating system the Domain Controller will use. You need to specify the OS you are using, and in this case, it's Windows Server 2016. There's a bug with the latest version of 2016 that I'm using, where the developers did not configure this screen to show the latest version as Server 2016, and instead shows Windows Server Technical Preview. Now, this is because the server was just released, and I guess they just didn't catch this when they're going through development, and prior to this release, there was the Windows Server Technical Preview 5, and they just need to update this. So if you see Windows Server 2016, go ahead and choose that. If you still don't see Windows Server 2016, choose the Windows Server Technical Preview. Make sure that the Domain Name System or DNS Server checkbox is checked. If you remember, when we installed ADDS, it said that we had to install this role in order for the DC to function properly. The Global Catalog option means that the server will list all Active Directory objects. This is a requirement for the primary domain controller or when we're creating a new domain forest. If you choose the Read Only Domain Controller option, then the domain controller will not be able to make changes to the domain. We will want to make changes to our domain, so make sure you do not check this checkbox. Type in the DSRM password and make sure that you either write it down or memorize it. The DSRM password allows an administrator to take an instance of AD offline for reasons like maintenance or troubleshooting. This is not commonly used, but you will want to keep the password around just in case. Click Next and proceed on to the DNS options. On the DNS options screen, you will see a warning about the DNS delegation. This warning means that people on the internet will not be able to resolve local DNS names on your local DNS server. Names like itflea.com or itfdc01, etc. This is fine because we don't want people on the internet to be able to access our server for several reasons. One of them is security. Number two, we don't want to be using a domain that's actually a website and causing issues. Click next and proceed on to the additional options. The NetBIOS name is populated for us as ITFLEA. The NetBIOS name is an abbreviated version of the Fully Qualified Domain Name or FQDN, which is ITFLEA.com. I'm going to leave this at the default of ITFLEA and click Continue. On the Paths screen, we can see the default paths chosen for the folders that are required by ADDS. 
If you'd like to choose an alternative drive, you can do so by clicking the dot 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 button and choosing an alternative path. I recommend that you leave them at the default settings and click next. Now we are brought to the review options screen where we can see all of the options we have chosen so far. If you would like, you can click the view script button and you will be presented with a PowerShell script that you can save in order to later execute and quickly complete the wizard with the same settings we just used. Close out of the PowerShell script and click next. Now we are brought to the prerequisite check window. The wizard is now going to verify that the server is ready to be promoted as a DC. This will take a few minutes before it is ready so just be patient while it completes the checks. Once the checks are complete, at the top you will see that all prerequisite checks have passed. If you encounter any errors that will not allow you to promote the server as a domain controller, you're going to need to Google each error and figure out what's wrong and fix it. Usually these errors are pretty simple to fix so a quick Google will tell you exactly what's wrong and how to fix it. Once you fix the errors, click the link that says Rerun Prerequisites Check and wait for the checks to finish again. Under the View Results window, we can see that there are various warnings. None of these are critical, but it's worth reading through them. The first one is a security setting, stating that anything with cryptography not compatible with Windows NT 4.0, which is really old by the way, will be blocked. This is not an issue with us because we're not using old servers or old technology. The second is in regards to our first networking adapter not having a static IP address. Now this is because our first adapter is connected to our NAT adapter and it will not be used for our local network. It's only good for connecting us to the internet, so we can ignore this warning. The third warning is about DNS delegation. Again, we do not care if people on the internet can resolve our DNS records within our network. Click the install button and wait for the installation to complete and the server to reboot. This can take a good while depending on the speed of your server, so you need to be patient while it works. I'm going to speed up this video so you don't have to sit here and watch the entire installation. Once the installation completes and the server reboots, press right control and delete to log in. The first thing you'll notice is the NetBIOS name of our domain precedes the user account we are logging into. In this case, it's itflee backslash administrator. This is in the format of domain name backslash domain username. If we had multiple domains, we could specify a different domain by typing in the name of the domain we want to use, followed by a backslash, and then the name of the domain user account that we want to log into. Type in the password you use to create the administrator account when you first install the server and log in. Once the desktop loads and server manager opens, the first thing you'll notice is the new roles AD, DS, and DNS. Now our domain controller is completely built. Great job getting that done. I will see you in the next lecture. Hello, this is Paul Hill, and in this lecture, I'm going to be talking to you about Active Directory users and computers. You're going to learn what it is as well as how to open and use the console. Active Directory users and computers, also known as Active Directory or AD for short, is a tool that is installed by default when a server has the Active Directory domain services role installed. In other words, when you're working with a domain controller, you can expect to see Active Directory installed on the server. Now you can also install Active Directory by installing the Remote Server Administration Toolset or RSAT, but you will have to connect to a domain controller in order for that to work properly. Now just as the name implies, Active Directory is a live directory or database that stores user accounts and their passwords, computers, printers, file shares, security groups, and their respective permissions. A group could be made up of users, computers, printers, or file shares. Now the reason why we use groups within Active Directory is frequently for security purposes. Now you can use AD and Group Policy together to assign specific permissions for objects within Active Directory. The purpose of Active Directory 
is to handle security authentication across the domain. It's very, very important. If you wanna work in the IT field, you have to understand it. Now, one of the ways that AD does this is by only allowing authorized users to log on to the network. Active Directory also provides centralized security management of your network resources by storing things like the usernames and the passwords in one location instead of the administrator needing to store this information on each individual computer. Now, the most common task that you need to know how to do with an Active Directory, and everybody does this, everyone who's worked with Active Directory knows how to do this, is reset user passwords and create or delete user accounts. For example, every time a new employee is hired at your company, they will need login credentials. Now, you will need to create their account and help them log in for the first time. And quite often, as we all know, people are going to forget their passwords and they're going to ask you to reset them. Now, if you do not have Active Directory, you would need to create a local user account on each computer in your company. Also, every time you had to reset a password for that user, you would need to do it on each computer that they had an account on. So here we're creating John and his passwords. And then if we have to reset the passwords, we have to go back to each computer and reset the password on all of them. You can see they're changing to red, representing the new password for that user account. Now, this example not only applies to user accounts, but other objects that can be stored within Active Directory, like computers, printers, file shares, and security groups. So in this example, we have the username John and his password stored on our domain controller, which has Active Directory, and all of those computers go to Active Directory and query the server for his password. So if you need to change it, you just change it in one spot on the domain controller, and we are good to go. Okay, so no more resetting his password 10 times over or five times over. Imagine if you had, you know, 5,000 computers on your network and you had to reset a password for John. Well, you'd have to reset it 5,000 times and that's, that's crazy, a big waste of money. So we don't want to do that. All right, so now that you understand what Active Directory is, let's learn about the interface. Now I am logged into my domain controller here called IPDC01. IP standing for Instructor Paul and DC standing for domain controller, and 01 standing for the first domain controller in my domain. Now my domain is called instructorpaul.com because that's my website and I just thought it would fit. So you need to be logged into your domain if you'd like to follow along or you can just watch and see what I do. All right, so the way that we start Active Directory or AD for short is to click in server manager, we can select tools and we can choose Active Directory users and computers from this list here. Now, if you don't know how to open Server Manager, that's easy. Click the Start button and it'll appear in the top left corner, Server Manager, okay? So now the Active Directory Users and Computers Console will appear. Now this window looks like those other ones that you may have seen before if you're familiar with DNS or DHCP. On the left, we have our navigation pane and on the right, we have the contents of our current location. Now on the menu, we have File, Action, View, and Help. Now within the file menu, you can either choose the options or you can exit Active Directory. Within options, you can delete any changes that you've made to the view of Active Directory users and computers. And of course, exit acts just like you'd expect it to. The action menu is the exact same menu that you'll get when you right click on an object within either the navigation or the contents pane. The view column allows you to quickly add or remove columns so that you can show or hide additional information as necessary. Most importantly, you can enable advanced features. And this viewing mode shows a lot of hidden and useful content that you would otherwise not be able to find. The filter options allows you to show or hide certain object types within the contents pane. Now this can be useful when you have several different object types, like we can see here, like if multiple users, multiple groups, multiple contacts, and say you're just looking for a particular computer, we can say show only the following type and we can check computer and all the other type will be hidden. Okay, so we're not gonna do that. We're gonna click cancel. The customize option allows you to further customize your view within the Active Directory users and computers console by showing or hiding different components. For most administrators, the default configuration will work just fine. All right, so I'm gonna click okay. And under help, this menu allows you to quickly access the help topics and the tech center website. You can also view the version of Microsoft Management Console or MMC and Active Directory users and computers. Most of the time, you're not gonna be using this help little tab here. If you're running into an issue, 
just go ahead and do yourself a favor and Google the issue. You'll probably get results a lot faster. Now below that, you will see several action buttons. First, you have navigational arrows, and this will allow you to quickly navigate forwards and backwards through the Active Directory structure. Next, you have several buttons that will change depending on what type of object you've selected. Now, general rule of thumb, if you hover over the buttons, you will get a tooltip telling you what each button does and what it is used for. Now, at the left side of the console, we can see our navigation pane. At the top, you're going to see saved queries in the name of your domain, which in my case is instructorpaul.com. Yours will likely be different. Now, saved queries is commonly ignored by many administrators. It allows you to quickly locate things like expired or locked out user accounts or user accounts who have not logged in within the last 30 days and more. As the name implies, you can create these searches and save them for later use. This can make redundant tasks much easier. Now, instructorpaul.com refers to the domain that Active Directory is servicing. You can right click on the domain and complete several actions. First, we can delegate control of the domain. By default, there's a set of users and a set of groups that have control over this domain, and you can extend that by delegating control of the domain. You can also delegate control of particular OUs, but we may get into that more later. Now, the Find button allows you to locate objects within this domain. You can view this as a search button. Think of it like the Google of Active Directory. If you need to find something, you can right click and choose Find, and you will be able to type in the name of what you're looking for. And you can see that here. So we could choose what kind of object that we're looking for, and we can choose where we want to search, and then we just type in the name that we're looking for and click Find Now. Okay. You may change domains by selecting the Change Domain option. Now you would do this if you had a subdomain to instructorpaul.com like lessons or courses.instructorpaul.com and the like, okay? But we can see here if I click browse, I only have Instructor Paul. If I had a subdomain or a trusted domain, you would see them listed here. We can also change domain controllers, but since I only have one domain controller in my domain, again, you're only seeing the one ipdc01.instructorpaul.com. This is the only domain controller that I have up and running, so it's the only one we're gonna see here. The raise domain functional level option is used to enable Active Directory features when you have multiple domain controllers on a network. Now, some features are only available when all of your servers are updated to the latest version available. For example, if you have a 2012 domain controller and a 2016 domain controller, both servicing the same network, your domain's functional level will be that of the 2012 domain controller, meaning that the server cannot use the new features of 2016, but only the features that are included in 2012. If you were to upgrade the 2012 server to the 2016, you could then raise your domain's functional level to enable the new features. If I click this option, I can see that my domain functional level is Windows Server 2016, since I do not have any older domain controllers on the network. The Operation Masters option allows you to choose which servers operate master roles like the Schema Master, Domain Name Naming Master, Relative Identified or ID Master, Primary Domain Controller Emulator, also known as PDC Emulator, and the Infrastructure Master. If you have multiple domain controllers on your network, you can choose what server has what roles. Now, this is something you would need to do when you remove a domain controller from the network. Now, Active Directory Domain Services is a multi-master enabled database, which means several domain controllers can make changes to the database. Allowing multiple domain controllers to write changes to the database can sometimes cause conflicting updates to occur. Now, this is where Operation Master steps in to resolve this issue by only allowing certain domain controllers to make changes to certain parts of Active Directory Domain Services. Now, since we don't have any additional domain controllers, we can click the Change button but there's no other domain controllers on the network to transfer the roles to. So we're gonna click OK and we'll click Close. Now, if we right click, we have the new option here and we can do all kinds of things like create computers, users, groups, all that. We're gonna get into that more. So uh, under here, we have all tasks. Again, it's kind of a repeat of what you see above. You can do the resultant set of policy which allows you to see what kind of group policy objects are being applied to this domain or whatever object you're clicking on. Um, we're gonna get into more of that later again. Uh, if we choose properties, we can see the domain name and we can see the description and we can see who it is managed by. Now this information is very important. Uh, it's just information that if you wanna provide it to other people within your domain, other administrators, you can do that right here, okay?
So now I'm going to close out of this window. And that is all we're going to cover in this lecture. So now you have a basic understanding of what Active Directory is and what it is used for. Now, great job getting through this lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello there, this is Paul Hill from InstructorPaul.com. And in this lecture, I'm going to be teaching you about containers and organizational units. Now we can see here I'm logged into my domain controller. I have Active Directory users and computers already opened. And what I'm going to do now is expand my domain here, InstructorPaul.com. And I'm just going to click on this domain. And right here we can see we have some containers, organizational unit, and a built-in domain type of object. So let's start with containers. Now, containers are structural objects that are included by default within Active Directory. Anytime you install Active Directory, you have containers. You also have OUs. But the most important difference between OUs and containers is that you cannot apply group policy objects, also known as GPOs, to containers. Now, that's not going to make any sense to you yet because you haven't learned what a GPO is, but it's really, really important that you understand that. So just try to keep that in mind. You also cannot create a container within Active Directory, although you could use ADSI Edit to create a container if you needed it. Most of you guys are never going to have to do that, but if you're setting up something like SCCM, you will have to create a container in ADSI Edit, uh, but that's outside the scope of this course. Now, by default, the containers that we're immediately going to see within Active Directory are the computer's container. I'm going to expand this a little bit so we can see what we're looking at here the Foreign Security Principles container, the Managed Service Accounts container, and the Users container. Let's start with this Computers container and explain what it is. Now this container is used as a default location for new computers that join your domain. When you join a computer to your domain for the first time, a new Active Directory account or computer account object will be created inside of this container for the computer. So if we went in here and we had any computers join to this domain, they would appear in this list by default. Now, this is important to know because you'll want to move the computer out of the container into an OU so you can apply appropriate group policy objects directly to that computer account. And this will allow you to enforce your company's security policies like custom wallpapers and things like that. While it is possible to leave them in the computer container and still get the same effect, it's generally not a best practice to do so. Now, the Foreign Security Principles container holds proxy objects for security principles from other trusted domains. A security principle from another domain could be a user account or security group that resides inside of another domain. Now, if you do not establish a trust between your domain and another domain, you will not be using this container at all. It's only if we have another domain set up that we're trusting. So, for example, if I wanted to create a domain with my fellow instructor, Robert, I could have instructorrobert.com and I could establish a trust between instructor Paul and instructorrobert.com. And then his proxy objects would appear here inside of my foreign security principles container. The managed service accounts container holds the user accounts that are used to operate applications or services that run on your servers or your workstations. Now, since managed service accounts or MSAs for short is supposed to be used for services and not by end users, you do not create passwords for these accounts, but they are instead handled automatically. Now, if we open this up, we can see that there's nothing in there because by default, you do not have any MSAs or managed service accounts created. Now, the problem of expiring service account passwords and security can be a huge headache for administrator, and this is what managed service accounts or MSAs hope to resolve by kind of automating some of that security for us. Now to create an MSA, you need to use the PowerShell command line. There's no interface to do this at this time, although Microsoft may later add this functionality. If we open up the users container, we can see here that we have the administrator, we have the guest down here, which is disabled, as well as several default security groups, which are used by the domain. Now I can tell that this guest account is disabled just by looking at this little down arrow right next to the guest account. Now we're not going to go over all of these groups here, but just know that they're all important and you don't want to delete any of them as they're all used by your domain. Okay, let's go back to the instructorpaul.com and let's check out this folder named built in of the type built in domain. Now this object contains security groups that are required for your domain to operate. 
you cannot delete any of these security groups as they're all required by the domain. So if I go to administrators, I right click and I try to delete it, I cannot do so. Okay, so this is just all more information that is required by the domain. None of it can be deleted. Unlike in the users, I could right click on domain controllers and choose delete if I wanted to. I would not recommend doing that because that's a really bad idea, but you can do it. Unlike in built in, you cannot do that. Okay. Organizational units commonly referred to as OUs are used to, as you guessed it, organize and separate objects within Active Directory. The objects could be anything that Active Directory could store, like user accounts, computers, printers, file shares, or these security groups like we just saw. Now, if your company had a marketing team, you might want to create an OU called Marketing, and then you'd store all your marketing users inside of that OU. So just like it sounds, and just like I said, OUs are used to help organize your domain with an Active Directory. But it's also much more important than just having a tidy Active Directory. A lot of times, system administrators will assign specific permissions to OUs. For example, all of the users inside of that marketing OU may have a special desktop background and special permissions to a file that others may not have. Now, this is why it's important that you insert Active Directory objects, meaning computers, users, printers, into the correct OU or organizational unit. Because if you pick the wrong OU, it could lead to some users having security privileges that they're not supposed to have. Like I said, this not only applies to user accounts, but every object that is stored within Active Directory. Now, like we already know, by default, the only OU that you're going to see is the Domain Controllers OU, which if you notice, if you right click on it, you cannot delete it. So it's a required OU that is just there by default. So with an Active Directory, you're not gonna be able to delete it. Now, as the name suggests, domain controllers need to be placed inside of this OU because there are certain policies applied to this OU that domain controllers need in order to operate. Now, you can't see the policies inside of Active Directory users and computers, but when we get to opening group policy, you will be able to see the policies that are applied to this organizational unit. Now, let's create a new OU, and we can do that by right-clicking on the desired location. And in my case, I'm just going to right-click on my instructorpaul.com here, and I'm going to choose New, and I'm going to select Organizational Unit. All right, I'm going to drag this to the middle here. I'm going to name this OU Test, and then all uppercase OU. See if I can spell that right. Now, notice here we can uncheck Protect Container from Accidental Deletion, and what this means, if we leave this option selected, if we decide later to delete it, we'll have to remove the protection and then right click on the OU and delete it. It can be useful, especially if you feel the OU is very important. So I'm just gonna leave this checked and I'm gonna click OK. And here we can see that we've created test OU and we can see that we automatically navigated to it. If I go back to instructorpaul.com, we can now see the OU is listed down here. We can right click on the OU and choose properties and I can type in a description call it my awesome OU. You could type in a street, city, you know, there's no need to do any of that. I'm not gonna worry about who it's managed by and I'm not really worried about the COM plus partition set since I don't have any partition sets. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is click OK and now we can see my description is listed there. Now we can right click on this OU and we're gonna see a similar set of options like when we right click on our IT fleet domain except for the cut, delete, rename, and export list options. We can still delegate the control uh, we can, you know, create new objects within that. We can uh, cut, delete, rename, or refresh as we'd like. Now, the first three options act just like you would expect. You can delegate control of this OU. If I want to give a specific user control over this OU, I can do that. I can move it to another location if I'd like by choosing to move. And for example, I can move it under domain controllers, click OK. I'm not going to do that at this time. If I right click back here, we can search the OU by right clicking and choosing find. We now have a find option and it's searching inside of test OU. Of course, there's nothing in there, so I'm not going to run a search. Uh, we can create all our new objects and we can hit all tasks, which is basically the same set of these three options. It just allows us to um, run a result instead of policy. Now, I don't know why Microsoft wanted everything to be so redundant, but nevertheless, those are the options that you have. We can cut, delete, rename, or refresh as we would like. So right now we can right click on the OU and we can export the list. Since there's nothing in this OU, I'm not gonna do that. I'm actually gonna do that against our domain controllers OU. 
So if I right click on this and I choose export list, we can see that we're asked to save the file. I'm gonna to go to the desktop and I'm gonna save it as OU list. And I'll just hit save. And now if I open Windows Explorer here in the bottom and I go to the desktop, or you can see it listed here under recent files. If I go to the desktop and I double click on OU list, this is the contents of my domain controller organizational unit. I can also do the same by selecting instructorpaul.com, right clicking and choosing export list. Now it's important to keep in mind that I actually have to left click on the domain and then right click and choose export list. So I'm gonna call this as domain list. Okay, and we're gonna open this folder to our desktop and we're gonna open domain list. And here we can see that we have the computers container, the domain controllers organizational unit, foreign security principles container, the managed service accounts container, and the users container, and my test OU. Now, one thing that I wanna point out here is that you're not getting a list of the objects within objects. So you're not getting sub OUs or sub objects because if you remember, we open this OU list, which is the domain controller OU. We have IPDC01 listed here, but inside of this list, we don't see that listed under the domain controller's organizational unit. And that's because these lists are not recursive. It only does it at the top level. Okay, so that's important for you to keep in mind. All right, so I'm gonna close out of these windows. All right, so the next thing we need to learn how to do is how to delete an organizational unit. So if I right click on this OU, and you're gonna think right now it's pretty simple, just select delete. Well, if you click delete, we're gonna get this message saying, do you really wanna delete it? We'll say yes. And then we get this message saying, you do not have sufficient privileges to delete test OU or this object is protected from accidental deletion. Well, we know we have sufficient privileges because we just created the OU. So the last option is it's protected. And if you remember, we left that checkbox selected that said protect this OU from accidental deletion. So what we're gonna do is click okay. And we need to remove the protection. The way that we do that is by clicking view within Active Directory and we enable advanced features down here near the bottom. So what just happened, we got a whole bunch more information being shown than what was being shown before. Don't worry about it. We can still see the same information, it's just a whole lot extra. So if we look down here, we can see test OU is listed right here. Now what I'm gonna do is right click and I'm gonna choose properties. And we're gonna go to object. And here we can see the checkbox, protect object from accidental deletion. We're gonna uncheck this and click okay. And then we're gonna turn off advanced features by hitting view and advanced features. Okay, so now our view is back to normal like what we're used to. I'm gonna right click on the test OU and I'm gonna choose delete and I'm gonna say yes and the OU has now been deleted. So keep that in mind that you're gonna to have to remove the protection before you delete an organizational unit nine times out of 10. Most administrators leave that protection enabled. So make sure you remember that. You remember, you just go to view, hit advanced features, you right click on the OU, go to properties, select the object tab and remove the protection. Then you can delete it like normal. Okay, so that's your little crash course on organizational units and containers. And we even covered built-in domain types just for free and just for fun. So this is Paul from instructorpaul.com. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hey, it's Paul Hill from instructorpaul.com and in this lecture, we are gonna be learning how to create a user account with an Active Directory users and computers. Now, I'm already logged into my domain controller. I have Active Directory already open, just like I will in most of the lectures in this course. So if you've not done so, go ahead and pause the video, get to this point, and then resume. So what I'm gonna do before I create this uh, user account, I'm gonna create an OU structure. And you already know how to make organizational units, so I'm gonna do this a little bit fast. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is create an OU under instructorpaul.com and I'm gonna do that by right clicking, choosing new organizational unit and I'm going to name it Instructor Paul. And most of the time, this is what you'll see within your domain. I'm gonna click okay. And this just creates an organizational unit under our domain with the same name as our domain. Okay, there's a reason for that. Um, it's, it's not anything that's required 
With an Active Directory, you can create your own OU structure however you would like. So if you don't want to do it this way, that is perfectly fine. But every place that I've worked at, I've seen very similar setups to this. So now what we're going to do is right click on Instructor Paul, we're going to choose New, and we're going to create another new organizational unit. And this OU is going to be called Domain Users. Okay, so I'll select OK. I'm going to make sure that I leave it as protected as I will do with all these organizational units I'm about to make. And I'm going to right click and create another OU under Instructor Paul. And we're just going to plan ahead a little bit and we're going to call this Domain Computers. All right, so I'll click OK. And you might be asking, why did we create a Domain Users OU when we have a Users container right here? Now, if you might remember, you cannot apply a GPO or group policy object to a container. So we cannot create special policies for users that are inside of this container. Now, the instructor Paul is a little bit redundant because we have instructorpaul.com right here. We wouldn't have to do that, but I'm just doing it for organizational purposes. That way I don't get my domain users mixed up with just users or domain computers. I don't wanna mix that up with domain controllers, okay? Now, like I said, OU structure is completely up to the administrator. So if you wanna do it different, be my guest. Now I'm gonna right click on domain users and I'm gonna choose new and we're gonna select user, okay? Okay, so we have some basic information that we need to put in. So I'm gonna type in my first name, Paul, and I'm gonna type in Hill. You can type in a middle initial if you'd like. Most of the time you won't, but uh, I'm just gonna leave that blank. Nine times out of 10, you never have the middle initial. Now I'm gonna use the naming convention first dot last name, okay? So in this case, it'll be Paul dot Hill. And here on the right, we have the option of choosing what domain they will log into. Since I only have instructorpaul.com, that's gonna be the only domain that is available to me. And down here we have the user logon name for pre Windows 2000. Most of the time you're not gonna ever need to mess with this. But the reason why this exists is that there's some usernames that are so complicated or so long, they're not compatible with really old computers like anything older than Windows 2000. So I think if I actually type in enough letters here, it will uh, just cut it off like it did there. So there's a character limit and that's one of the things that is uh, pre Windows 2000. So I'm gonna delete all that information and I'll make sure I spell my name right. So I have paul.hill at instructorpaul.com and my pre Windows 2000 is instructorpaul backslash paul.hill. This is the information I will be using to access this account. All right, so I'm gonna click next and now I need to create the password for my user account. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in that information here. And we have a couple of checkboxes that we need to be aware of. The first and most important is user must change password at next logon. Now, I'm gonna leave this unchecked because I'm creating the account for myself. But a lot of times what happens is a user might be right at your desk or right beside you while you're creating their account and you can have them type in their own password directly into this box two times and then just create the account that way. Now, if they're remote, say they work in another part of the country or they're just not anywhere near you, you can choose this checkbox, which will make them change their password at the next logon. So when what you'll do is you'll give them the username and you'll give them this password. And when they log into your domain, it'll say, you know, you need to create a new password. You cannot use this temporary password. Uh, but I'm not gonna do that. Also, sometimes with VPNs, this checkbox can cause issues. So you just need to be aware of your domain and what's going on, what the user is gonna be uh, using their account for and how they're gonna be connecting. All right, so you can also make it so that they cannot change the password. A lot of times I see this used with service accounts when you're not using an MSA. Uh, this is not a good thing to check. Uh, it's gonna be a regular user that will be logging into your domain regularly and using it uh, to complete day-to-day -day work. Same goes for password never expires. You do not want to check this checkbox if you're worried at all or conscious at all about security. This is not a good checkbox to check. Again, it is commonly used only for service accounts. All right, now we have account is disabled. And if you're creating the user account ahead of time, you may want to check this checkbox. That way the account is not exploited or used by someone else before the new user gets onto the domain. Okay. So we're gonna uncheck this because we want the account to be usable. Obviously, if you check this checkbox, the account will not be able to be logged into. All right, so I'm just gonna click next. 
and I'm going to click finish. And here we can see we have the user paul.hill. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna test the account by trying to log into the domain controller. Now this user is not a member of the domain controller. Now this user is not a member of the domain admins, so I don't, I suspect we'll get some kind of error saying we don't have permissions to log into the server. But as long as we get that far and we don't get invalid password, we know the account is working. So I'm gonna click the Windows button here in the bottom left, and I'm gonna click on this little profile picture here for administrator, and I'm going to say sign out. Okay, so it's currently signing me out. Now what I'm gonna do is hit Control Alt Delete or Control Alt Insert since I'm using VMware. And I'm gonna select other user and my username is paul.hill. And I'm gonna type in the password that I just created and I'll press enter. Okay, so what it says is the sign in method you're trying to use isn't allowed. Uh, what this means is that I'm not a member of the domain administrators, uh, but it was able to authenticate my account. So I know it's working, so that's cool. Okay, so now I'm at a Windows 10 workstation that is currently joined into my instructorpaul.com domain. So what I'm gonna do is type in that username, paul.hill, and I'm going to type in the password. And we can see we're signing into Instructor Paul. And so what I'm gonna do is click the enter button, and I am now being logged into my desktop. Okay, so now it's gonna go through its first time login setup. Uh, it could take a few minutes like it's saying here. So we're just going to end the lecture here. That is how you create a user account within Active Directory. Great job, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello, it's Paul Hill from InstructorPaul.com. And in this lecture, I'm going to be showing you how to search or find objects within Active Directory. Now, the reason you'll need to know how to find objects within Active Directory is simple. If you have thousands and thousands of users, or thousands of computers, hundreds of printers, whatever the case may be, if you're searching for one object, it can be like a needle in a haystack, especially if you have a complicated OU structure. So mine's pretty simple, so it wouldn't be very hard for me to find domain users or you know domain computers or computers that happen to be in the container. This wouldn't be very difficult. But if you have a bunch of OUs or a larger enterprise, it could be much more difficult. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select the domain here and I'm gonna click this Find Objects in Active Directory Domain Services. Or I'm gonna right click the domain I wanna search and I'm going to click Find, okay? Now, either method will pull up this little window here and it says Find Users, Contacts, and Groups. Now we can change that by clicking this little drop down box and we can select a different type of object. So the first thing you wanna decide is what kind of object are you looking for? Is it a user or is it a computer? Because if I'm looking for a computer and I type in a name here and I say, uh, let's say workstation 01, and then I hit find now, nothing returns. And then I realize, oh, I typed in a user or a computer name and I'm searching for users. So you click this drop down and type in computers. You're going to get this message that says, this will clear your search results. Hit OK. And now you have to retype in the computer name. So just save yourself some time. And the first thing you want to do is just select what you're searching for. OK, so we're going to search for users, contacts, and groups. Next, you want to pick the domain that you're going to search in. Now, in this case, I only have one domain, instructorpaul.com, but if I had a trust established with instructorrobert.com, that domain would also appear in this list, and I could search one or the other. Now, if I had no idea which domain the object resided in, I could choose entire directory, and that'll just search everything. Now, if you have a massive, massive network, this could be a really long or really slow query, so that's not always recommended. But if your network's relatively small, it's safe to go with the entire directory option. All right, so from here, we can type in the name. And if I'm looking for myself, I wanna type in Paul and Hill. If it's a really common name, you're gonna likely return a bunch of results. Like at work, if I try to search for the name Chris, it's gonna turn back about 4,000 users, okay? And that takes a really long time for that to pull up. Uh, now you can type in some description uh, information if you have it. Most of the time, you'll just type in their name and hit find now. We can also go under advanced and we could choose things like, uh, you know, the group name, uh, group members, office location, and uh, contact information. Uh, but we don't need to do any of that. Just search for the first and last name and I'm going to hit find now. All right. So now we can see Paul Hill has been located. So we can right click on that user. We can rename, delete, add to a group, disable, reset their password, move them open their homepage or send them an email. I don't have any exchange set up, so that's not gonna work. And I can edit their properties, all right?
but notice that it doesn't tell me where the user is located. Now, if I needed to move this user to another OU, that's simple enough. I just right click and hit move. But what if I decide I want to know where this object is sitting and I don't want to just click through this OU and try and find it because maybe I have 100 or 200 OUs to search through. All right, so what you would do is close out of this search, hit view and select advanced features. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to the search and we're gonna search for Paul Hill again. And I press enter, so find now. I'm gonna double click on Paul Hill or I'm gonna right click and select properties, either one will do. And we have a whole new set of tabs here because we're viewing advanced features. Now if I click the object tab, I can see the exact path of this Active Directory object, which is instructorpaul.com and then the instructorpaul OU right here, the domain users OU, and then Paul Hill. So if I close out of all these search boxes, I can now navigate. I'm gonna turn off advanced features. I'm gonna to go to Instructor Paul domain users, and there is Paul Hill. So I'm able to find that user account. All right, so now let's take an example where I have joined a computer to my domain, and I need to move it into the domain computers OU. Now, if you remember, I said by default, when computers are joined to the domain, they're put in the computers container. So what I need to do is move these into the domain computers OU. Now you could just click and drag it in there, but let's say, for example, we need to use the search feature. Since this lecture is about the search feature, I wanna show you how you can fully utilize it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit this search button. I'm gonna change the find to be computers, and under the N, I need to change this from the Instructor Paul OU to the Instructor Paul domain. Okay, now I know that all of my computers have the letters WS inside of the computer name, all the workstations that is, and that's all I'm trying to move. So I can use a wildcard here by pressing shift in the number eight, I can put in a star, and that just means any kind of, any set of characters, doesn't matter what it is, and I'll type in WS, and then I'll put another star. So what I'm saying is I want to find a computer object that has the characters WS inside of the name anywhere. The letter W followed by the letter S. Anything can be before it and anything can be after it. So what I'm going to do is hit find now. And now I have returned IPWS01 and WS01. Now if I was to just search WS, you'll find that I'll only get one result. Okay? And that would be, that would exclude the IPWS. Okay, so those wild cards can also be very useful. So I'm gonna hit find now, and now I'm gonna select both of these computers. I'm gonna right click, and I'm gonna choose move, and I'm gonna go under Instructor Paul and Domain Computers. I'll click OK, and now the move is complete. So if I close out of this search, and I open the Domain Computers OU, and I hit F5, I can see that the computers are now listed inside of that OU. Okay, so that is a quick insight on how you use the find feature with Active Directory. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello, it's Paul Hill from instructorpaul.com and in this lecture, I'm gonna be showing you how to reset passwords with Active Directory users and computers. Now this is gonna be a short lecture. It's really not that complicated, but I need to show this to you guys. You have to know how to do this because if you go to a job interview, and it has anything to do with Active Directory or sysadmin or any kind of help desk IT work, if they ask you how to reset a user password and you can't explain it to them or you don't know, you're probably not gonna get the job. So this is one of those things that everybody has to know how to do, okay? And thankfully, it's so simple, very, very simple. So a lot of times what's gonna happen is you're gonna have someone come up to your desk or someone's gonna give you a phone call or you will get an email or a ticket will be submitted to your ticketing system and someone's gonna say that they forgot their password. A lot of times they try to blame the system saying it won't remember their password or something's just not right with the computer. They, they come up with all kinds of excuses but you and I both know they just forgot their password or they're typing it in wrong. So what we need to do is go ahead and reset it for them. Now, once you get their first and last name, you're gonna hit the find button and we're gonna run a search through Active Directory just like we normally do. So if Paul Hill calls in, he says, I forgot my password, you know, your domain's terrible, it can't remember passwords, uh, you'll say, okay, sir, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, type in the first and last name, we're gonna hit find now. 
If you're not finding the user account, you might want to search the entire directory or verify the spelling of their name. Once you have their account and you verified it's their account, because you don't want to do this on the wrong account, that's a big, big no-no. You'll get yourself in a lot of trouble doing that. What you'll want to do is right click and choose properties and you'll want to ask them for their login name. Now this is not a required step, but it's a good step, I think, to um, just practice basic security. You don't want to read it back to them. You want to say, what login name do they use? Because there might be more than one Paul Hill. I've seen Paul.Hill.2 or Paul.Hill3. So just because you know you see Paul Hill here doesn't mean it's the correct account. So it's a good idea to have them tell you what their username is that they use to log in. And you can just verify that information here. Once you have that and you're sure it's the right user account, you want to right click and choose reset password. Okay, so now this works just like when you create a new user's account. What you're going to do is type in some kind of password that's easy for you to communicate back to them. Uh, it's not a bad idea to open like Notepad. See if I can get it here. This computer's going a little slow. Okay, so if I open Notepad, I can just make up a password real quick, you know, something like this. Uh, that would be kind of complicated, but uh, you'd probably just want to do like PSSWRD. So password12. You'd want to copy that and just paste it in there. Uh, that way you know you're not typing in anything wrong. And then you'll want to communicate, either email this password back to them or uh, just read it to them over the phone, whatever the case may be. Now, if they're standing right at your desk, you don't have to type in a temporary password like that. You can just have them set their password here. If that's in line with your work policy, you might want to double check that with your manager. Uh, but once you do that, if it's a temporary password, you want to check this checkbox, making them change their password at the next logon. If it's not a temporary password, if they're beside you at the desk, and they're typing in the password themselves, you can uncheck this checkbox. Okay, since I'm creating a temporary password, I'm gonna check this checkbox. And here we can see that the account lockout status on this domain controller is unlocked. What this means is, within Active Directory and Group Policy, you can specify the number amount of times that a user can fail to log in before their account is locked. Now, if this account is locked out, it'll just say locked right here, and you'll need to check this checkbox. Otherwise, they won't be able to access their account. Since this account is already unlocked, we don't need to worry about that, okay? So now we're just gonna click OK. And it says the password for Paul Hill has been changed. So you'll send that password back to them however you're gonna get it to them, whether it's a ticketing system, whether you're reading it to them or over the phone, or, or if they're just setting it here at your desk. All right, so real quick, every once in a while, you will have someone who will just lock out their account, but they'll say that they remember their password and they don't need a password reset, they just need it to be unlocked. And you, if you remember, if we hit reset password, we can unlock the account by checking this checkbox. But this method also requires you to reset the password. Now, if their account is locked out and they don't want a password change, what you can do is right click on the user account and choose properties. Next, if you go to the account tab, you can select unlock account. If the account is locked out, you'll see a message right after this unlocked account text. It'll say that this account is currently locked out. So if you check that checkbox and just click apply and okay, you will be able to unlock their user account without resetting their password. Now that's important for you to know. So now what I wanna do is I wanna show you what it's gonna look like when they try to log in to their account. Okay, so I'm on my little workstation here. I'm gonna type in the password that I created with an Active Directory. Uh, see if I can get this spelt right. One, two, press enter. And now it says a user's password must be changed before signing in. So I'm gonna click okay. Okay, so now I'm gonna create the new password. Type that in now. Press, I'm pressing tab to shift through these text boxes. And I'm gonna press enter. And it says it's changing the password. And it says your password has been changed. So now I'm gonna click okay. And now I'm brought to the desktop. Now this VM here only wants to run 800 by 600. So sorry about the resolution. But that is how you reset a user password in Active Directory users and computers. I hope you found this lecture useful. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello there, this is Paul Hill from InstructorPaul.com. And in this lecture, you are going to learn how to create and manage groups and object memberships within Active Directory users and computers. We're going to be completing this lecture from the Active Directory console. So if you've not already launched the console, go ahead and pause the video and do so now. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is create a new security group inside of our domain users organizational unit that I created earlier. And if you remember, we created this under instructor Paul. So I have my domain instructor Paul.com 
Then I have an instructor Paul organizational unit. And then I have a domain users organizational unit. And what I'm going to do is just right click either on the OU itself or over here in the right pane once I've navigated to that OU. So I'm going to right click here and I'm going to choose new group, which is near the top. All right, so the new group window will appear here. And the first thing we need to do is type in the group name. And just for this example, I'm going to call this group sales. And right away here, we can see the group name pre Windows 2000 is automatically populated, just like when you're creating a user account. And what this is for, like I said before, is a name that will be compatible with server operating systems older than 2000. So if we had characters up here that weren't compatible with older servers, it would not be included in this second group name. Now the group scope is basically the accessibility of this group. And the group type allows you to choose between a security group or a distribution group. Now we'll get more into these in just a second. If we choose a domain local scope, that means that this group will only be accessible from within this domain, instructorpaul.com. Now, if I have another domain called instructorrobert.com and I've established a trust between Instructor Paul and Instructor Robert, this group will not be accessible outside of that domain because we set up a domain local, meaning only accessible to instructorpaul.com. Now, this group scope goes from least accessible to most accessible. So the global scope is the same as domain local, except that the group can be accessed from another domain if there is a trust established. And a universal group is the same as a global group, except that the group can be accessed by other forests that trust your domain as well. Now the group type security and distribution are two completely different groups. And this is really important that you don't get this wrong. A security group, for example, is often used to specify permissions within your active directory domain. For example, accessing specific files, servers, printers, file shares, and much more. A distribution group is solely used as an email distribution list. If you have an exchange server, you could, for example, create a distribution group called IT support and add all of your IT support employees to this group. When an email is sent to the IT support group, it would also be sent to all of the users who are a member of the IT support distribution group. So now that we understand all of these settings, let's choose a sales group that has a global scope and it's a security group. Now let's click OK. Okay, so now we can see that the sales security group has been created. And if I expand this type here, I can see that it lists the type of group that it is and its scope. Now we can right click on this group and we can choose properties, which is down here near the bottom. Here we can put in information like the description, the email, if we would like. We can expand the group scope to universal if we'd like, or we could change the group type. We could add notes if we would like, and we can add members, and we can see what this group is a member of and who it is managed by. All right. Now the two most important tabs in the properties of a group is the members and the member of. So let's add our user account. In my case, it's Paul Hill. Let's add this user as a member to this group. So I'm going to click add and I'm going to type in my name here, paul.hill. That's my username. That is, you can type in either the full name or the username, whichever you would like. We'll click check names and we can see that paul.hill at instructorpaul.com was found. So I'm going to click OK now. And now we can see under members that Paul Hill is now a member of the group. I can also select this name and choose remove if I want to remove the user from the group, but I'm not going to do that just yet. All right, let's head over to the member of tab. Now the member of tab works essentially the same as the members tab, but the function is a lot different. So whereas instead of just adding members to this group, we can add this group as a member of another group. Say if, for example, if I wanted my sales members to also be a member of a customer service group, I could click add and type in the name of that group, which I haven't created by the way. And I could click check names and add it. 
So since I haven't created a group called customer service, if I just search for a group that I know exists like administrators, and if I click check names, we can see that it was able to find the group because it underlined the name of the group here. So if I click okay, I can see that sales is now a member of administrators. Granted, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense because I don't know why sales members would also be domain administrators, but just for the sake of the example, you can see how it is working here. So let's go ahead and just click okay. And now I'm gonna open Paul Hill by right clicking on this user account and choosing properties. And we're gonna go to the member of tab. And I can see that I am a member of the domain users and the sales group, okay? Now, on the other hand, let's go to the built-in section here and let's find administrators. And I can see them up here at the top. It's the third option for me. Now, if you're sorting by the uh, description or something different like that, it may be a little bit more difficult for you to find. If you can't find it, remember, you can hit the search button and you can just type in administrators and you can find the group that way. So double click on the group or right click and choose properties. And let's go to the members tab. And here we can see that we have administrators, domain admins, enterprise admins, and we have sales. So just like we did before, we can remove this group's membership by selecting the group and choosing remove. And we'll go ahead and do that now. So I'm gonna select remove. It's gonna say, do you want to remove the selected member from the group? I'm gonna say yes. And now that group is gone. Of course, if I don't click apply or okay, those settings won't take effect. But you can see the difference between users and groups because this user has this little singular user icon here and the domain admins group has an icon that has two people in the picture, okay? It's a quick and easy way for you to tell if it's a user or a group. So I'm gonna select okay. I'm gonna close out of my search here and I'm gonna go back to my sales group. All right, so here's my security group called sales. What I'm gonna do is right click and go back to properties and we're gonna see under the member of tab what groups this is a member of. And we can see that it's a member of no groups because under the administrators group, we removed this group's membership if you remember. Okay, now the last thing I'm gonna do is just delete this group because it's kind of silly to be honest. So I'm gonna right click and I'm going to choose delete because I don't have any salespeople in my domain. So I'm gonna say yes, I want to delete it. And that is how you create groups in Active Directory, and that is how you manage them. Now, you might not understand exactly why you would wanna set up groups just yet, but groups, especially security groups, go hand in hand with group policy. For example, you can set up a specific desktop background for the sales group, or you can give them access to a certain set of computers and there's so much that you can do with security groups. So groups are a really good thing for you to understand how to use. So again, this is Paul Hill from instructorpaul.com. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello there, this is Paul Hill from instructorpaul.com. And in this lecture, I'm gonna be showing you how you can delete and disable user accounts within Active Directory. Now this is something that you're gonna to have to know how to do if you're working a help desk job or even a systems administrator job or really any job where you work with Active Directory. Now, most companies have a policy of how they handle account deletions. For example, when an employee is terminated or if they quit, move on to another job, you'll need to take care of their account access or remove their account access so they can't come back later and log back into the domain. If they're no longer on the network or they don't have a need to get on the network, it's important that you don't grant access to that person. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually create a new organizational unit and we're gonna call it disabled users. So under my instructorpaul.com domain, I have instructorpaul and I'm gonna create a new OU under here by right clicking on this organizational unit and I'm gonna choose new and I'm gonna choose organizational unit drag this to the middle here. And I'm gonna name this OU Disabled Users. Okay, so I'll type that in now. All right, so I'll click OK. All right, we're gonna pretend like we have a work policy that when a user account is disabled or deleted, we are gonna move it to this organizational unit and then we're gonna disable it. 
And there could be a couple of reasons for that. One, it's really easy to tell if a user account is disabled just by looking at it. So if we remember to move the user account to this OU and we happen to be coming back later and we see that it's not disabled, we'll know that we need to disable the account. Number two, most companies that I've worked for do not allow you to delete the account unless the user has been terminated or has been off the network for a certain amount of days. So if someone's leaving the company, we'll disable their account for 30 days and then at the end of 30 days, we'll delete it. Just in case, you never know, they might come back uh, to get back on the network. Uh, there could be all kinds of reasons for you needing to reactivate their account. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna click on the domain users OU here and we're gonna disable my Paul Hill user account. Now, if you remembered when we created this account, we were able to log into my workstation. So what we're gonna do is disable it and just see what happens. Now, disabling a user account is, is really simple. All you need to do is right click on the account and just choose disable account. So I'm gonna do that now. And it says object Paul Hill has been disabled. So we'll click okay. And now if you notice, on my little user icon here, there's now a down arrow. And that's how you can tell if a user account is disabled. So what I'm gonna do now is left click on the user account and drag it into the disabled users organizational unit. Okay, so go ahead and do that. And we're gonna get this pop-up that says, moving objects in Active Directory domain services can prevent your existing system from working the way it was designed. For example, moving an organizational unit can affect the way group policies are applied to the accounts within the OU. This is just a warning message saying that if you don't know what you're doing, you can really cause problems. But what we're doing isn't gonna have any big effect because we haven't done any group policy work yet. So we're just gonna say, yes, this is fine. And yes, I want to move the object. All right, so now we'll go to disabled users and we can see that this user account has been moved to this organizational unit. And just for demonstration purposes, if I re-enable the account by right-clicking and choosing Enable Account, it says it's been enabled, you can see that icon's no longer there. So if we have 20 user accounts that have the down icon or the down arrow in the icon, and this user does not, it should be pretty easy for you to spot. You can just say, oops, someone forgot to disable this user account. Let me right-click and disable the account. So it kind of gives you two steps. First, you move it into the disabled users OU, which tells all your other administrators that you intended to disable the user account. And then you disable the user account and that lets everyone else know that they can no longer access this user account. So what we're gonna do now is pop over to my Windows 10 workstation and we are going to attempt to log into this user account. Okay, so here I'm gonna type in the username paul.hill and I'm going to type in the password. So I'm gonna press enter. And it says, your account has been disabled. Please see your system administrator. So now this user can no longer access the network using those credentials. So say for example that we went through the 30 day period or we're ready to delete the user account. What we can do now is right click on the user and choose delete. And it says, are you sure you want to delete the user named Paul Hill? And you simply say yes. Now I'm not gonna do this because I'm gonna be using the user account in the future. So I'm just gonna say no, but that is how you delete a user account with an Active Directory. All right, so general rule of thumb is you wanna disable the user account, leave them there for a certain amount of time, sometimes it's 30, 60, or 90 days, and then you come back and delete the user account. Okay, so I'm gonna right click on the user account and re-enable the account by selecting Enable Account here at the top. And we'll get a pop-up saying Object Paul Hill has been enabled, and I'm gonna click OK. And now I'm gonna drag the user back to domain users. Okay, so let's drag it to this OU here. And we're gonna say yes when we receive this prompt. And now my user account is back in the correct OU. So that is how you disable and delete user accounts within Active Directory. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hey, it's Paul Hill from InstructorPaul.com, and in this lecture, you're gonna be learning about group policy. Now, group policy is a tool that is used by systems administrators to quickly and easily make configuration changes to users and computers within Active Directory. I say easily because you can make one change in group policy and affect hundreds or thousands of workstations in your domain.
With Group Policy, you can implement security configurations across your domain quickly and easily. You can do things like restrict certain users from logging into certain computers, allow only certain users to access certain files, give specific or all users a specific desktop background, or even deploy software to certain computers within your domain. Group Policy is a must-have skill if you want to be a Windows Server or Systems Administrator, and so it's really important that you learn how to use this tool, and you're going to learn how to use Group Policy in this section. Now, one thing that you must keep in mind is that you cannot understand Group Policy without also understanding Active Directory users and computers. So if you've skipped over that section or you don't know how to use it, you may want to go back and learn Active Directory before proceeding on with this section. Now, Group Policy works by applying GPOs or Group Policy objects to the OU structure that you have created in Active Directory. A GPO contains separate configuration settings for both computers and for users. When a GPO is applied to an OU, the settings configured in the GPO are applied to the users and the computers that are within that OU. You can also configure the GPOs to only apply to certain objects by defining the security filtering. The most common default choice is the authenticated users group, which is basically any valid user or computer object within Active Directory. Don't worry as we'll cover more of the security filtering later. Now, GPOs are applied recursively, and this means that any setting that is applied to a parent OU or towards the domain will also apply to all sub OUs beneath the original OU that the GPO is applied to. So now let's go ahead and launch the Group Policy Management Console. In the top right corner of Server Manager, we're going to select Tools. And about halfway down, we're going to select Group Policy Management. Okay, so now the Group Policy Management Console will appear. Now, here I can see my forest for instructorpaul.com. What I'm going to do now is just click this arrow and expand this forest. Unless you've also created a domain called instructorpaul.com, you're going to see something different here. Just go ahead and expand your forest if you're following along. So now we're going to see domains. We'll see sites, group policy modeling, and group policy results. The domains folder contains all of the domains that are underneath our forest. The sites folder contains all of your sites that you may have configured through Active Directory sites and services. In short, this is used when you have servers that are physically located in different locations, like a different building, city, or even a different country. Group policy modeling and group policy results are both tools that can be used to troubleshoot any group policy issues that may arise while you're working with group policy objects. Now let's expand the domains folder here. And here we can see instructorpaul.com. I'm going to expand this domain. And from this view, we're going to see a similar view to that of Active Directory. Now, note that you cannot see any of the Active Directory containers, like the users container, for example. But we can see the OUs that we have created and the default domain controllers OU. So if you remember, this was the only organizational unit that we had by default. And we created this instructor Paul OU and the disabled users, domain computers, and domain users OU. Now, directly beneath the domain is the default domain policy. And what this message is saying is that we've selected a link to a group policy object, not a GPO itself. We'll cover more of this later. For now, just click OK. Now, as the name implies, this is a GPO that comes by default when a new domain is created. Since it is directly underneath my domain, it will be applied to all of the Active Directory objects beneath the root of the domain. So it's going to be applied to anything under domain controllers, anything under instructor Paul, including disabled users, domain computers, and domain users, as well as any objects that are directly beneath the instructorpaul.com domain. Now this group policy object folder includes all of the GPOs that are inside of this domain, whether they are in use or not. If I click this little expand button, we can see here that the default domain policy is listed here and the default domain controllers policy which if I expand domain controllers, we can see that link is represented here. So when we got that message saying we have selected the link, not the GPO itself, that's because this GPO, default domain controllers policy, is linked to the domain controllers OU. And all that means is that this GPO is taking effect on this OU here.
WMI filters allows you to add specific rules when a GPO should or should not be applied. For example, you could only apply a particular GPO if the computer is using the operating system of Windows 7 or newer. You can do things like that with the WMI filters. Now the starter GPOs folder is used when you want to import or export GPOs for distribution to other environments. All right, so now we have covered the basics of what group policy is and how to open the management console and a brief overview on what's inside of the console. So great job getting through this lecture. There's a whole lot more we have to learn on group policy, but I'm looking forward to teaching it to you in the next lectures. Hey, it's Paul Hill from InstructorPaul.com. And in this lecture, you're going to learn about how to create and manage group policy objects, commonly referred to as GPOs. Now, GPOs contain settings and configurations that can be applied to users or computers that are stored within Active Directory. A domain can contain several GPOs, and you will almost never see a domain that contains only one GPO. It's also important to know that one individual GPO can be linked or applied to multiple OUs simultaneously. GPOs are often used in a modular sense, meaning that the administrator might create several GPOs or just one GPO and apply them to multiple OUs as needed. For example, you could create a GPO that installs Adobe Flash Player, and you might apply this GPO to all of the OUs that contain computers which would need Adobe Flash Player. Or you could create a GPO that prevents users from launching Internet Explorer, and you would link that GPO to all of the OUs that contain user accounts where you wouldn't want them to be able to launch Internet Explorer. Creating a GPO is very similar to creating a user account within Active Directory. All you need to do is right click on Group Policy Objects and say New. Additionally, you can right click on your domain or on an organizational unit, and you can say Create a GPO in this domain and link it here. So the difference between right clicking on group policy objects and selecting new and right clicking on instructorpaul.com and saying create a GPO in this domain and link it here is that this option will create a GPO and it will create a link for the GPO, which means that the GPO will take effect wherever we create the link. All right, so let's go ahead and create a GPO using both methods so you'll understand what's going on. First, let's create a GPO under instructorpaul.com and create a link there. So I'm going to right click on instructorpaul.com and I'm going to say create a GPO in this domain and link it here. All right. Now this new GPO window will appear and we need to name the GPO. I'm going to call this test GPO. And since we haven't created any starter GPOs under this folder here, we have to leave the second option at none. Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing. All that means is that the GPO is going to be blank and all the settings inside of the GPO will be not configured. So I'm just gonna click OK. So now if we click on Test GPO, we can see that we the link has been created here, and if we expand Group Policy Objects, we can see that the GPO has been created here. All right, now let's go ahead and right click on this Test GPO. Note that we're clicking on the link under instructorpaul.com and not under Group Policy Objects. Right click, and let's choose Delete. Now it's saying, do you want to delete this link? This will not delete the GPO itself. Okay, that's very important. We're gonna click OK to delete the link. And what you'll notice is that the test GPO is still listed under group policy objects. So we didn't delete the GPO, we just deleted the link for the GPO. All right, so now let's right click on the test GPO and let's delete the GPO itself. So right click and choose delete. And it says, do you want to delete this GPO and all links to it in this domain? This will not delete links in other domains. Okay, we only have one domain, so that last bit of that message doesn't apply to us. I'm gonna say yes. And now we have deleted the GPO that we just created. Okay, so now let's do it the other way by just creating the GPO and then manually creating the links after that. So I'm gonna right click on group policy objects and I'm gonna say new. And we're gonna call it test GPO. So, so far, everything is exactly the same as before. Uh, we're gonna use none as the source starter, and I'm gonna click OK. All right, so now we have test GPO, but it's not linked anywhere in our domain. If we expand domain controllers, instructor Paul, if we try to expand all these folders, you can see that it's not linked anywhere, so it's not actually going to take effect. 
even if we opened up the GPO and made configuration changes, this GPO would have no effect on our domain because there is no link for it. So let's change that by linking it to instructorpaul.com. So what I'm gonna do is right click and we need to choose link existing GPO. And here we can see, look in this domain. This is where if I had instructorrobert.com and I had GPOs inside of that domain, I could select those GPOs here, but since I only have instructorpaul.com, we can only choose GPOs from this domain. Now here we can see test GPO. So if I click okay, now the GPO has a link under instructorpaul.com. So now you can see why it's an advantage to create the GPO by right clicking on the location where you want the GPO to be linked as it saves you from a step. Now let's go ahead and delete that link by right clicking on it and choosing delete. Now we're gonna say yes, we want to delete the link. Now let's take a scenario where we want to apply the test GPO to our domain users and domain computers OUs. Now if we link the GPO to instructorpaul.com, it's gonna to apply to everything under the domain. It's gonna to apply to our domain controllers, uh, anything that is directly under instructorpaul.com, as well as anything that's inside of these OUs. So if we wanna target just these two OUs, we need to link this GPO to these particular OUs. So I'm gonna right click on domain computers, and I'm gonna say link an existing GPO. And then we're gonna select test GPO, and then we'll click OK. All right, so now test GPO has been linked to domain computers. Now let's do the same for domain users because remember we want these settings to apply to both of these OUs. So I'm gonna right click and we're gonna choose link existing GPO again. Same exact process, we're gonna choose test GPO and we'll click okay. So now we can see that the one GPO is now linked to multiple OUs. All right, now, now this would work if we had both computer and user configurations set up within the test GPO. Now, since we don't have anything configured in this GPO yet, it's just gonna be blank and it won't actually make any changes. But in theory, we could now go in and make computer changes and user configuration changes, and they would both take effect to our domain users and our domain computers. Like I said before, we could also just link it one time at instructorpaul.com and it would take effect to everything under the domain. All right, so now that you understand how to create a GPO and how to link it to particular OUs and domains, let's right click on the GPO and look what kind of options we have. Now we can edit the GPO, which is where we will actually configure the user settings, computer settings. We can make the GPO enforced, which means it will take precedence over other GPOs if they're configuring the same setting. We can disable the link by choosing link enabled. Now this is similar to deleting the link, but it will remain there. So if you need to do some testing, you think this GPO might be causing problems, you can right click and choose link enabled. All it's gonna do is cause this link or GPO to not take effect to the domain computers OU. Just because we disabled the link here does not mean that the link is not enabled here, okay? So we can clearly see that by right clicking on the other link. All right, so we can re-enable that link by just right clicking and choosing link enabled. We could also save a report of the GPO and that would let you know all the settings. So we can do that now by just hitting save report. I'll just go to the desktop and we'll call it test GPO and we'll just click save. Now we can double click on this and choose, I'm gonna open it in Internet Explorer. And it's gonna say, I need to click those settings. And here we can see all of the settings that are configured within this GPO. All right, so we can see the details, the links, the security filtering, the delegation, and here's the actual configuration. So we can see the computer configuration, which is enabled, but no settings are defined. And we can see the user configuration, which is also enabled, but no settings are defined. All right, so that's just kind of a high level overview of what the GPO is doing uh, within your domain and where it's linked or what OUs is taking effect. We can see domain computers and domain users. All right, so close out of that report. Now, if we right click on the link again, the view allows us to make changes to the group policy management console itself. We're not actually making any changes with the GPO. A little bit deceiving there. Also, we can make a new window from here. So if I select that, I'll show you what it looks like. All it does is it hides everything in this left pane which I've never seen anybody use this, and I don't think it's too useful unless you get distracted by seeing your uh, OU structure 
in the other group policy objects on the left side here. Again, I've never seen anybody use this and I don't think it's particularly useful. So you can leave this view by clicking the little X here in the top right corner. Notice it's not the big one for group policy management, it's this little one here. Okay, so right clicking back on the link, we can delete the link, rename it, which will also rename the GPO itself. So if I do that here, test GPO3 is now test GPO3. And if we expand group policy objects, we can see here test GPO3. All right. Now we can refresh the GPO if any changes have been made. Uh, we would be able to see that by right clicking and refreshing the view. And we can get help, which we all know is not very helpful. Nine times out of 10, if you need help, you need to go to Google and type in what you're looking for, or what you're trying to do, and you're gonna find help that way, all right? Okay, so now let's look in this right-hand side of the screen here for our test GPO, which is now called test GPO3. We have the scope, which tells us where the GPO is being applied. Now we can display the links in this location. For example, if I had instructorrobert.com, I could only show the links to the ones in instructorpaul.com. But uh, since I only have the one domain, we can only see the links that are within instructorpaul.com. Okay, so we can uh, right click and delete the particular links if we'd like to. And we can get the same view here by just selecting the GPO itself. So we can right click on the link, uh, we can enforce it, delete it, and turn on or off the link enabled option. Now under security filtering, this is where we can make the GPO only apply to certain user types. So if I have a group, like I can click add here, and if I type in administrators, and if I click check names here, we can see that it was able to find the administrators group. If I click okay, now this GPO is going to apply to administrators. Now it's also gonna to apply to authenticated users, so I really haven't changed anything. But if I remove authenticated users, now this GPO will only apply to people who are members of the administrators group which in this case is, I believe, only user accounts. If I double click on the group here, we can click members, and we can see here we have a couple other groups here, but I don't believe any of the computers are members of these groups. If I keep expanding here, we can see these are all user accounts. I'll close out of this group. And if I expand enterprise admins, this also only contains user accounts. So by changing the security filtering to administrators, any computer configuration within this GPO would no longer take effect because the security filtering is only going to apply to user accounts. All right, so even though I have it linked to Domain Computers OU, this GPO will only take effect to user accounts who are members of the Domain Administrators group. Now, if I added computer accounts to the Administrators group, which would be silly, by the way, if I did that and they happen to be in this Domain Computers OU, it would then take effect against those computers. Now, by default, it is set to authenticated users, and nine times out of 10, that's where you wanna leave it. So I'm gonna remove administrators here by selecting administrators and then choosing remove. It's gonna say, do you wanna remove this delegation privilege? We'll say yes. It's funny that it calls it delegation because it's not really a delegation of permissions. It's more just saying that, you know, this is gonna take effect against this type of user. So I'm gonna to go to authenticated users. And if I just click check names, it will auto populate for me. I'm gonna click okay. Now authenticated users is a little bit of a special group here. We can't go to properties and we can't see who's a member of it because it's anyone who is able to authenticate against the domain. It could be a user account, it could be a computer account, it could even be a printer account. Any kind of Active Directory object that is authenticated, this GPO can take effect against. Now WMI filtering is more filtering you can do in addition to security filtering. And like we talked about before, you can do things like only apply this GPO to Windows 7 computers and things like that. Since we haven't created any WMI filters, uh, we can't choose anything in this option. We can only choose none. So nothing to select there. Okay, so now if we click the details tab here, we can see the domain is listed here, the owner, uh, domain admins, when it was created, when it was modified last. We can see the user version and the computer version, the unique ID for this GPO and the GPO status which if we click this drop down, we can disable computer configuration settings or the user configuration settings, enable all the settings or disable all of the settings. Now this user version and computer version is important when you're getting into replication. So if you have multiple domain controllers that are sharing the same GPO, if you make changes on one GPO, that same version is gonna to need to be replicated on the other domain controller. And that's where these user versions and computer versions come into play. 
So if I was to log into another domain controller that is also servicing this instructorpaul.com, and I wasn't sure if the settings were being replicated properly between the domain controllers, I could open up the GPO, look under the details, and see what version I'm working with and compare it to the other domain controller. All right, so now under settings, this is the same window that we saw when we exported the report. Now this warning here is because we're using Internet Explorer to display the settings. And by default, Internet Explorer is going to block this type of information. So we can either close this window or we can add an exception for the security mmc.exe. And I'm going to add the exception because I trust group policy. So I'm going to click add and I'm going to hit add again and I'm going to click close. All right, so here we can see the computer configuration and the user configuration. Now we can see if the computer configuration is enabled or disabled here. So for example, if we go back to details, we can say computer configuration is disabled. We'll click OK when the prompt comes up. Now if we go back to settings, we can see here that the computer configuration is now showing as disabled. So I'm going to go undo the changes that I just made under the details tab, change it back to enabled. We'll click OK. And if we flip back to the settings, we can see that all has been restored. Now there's no settings defined in this GPO because we haven't actually edited it yet, but that's fine. Uh, now if we go under delegation, now this is a list of users who have permissions to read, edit, or delete, or modify the GPO itself. Now we can see by default any authenticated user can read this GPO. And that's important because we want everyone in our domain to be able to read this GPO in case it has a setting that applies to them. Domain admins can edit the settings, delete it, or modify its security. Same for enterprise admins and system and enterprise domain controllers can read the setting. I'm not gonna to get too deep into each of these, just the important thing is that authenticated users can read this GPO. Now I have worked in a scenario where when administrators are being trained, instead of giving them the domain admins membership to their user account, which would allow them to do whatever they wanted in Active Directory and Group Policy, they will instead create a GPO, link it to an OU where it's safe, and under that GPO, they would go to delegation and they would add that user. So for example, if I wanted to take my account, Paul Hill, and if I wanted to give my that user permissions to edit this GPO, I could do that by going to delegation, clicking add, and I could type in paul.hill, click check names. We can see that it found my user account and I can click okay. So now I can set permissions like I can have it so that I can edit the settings of the GPO. So if I'm trying to train myself or if I'm trying to train Paul Hill and I only want him to be able to edit the settings of one particular GPO, I can do that here, all right? So I'm just gonna click okay. And we can see that is now listed here that Paul Hill can now edit the settings. Now notice that I can't delete the GPO or modify its security, but that is one way that you can allow people to have some control without giving them full control to your domain just by using the delegation tab. I'm gonna go ahead and remove that. Click OK. We can see here that we can do more permissions uh, settings for all of the users that are listed here. Like authenticated users, we can see is read only. Uh, system has its own set of permissions, etc. So we're not gonna make any changes to this and nine times out of 10, you won't have to mess with the delegation at all. Generally, what you'll do, you'll right click, you'll create a GPO, and then you'll select the GPO and you'll choose edit. And it's really that simple. Once it's linked to an OU and you're ready to edit the GPO, those settings will then take effect. Now we're gonna get more into the settings within GPOs in a later lecture. Now this is Paul Hill from instructorpaul.com. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Hey, it's Paul Hill from itflea.com. And in this lesson, I'm gonna be explaining group policy precedents. Now, precedence means the order or the way that things are done. And with group policy, there is a specific order in which group policy objects or GP settings are applied. It's important to understand this for, because from time to time, you'll have multiple GPOs trying to configure the same setting, and you have to understand the precedence in order to understand which settings will be applied and which settings will be ignored. Now, the order that group policy runs is this. It starts with the local group policy. That is, if you hit the Windows button right now and type in gpedit.msc, you will be able to edit the local group policy. Now this is the first thing that is applied to the computer and it's also viewed as the least important. Next, any group policy objects that are assigned to your site are then applied. 
And this means that it overwrites any conflicts that it may find between the local and the site group policy. So if you configure a desktop wallpaper in the local group policy, and you configure it in the site policy, the site policy will take precedence over the local group policy because it was applied after the local group policy. Next in the order is the domain policy. So any policies assigned to the domain will now be applied on top of the site and local settings. Next, we have the organizational unit. And this is any GPO that is linked to a specific OU. Also, that goes for sub OU. So if there's an organizational unit within an organizational unit, the sub OU will be applied last and therefore its settings will take precedence over anything that is above it. Now, finally, we have enforced group policy objects. Now, this is any GPO where you've right clicked and choose to enforce the GPO. So just a quick recap, you start with local, that's the least important GPO because it's the first one that is computed. You end with enforced group policy objects. So if there are conflicting settings between the local and the enforced, since the enforced group policy objects will be run last, they will take precedence. So remember the last GPO to be applied always wins. Now you can remember this order by remembering the acronym LSDO or LSDO. So it stands for Local Site Domain OU and Enforced. All right, now we have to consider computer versus user. Now, within a GPO, you have a computer and a user configuration. The computer configuration is applied first and the user configuration is applied second. We said that the settings that are applied last are the ones that are going to win. So if you have conflicting settings between your computer and user configuration, the user configuration will win that battle. So the computer configuration is the least important and the user configuration is the most important. Now here's a picture just showing a GPO in the group policy management editor. You can see at the top you have the computer configuration and the user configuration. Hopefully that helps you relate to what we're talking about. Now let's take a wallpaper scenario. Let's say we have five GPOs that are configuring the same wallpaper settings. So someone has gone into all these GPOs and they've said, I want this desktop background to be configured and it's different for each GPO. Which GPO is gonna win? Well, in order to know this, we're gonna have to remember LSDO, which is local, site, domain, OU, and enforced. And in this first little diagram that we have here, we have ITF Workstation 01. It has a local policy that is configured to use the background udemy.jpg. In this scenario, the local is gonna win because nothing else is configured. But say another administrator comes behind and they add a site policy that configures pauliscool.jpg. We can remember that the S or site is a second item in the order of precedence, so pauliscool.jpg will take effect over udemy.jpg. So this desktop background will be assigned. Now, if someone came through and assigned a domain policy and configured itflea.jpg should be the background, then that GPO will overwrite the udemy.jpg and the pauliscool.jpg, and it will take precedence. So to help you understand what's going on, is your computer is going to update its group policy. It's going to use this local policy. It's going to apply udemy.jpg as the background. Then it's going to get down to the site policy and it's going to apply pauliscool.jpg. And then it's going to get to the domain policies and it's going to apply itflea.jpg. And this is the final setting that will be set in place on this computer. Now we also have organizational units. So if we had a GPO assigned to the OU domain computers, and it configured ITF logo to be the background, then it would take precedence over all the other ones because it's at the organizational unit level. Now, if we had a sub OU and it was called workstations and we assigned a GPO to that sub OU called basketball.jpg, it would take effect over all of the GPOs above it. So we can see here, we started with local, we went down to site, we went down to domain, and we went down to OU and then sub OU and the sub OU is taking precedence over all of the other options. Now we still haven't covered enforced. So if we wanted to enforce one of these policies, say we take itflea.com and we enforce this policy, what do you think is gonna win? Well, we know in our acronym, enforce is the last item in the order of precedence. So if we take a look, itflea.com, the domain policy that is enforced will take precedence over all the other GPOs because it is enforced. Now with in-group policy, there's something called blocked inheritance. And this is a term that is used when it comes to organizational units. An OU can block its inheritance 
which means only GPOs inside of that OU will apply, except for enforced GPOs that are above the OU. Now to block inheritance, you simply right click on the OU like you see in this image and you choose block inheritance. So in this particular circumstance, the test, you can barely see it here, but in the bottom there is test GPO. You can't, you can only see the first letter, the first two letters. So you see TE, that stands for test GPO. So if we were to block inheritance on this OU, the default domain policy would not apply, but the test GPO would apply, okay? Now, let's take another example, and let's just say at itfleet.com, we have the itfleet.jpg configured, and then at the OU itfleet, we have ITF logo, and then we have Paul is cool under administrators. And we can see that represented down here. Now, the, or, the group policy objects are actually called itfleet.jpg. You wouldn't necessarily do that. You could do it that way, but normally it would be called something like desktop background or something silly like that. Just to make it clear, I have named them what the actual desktop background file name is, just to help it be a little bit more clear. So in this particular scenario, we have itflea.jpg linked to itflea.com. We can see that's represented up here. Then we have itflogo.jpg linked to the itflea OU. We can see that's referenced right here. And then under administrators, we have pauliscool.jpg. And we can see that is referenced right here. Now in this particular scenario, since we're going down to a sub OU, the Paul is cool .jpg will win. Because remember, we have local site domain organizational unit and enforced. Now let's say if we blocked inheritance, what does that mean? What that means is the itflea.jpg still is not gonna apply. The itflea logo.jpg is not gonna apply. And Paul is cool .jpg is still gonna apply. So nothing really changed except test GPO and default domain policy now no longer apply to the administrator's OU. Now, what if we enforce the itflea.jpg? You can see here that the icon has changed. This is the icon when you see this lock, that means the GPO is enforced. And when you see this exclamation mark, that means the GPO is blocking inheritance. What's gonna happen in this particular circumstance is that itflea.jpg will take precedence because it is an enforced GPO. So remember, we have local, site, domain, we have organizational unit, and then we have enforced. So enforced always wins over all of those. In conclusion, the last GPO to be applied wins, and remember the acronym local, site, domain, OU, and enforced, which is LSDO, or L-S-D-O-E. You can come up with any way that you wanna remember it. Uh, I like to call it LSDO because that's just easy for me, but remember that acronym, and that's all we got to cover in this lecture. Now you understand group policy precedents. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I enjoyed making it for you. I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Hey, it's Paul Hill from instructorpaul.com. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about actually editing the settings or the configurations for group policy objects. So I already have group policy opened. And what I'm gonna do is just edit my test GPO3 that we created earlier. If you deleted this GPO or you don't have a test GPO, you can do that by just right clicking on the OU and creating a new GPO in this domain and creating a link. We are gonna to need to create a GPO and link it to an OU. So it doesn't matter where it's linked, just as long as you have it there. Once you have the GPO, we're gonna right click and we're gonna choose edit. All right, so I'll go ahead and maximize this screen. And I'm going to drag this little side pane over a little bit. Okay, so right away, you're going to notice we have computer and user configuration. We can also see that represented on the left-hand side here. On the left-hand side, you can kind of think of this as the navigation pane. And on the right-hand side, you can see the contents pane of wherever we're located. Now, you might be wondering, how do you know if you're going to use a computer or a user configuration? And the answer depends on what you're linking this GPO to. For example, if you're linking this GPO to an OU that only contains computer accounts, like in my case, I might use domain computers, then I'm gonna wanna edit the settings under computer configuration. If on the other hand, I'm linking this GPO to an OU that only has users inside of the OU, then I'm gonna wanna use the user configuration. The important thing to know here is that the computer configuration settings will only apply to computer objects within Active Directory. So if I link this to the user OU and only user objects are within that OU, and if I make computer configuration changes, none of those settings will have an effect. Alternatively, if I make changes to the user configuration portion of this GPO, and I link the GPO to the domain computers OU, 
where there's only computer accounts within and no user accounts, then none of these user configuration settings will take effect. Now, if I had a case where I had an OU that contained both users and computers, then I could make changes to either one of these and they would take effect, but only the computer configuration changes would affect the computer objects and only the user configuration would affect the user objects. It's generally a better practice to keep the users and computers in different organizational units just to avoid confusion like this. Just keeps it more simple and less complicated. Now, inside of the computer and the user configuration, we have policies and preferences for both. So it would appear that we can make the same configurations for both computers and users, and this is false. For example, if we open Windows settings for the computer configuration and Windows settings for the user configuration, we're gonna note that most of the settings are the same, but there's a few things that are different, like this name resolution policy is not found under the user configuration for Windows settings. Alternatively, the folder redirection is not found on the computer side. And this is because folder redirection is something that you only set up for user accounts. It's not something that you can set up for computer accounts. Okay, same goes for name resolution policy. This is not something that you'd set up on a per user basis. All right, so there's way too many settings inside of group policy for me to go through each one individually. So what I'm gonna encourage you to do is just browse through these settings and just kind of get an idea for what you can change. For example, we can go under control panel settings and we can set up things like printers, local users and groups. And if we open control panel on the user configuration, we're gonna find that we're gonna be able to set nearly the same settings. So for example, we can set power options on a computer or a user basis. So these apply to either. So we can say a new uh, power plan for anything newer than Windows 7. And we can just specify when the computer goes to sleep, when it's plugged in or on battery. And we can do the exact same set of options or settings on a user basis. So if we wanted a certain type of users like our domain admins to never put the computer to sleep when it's plugged in, we can do that on a per user basis. On the other hand, if we have a set of laptops and a special OU and we decide we want them to turn off, we could do that up here under the computer configuration, okay? So we will just configure one setting here just so you get an idea of how this works. If I go under user configuration, so I'm gonna go under computer configuration, Windows settings, and let's go to uh, event log, for example. Okay, so we can say prevent local guest groups from accessing the application log. First thing I wanna show you is that the policy setting is not defined, and so we can right click on this GPO setting and we can choose properties. Now this opens up the setting and it allows us to edit the setting. Now if we're not sure what the setting does, we can go to the explain tab and it's gonna tell us exactly what this setting is going to do. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. And we can define this setting and either enable or disable the configuration. So if we decide to disable it, we can hit okay. And now we can see the policy setting is set to disabled. All right, now if I minimize this group policy editor and I go back to my test GPO and if I click on settings, you might have to refresh this if you already had settings open, uh, but we can see here that now under policies, Windows settings and security settings under the event log, we can now see that this policy is set to disabled. So if we were to save a report, we would see that option that we just configured. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn this back off. Just uncheck define policy settings, hit apply, and now it's not defined. Okay, so that is how you edit settings within a group policy object. Now, there are a ton, and I mean a ton of options that you can choose uh, inside of this group policy management. It really is like, I don't, I don't know exactly how many you can choose, but it's in, in the hundreds for sure. Maybe it's even over a thousand. It's way too much for me to just cover each individual one. Generally, if you wanna set like, say for example, a desktop background, if you just hop on Google and say how to set desktop background with a GPO, you'll come up with a walkthrough. There's been walkthroughs made for just about everything you can imagine, everything inside of a group policy object anyways. So I'm just gonna go ahead and close out of this GPO. And what I'm gonna do now is, since this is just a test GPO and we don't really need it, I'm just gonna delete it. So I'm gonna to go to test GPO three, I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna choose delete. And it's gonna say, do you wanna delete the GPO? I'm gonna say yes. And there we go, now we've deleted that GPO. So that is how you edit the settings of a group policy object in group policy management. I hope you found this lecture useful. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one.
Hello there, this is Paul Hill from InstructorPaul.com and in this lecture, I'm gonna be giving you some basic troubleshooting steps that you can take when you're experiencing issues with group policy. Now, we're gonna cover what's called RSOP or resultant set of policy in this lecture. And this is something that allows you to see what kind of policies are being pushed to the computer and to the user that you're currently logged into. So the way that you start RSOP uh, is by hitting the Windows button here in the bottom left and you can just type in rsop.msc. Now, this is something that's available on Windows operating systems. So you can find it on Windows Server as well as your Windows 10 or Windows 7 workstations. So we're going to launch rsop.msc here. And just in case your search is broken, you can see the path to rsop is under the C Windows system32 and rsop.msc. So I can just show that to you really fast. So we'll go to the C drive. I know for some of you the search window won't work, so I just want to show this to you as an alternative. So C, Windows, we're going to go to system32. And we're looking for rsop. And there it is. So you can also launch it this way. Now. Here we can see that resultant set or RSOP has loaded. We can see that it's generating information for administrator on IPDC01. This is a user account that I'm currently logged into, and this is the computer that I'm currently logged into. So it looks oddly familiar to a group policy object, if you remember. If we expand all these settings, we can see that we're missing administrative templates, and that is not shown inside of this resultant set of policy. But we can expand these settings here and we can see what exactly is being applied to this workstation. Now it's not going to show everything. So for example, if we open up local policies, we can hit security options here and we can see what settings are defined and what settings are not defined as well as the source GPO. So if you've created a GPO and it's conflicting with another GPO, you can run RSOP. You can see which GPO is actually being applied to the workstation. So if I expand this here, we can see that the setting for LDAP server signing requirements is set to none, and the source GPO is the default domain controller's policy. We can double click and get more information on this. And uh, we can see the settings here. We can go down to the precedence, and we can see uh, what GPOs are trying to configure this setting. And we can go down and explain and understand what the setting does. Okay, so I'm gonna close out of this window. So by default, there's nothing configured under the user configuration, uh, under the default domain policy or the domain controller policy. So even though I navigate through all these, there's no settings that are configured. If we configured you know, a desktop background for each individual user account, we would be able to see that here and we would be able to see and what GPO is applying the setting. Okay, so that is how you use RSOP. This is a very helpful tool when you're trying to figure out you know, what's going on with your group policy. Like, just remember, if group policy is not operating in the way that you expect, RSOP is one way that you can find out why your settings aren't being configured like you expect them to. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I hope you found this tip useful. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Hey, it's Paul Hill from InstructorPaul.com and in this lecture, I'm gonna be teaching you how you can troubleshoot group policy with command prompt. Now, if we hit the start button here on my Windows server, we can type in CMD, spell that right, CMD, and it will open command prompt. Now here we can just left click. This is what you're gonna be using to troubleshoot a lot of things on Windows server, not just group policy. But there's a very useful command that you can type in here that's really gonna help you out when you just need to find out what kind of GPOs are being applied to this user account or to this computer. And that command is GP result. And if we hit space and do forward slash R for report, we can press enter. And it's going to create this little output here, which I'll maximize this. And this tells us all of the objects that are applied to our user account. So I'll just break this down so we understand what's going on. Right here's just some version information for the group policy result tool. Okay, that's not too important. If we scroll down, we can see here's the RSOP data for instructor Paul and the administrator. This is the user account that I'm currently logged into, and this is the computer account that I'm currently logged into.
All right, we can see the OS configuration, uh, not too important here. Uh, we can see the lo where the local profile is stored. That is very important if you're using roaming profiles. We see whether or not we're connected over a slow link. Uh, and if we go down here, we can see computer settings. We can see the CN IPDC01. We can see which OU it sits under and what domain. So instructorpaul.com. We can see when the last time the group policy was applied. And I can see that it was just a few minutes ago. So I only have one domain controller, which is IPDC01. But if you're experiencing replication issues, in other words, you make one change on IPDC01 and it doesn't replicate over to IPDC02, we can figure out where this is pulling its policy from, which domain controller. All right. Here's some speed information, uh, the domain name that we're working under, Instructor Paul, and the domain type, which is Windows 2008 or later. It's actually Windows 2016, but it just says 2008 or later. Now, this is the most important part of GP result, the applied group policy objects. Now to this computer, it's receiving policy settings from the default domain controller's policy and the default domain policy. Now this is important because when you create a new group policy object, the first thing that I would do is go to the target computer or the target user account, and I would run GP result forward slash R. And that's gonna allow you to see very fast whether or not your GPO is actually being applied to the computer or not. It's a lot easier to do this than to try and find the setting that the GPO is configuring and just verifying it that way. So for example, if you're verifying you know, a registry setting, it's easier to run the GP result command than it is to open your registry and find the actual setting. Although I would recommend doing that as well. Now, here we can see that there might be GPUs that are filtered out. And this is where it comes down to security filtering, or even just if you created a GPU that only contained user settings, it could be listed here. Now we're gonna find membership information for the computer, saying what uh, com security groups it's a part of. And we can see the built-in administrators, this is the domain controller. It's also part of everyone built-in users. Uh, domain controllers, it's part of. And if we scroll down, we're gonna see the exact same set of options, but this time for user settings. Okay, so same kind of information, uh, domain that we're working with, the domain type, and the applied group policy objects. Now you'll notice that none are applied here because by default, there are no user settings configured in any of the default domain policies that come when you set up a Windows domain. So if we were to set up a GPO and link it to the root of our domain, then we would see those GPOs listed here, okay? And here again, we can see the memberships of this particular user. So it's part of administrators, uh, domain administrators, enterprise, et cetera. Okay, so that is how you use the command GP result forward slash R. So remember this when you have problems with group policy, run this command and look over the output. Just remember it gives you a computer settings output and a user settings output. So know if you're, if you, so know which one you want to look for. If you set up computer settings or a computer configuration or a user configuration, that will determine where you look for the GPOs. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I hope you learned something from it. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Hey, it's Paul Hill from InstructorPaul.com. And in this lecture, we're going to be creating non-inheriting organizational units. And I'm going to show you how they work and why you would want to do that. So first thing we need to do is open Active Directory Users and Computers. Now the reason why I'm gonna do this is I'm actually gonna create an organizational unit and then I'm gonna make it so it doesn't inherit. To do this, I'm gonna select Tools and then Active Directory Users and Computers. And while we're navigating to this window, a non-inheriting OU means that the organizational unit is not going to inherit any group policy objects that are not directly linked to the organizational unit except for those group policy objects that are enforced. Okay, so under my instructorpaul.com domain, I'm gonna go under my instructorpaul organizational unit, and I'm gonna create a new OU. So I'm gonna right click and choose new, and organizational unit down about halfway down. Okay, so now I'm gonna give it a name. I'll call it test, and then in parentheses, I'm gonna call it non-inheriting. Okay, so now I'll just click OK. All right. Okay, since I'm logged into my domain controller and I'm not going to be using a workstation, I'm going to drag my domain administrator 
account into this test non-inheriting OU, and I will complete my test with the administrator user. So under users, I can see administrator is listed here. So I'm just gonna drag this user into the non-inheriting OU. And I'll say yes. Okay, so if I open up this OU, I can now see that administrators is inside of the OU. Now we haven't done anything to this organizational unit, so it'll function like normal. So let's go ahead and hit tools and open group policy management. And I'll expand my forest. I'm gonna expand domains and instructorpaul.com and the OU instructor Paul. So what we have to do since we're testing this on a user account, we actually need to create an, a GPO that has some user settings. So I'm just gonna edit the default domain policy. So I'm gonna right click on it, choose edit. And we'll go under policies. Let's go under administrative templates, desktop, and let's say disable active desktop. So I'm gonna double click on that option and I'm going to change this to enabled. So I'll hit apply. I'm really just picking any random setting. You can do the same thing, but I chose to do disable active desktop. So if I expand it here, uh, we can see that it's now enabled. All right, so I'm gonna close out of this group policy, man group policy management editor and I'm gonna hit open command prompt And I'm gonna run GP update, which will update the policy on this computer immediately. So instead of waiting however long it takes, which I think the default is 90 minutes, it's just gonna update the policy right now. Okay, so now we can run GP result forward slash R, and we should see the default domain being applied under the user settings. So here's user settings. And we can now see that the default domain policy is being applied. All right, now let's create another new GPO under this test OU, this test non inheriting. Okay, so I'm going to create a GPO in this domain and link it here. And we'll call this test GPO. Okay, so if I expand this OU now, I can see that test GPO has been linked here. And we can see the test GPO has been created under group policy objects. Now we need to set up a few settings, so I'm just gonna go under edit, under test GPO, right click and choose edit. And then under user configuration, I'm gonna go under preferences, Windows settings. Let's go to folders. And I'm just gonna right click and say new folder. All right, and the action we can leave is update. The path will be C test folder, all right? Now I'll just click apply and okay. So now we have some settings inside of this test GPO. If I close out of this editor, I can select the GPO and go to settings. And we can see that there are user configurations, okay? So now if we run another GP update, okay, so we're gonna run GP update forward slash force. Okay, it says the policy has been updated. So in a second. Okay, so now that that's done, we're gonna type in GP result forward slash R. All right, so now under the applied group policy objects for my users, I can see test GPO and the default domain policy. If we make this test non-inheriting OU non-inheriting, then it will not inherit the default domain policy. If there are settings and GPOs that are being inherited that are causing issues, we can verify that by blocking all inheritance and just linking the GPOs that we wanna to test to this organizational unit. So I'm gonna do that by right clicking here on this OU and I'm gonna say block inheritance. So now we can see that exclamation mark is listed there. Notice under Active Directory Users and Computers, if I refresh this view, there is no change. There's no way for you to know if it's an inheriting OU or not. That's why I said you should name it with a non-inheriting tag. Or you could go into the properties if you would like and you can give it a description. But I really like to just name it uh, or just put it in the name so it's blatantly obvious. All right, so now what we're gonna do is run another GP update. If I can spell it right, GP update forward slash force. Okay, so the policy 
has been successfully updated. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is type in GP result forward slash R. And this time, if we go under user settings, we can see that test GPO was the only group policy object applied because we disabled the inheritance. Now, I wanna show you something else. If I right click on this GPO and I choose enforced, and we go through the same process, that is a, I'm hit using the up arrows to go through these commands so I don't have to type it again. That is go through GP update forward slash force. Okay, so that GP update worked. I was getting an error earlier and it was because I was running the GP update too quickly after editing the GPO. So I just had to run it a couple times and then it successfully completed. So now I'm just gonna hit the up arrow and do GP result forward slash R. And we're going to see that the default domain policy is now applied even though this is a non-inheriting OU, and that's because this GPO is enforced. So the key lesson here is that even though you have a non-inheriting OU, some GPOs can still be applied if they're enforced. So now I'm gonna undo everything I just did. Uh, I'm gonna undo this enforced link here, and I'm going to delete this test GPO, all right? And I'm gonna go under these uh, default domain policy, and I'm gonna undo that setting that I set up, which I believe if we go over here under the group policy management window, we can see it was under administrative templates and desktop. So let's go to preferences, oops, policies, administrative templates, desktop, and desktop. Okay, so I'll make this screen large and we can see enabled de active desktop is enabled. So I'm just gonna say not configured. So it'll go back to default, hit okay, and close out of this window. Now, if I refresh this view, we can see that there's no user configurations, which is how it's supposed to be. Now that GPO has been restored to default, the last thing we need to do is in Active Directory users and computers, we need to move our administrator account back into the user's container. So I'm gonna do that by just dragging it here out of this non-inheriting OU. And I'm just gonna say yes. And there we go. So let's just double check. Administrator is now located under the user's container. Okay, so that is how you create non-inheriting OUs, and that is why they're useful. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello, this is Instructor Paul from InstructorPaul.com, and in this lecture, I'm gonna be showing you how you can create a GPO that will configure the desktop background for all of your domain users. Now, it's important for you to know that this is not a computer configuration, this is a user configuration. So, when we're creating this GPO and we want to link it to an OU, it's important to keep in mind that we'll need to link this to an OU that contains user accounts, or we can just link it to the root of the domain and it will affect all the users inside of the domain. So, there's three things that we're gonna do. We're gonna take three steps. First, we're gonna create a file share and we're gonna put the desktop background inside of that file share and make sure it's accessible by any authenticated user. Next, we're gonna create and configure the group policy object. Finally, we're gonna do some testing and make sure that the desktop background will apply to all of our workstations. All right, so let's get started. First, I have a desktop background, it's called Instructor Paul. And if I open Windows Explorer, I can see it here under recent files. I just downloaded it uh, onto my server. And I also have a data drive, which is the E drive. Now I'm gonna create my file share on the E drive. You can use the C drive, it'll work just the same, doesn't really matter, but I chose to use a data drive. So I'm gonna open this up. And we have instructorpaulcom.jpg. This is our desktop background. So if I right click on this and I say, uh, just edit, we can see what the image looks like. It's just a white flat image with instructorpaul.com in the middle. All right, also you can get this picture under the attached resources of this lecture. So if you wanna deploy this picture to your domain as well, you can do that by just downloading it from this lecture and putting it on your server. So what I wanna do now is I wanna create a share and I wanna make sure it's accessible to all our authenticated users in our domain. So under the data drive E, I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna choose new and I'm gonna select folder. And I'm gonna name this folder desktop backgrounds. Press enter. And now I'm gonna drag my desktop background into this folder. 
So now we need to share this folder. And the easiest way to do that is to right click on the folder, choose properties, go to sharing, and select advanced sharing. Now I'm going to choose the share this folder checkbox here at the top. And we're going to select permissions here. By default, everyone has read permissions. Now this is not necessarily a problem, but I like to be a little more secure and I don't like to use the everyone group. So I'm just going to hit remove and I'm going to click add and I'm going to add authenticated users. So if I just type in the word authenticated and then I click check names, we can see that it will auto populate the name here. I can just click OK. And I want to make sure authenticated users have read permissions. And I will click apply. OK. And hit apply again. Hit OK again. And now we can see here is the network path. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to test this network path. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to log out of this domain controller. I'm not necessarily going to log out of it. I'm just going to switch over to another computer that's on the network. So I have another member server called IPMS01, and I'm going to log into that workstation and attempt to access this file share. Okay, so I'm on my member server here, and I'm going to log into the workstation. I'm using my paul.hill account, not my domain administrator account. All right, so let's see. Server manager is opened. If I go to the local server, you can see this is IPMS01. This is not my domain controller. It's just a server that is on the network. It doesn't have any kind of special roles or anything like that. What I'm going to do is open File Explorer by clicking here at the bottom. And I'm going to type in the address bar backslash backslash IPDC01. I can see it auto populated for me because I've navigated to the server before. And we can see here that desktop backgrounds file share is accessible. So I'm going to double click on it. And I can see my desktop background is listed here. So I'll double click on that and make sure I can open it. And we can see here that the desktop background is readable. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is go back to my domain controller and configure the group policy object. Okay. So now I'm back on my domain controller. What I'm going to do is in server manager, launch group policy management. So I'll just select tools and about halfway down group policy management. So my forest domain and instructor Paul has already been expanded. Now we need to choose where we want to link the group policy object. Now I'm just going to choose instructorpaul.com and link it for every user account inside of my domain. But if I wanted to do it uh, for just domain users or even just to test OU, if I wanted to test some things, I could do that. Remember that this is going to be a user setting. So it's not something that you configure for computers. So linking it to the domain computers OU would not allow the settings to take effect. So I'm going to right click and create it under instructorpaul.com and choose create a GPO in this domain and link it here. And I'm going to call this GPO desktop background. And I'll select OK. Now, it's a good rule of thumb to create a GPO for every individual thing that you want to do. For example, if you're setting up a password policy, it makes sense to create a GPO and call it password policies and then configure all of your password related settings inside of that GPO. I could just edit the default domain policy and set up the desktop background. But imagine if you've made hundreds of changes and suddenly something is going wrong with your workstation and you know it's related to group policy, but you don't know what setting it is. If all your configurations are made within one GPO, it's going to be very hard to troubleshoot. So my recommendation is if you want to make a software deployment, create a GPO for it. If you want to do a desktop background, create a GPO for that. If you want to set up, you know, password policies, create a separate GPO for that. And that way, when you need to just turn one of them off, say I just want to disable the desktop background, I can just right click and disable the link on the GPO. And I don't have to have this huge headache of opening up the GPO and trying to find all the settings. All right. So that's just a little tip there for you. What I'm going to do now is right click on desktop background and I'm going to choose edit. We're going to go under user configuration. We'll select policies, administrative templates, and I'm going to maximize the screen here and expand this so we can see what we're doing here. We'll select desktop and desktop once more. Now there's a desktop wallpaper setting in here and that's what we're looking for. I'm going to either double click on this or right click and choose edit. 
All right, now we need to enable the setting and then we need to specify the wallpaper name, which is really the wallpaper path or the location of the wallpaper. And then we can specify the wallpaper style. Now I'm just gonna leave mine at uh, center. That's gonna be fine for me. And I'm going to type in the wallpaper name. Now you need to be very careful because if you get one letter wrong in this wallpaper name, you're gonna have issues. Also, you do not want to use the local path, which this is an example like the C drive or the E drive. You want to use the network UNC path. So the way we get the UNC path is open Windows Explorer, click in the address bar, and type in backslash backslash and then the name of your server. In my case, it's IPDC01. Press enter. Now we can see all the file shares. Select desktop backgrounds, the file share we just created. And again, click in the address bar and there is your network path to the image. Now you need to right click and choose copy. I don't like to type things in as it just leaves room for error. So I'm gonna copy it. I'm gonna come down to the wallpaper name and I'm going to paste this path. Now this is only the path to the folder. This doesn't actually specify the JPG file. So you can see here in their example, they're actually specifying corp.jpg or home.jpg. So we need to specify the actual file. So I'm gonna hit backslash to continue the path. And on instructorpaw.com, you'll notice I can see the file extension, which is JPG. You're gonna need that. So if you don't see the extension, what you do is hit view and then select file name extensions. So if it's turned off, it'll look like this. Uh, you can't work with this. You have to be able to see the extension. So I'm gonna select view, file name extensions, and I'm gonna do the same process. Right click, rename, and I'm going to copy this text and now we'll paste it in our group policy object. So right click and paste. Okay, so now this should be a valid path, but we're not entirely sure yet. We're still kind of guessing because we don't know if we did a typo or anything silly like that. So the way that you can test that is to select all of this text, right click, choose copy, open Internet Explorer, and paste in that path and see if it opens the JPEG image. So I'll just click up here, right click and choose paste and I'm gonna press enter. Now if the desktop path loads, we know that we've entered a valid UNC. Okay, and there we go, instructorpaul.com. So we know that this GPO is now configured correctly. So what I'm gonna do is hit apply, hit okay. Now I'm gonna minimize group policy, minimize this folder. I just wanna to get to the desktop so I'm just minimizing everything I can. Okay, so now we're gonna do the number one thing that we do every time we're testing group policy. When we make a change, we need to run GP update. So I'm gonna hit start, type in CMD, and we'll type in GP update forward slash force and press enter. It's going to update the policy. Just taking a second here, computer policy has updated, now it's updating the user policy. Okay, so now let's run GP result forward slash R, and let's see if this group policy object is being applied to our user account. So if I scroll up, here are the user settings for administrator, and we can see the desktop background GPO is an applied group policy object, so that's great. Now all we need to do is log out and log back in. So I'm gonna hit the start button in the bottom left corner, I'm gonna select administrator, the profile picture here, and I'm gonna click sign out. Now for desktop backgrounds, a sign out is required. So now I'm just gonna sign back in. All right, enter. Okay, so now we can already see the desktop is different. So if I minimize this here, we can see now that instructorpaul.com is my desktop background. So that is how you deploy a desktop background with group policy. Now we've learned a couple things here. One, we've learned about accessing files over the network with group policy. For one, you have to make sure that it's in a file share that will be accessible to your target computer or user. And in this case, we just entered authenticated users. So that's pretty much any valid object in Active Directory. Once we created the file share, we created the group policy object and configured it. Then we ran a GP update. Now the GP update was just to make the settings take effect. There is a default refresh time, and I believe it is 90 minutes, but I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head. So this would have updated over time, but since we're testing it, we wanna make sure it's working, we just ran a GP update. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I sure did enjoy making it for you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Hello there, this is Instructor Paul from instructorpaul.com, and in this lecture, I'm gonna be showing you how to set up an interactive logon. 
Now, this is something that you're going to have to set up for companies when they want to display a work policy or any kind of you know warning policy before a user logs into the computer. An interactive logon is when you you know access your computer, you hit Control Delete to log in, and a message is displayed. A lot of times, in the government, it's saying you're accessing a government information system, or you know, in a private company, it might say that uh, you are not unauthorized access to this computer, will be prosecuted things like that. So we're going to set up one of those warnings with group policy. Now, what I'm going to do here is just open server manager. We're going to go to group policy by selecting tools and group policy management. Okay. Now this particular setting is a computer configuration setting. So that's important to keep in mind. If we want to set it up for only certain computers, or if we want to have different messages for different computers, we can do that by just linking the GPO to the targeted or the desired organizational units. Now I don't have a preference here, so I'm just going to create one under instructorpaul.com. So I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna make a new GPO and we'll call this interactive logon because that's what the setting is actually called. All right, so we'll click okay. And now I'm gonna right click on this GPO and hit edit. Okay, so I'm gonna maximize this screen here and what we're gonna do is go under policies Windows settings, we're gonna go under security settings. I need to expand this a little bit here, run out of room. Local policies, and we'll select security options. Okay, so we're looking for anything called interactive logon. So I'm gonna scroll down and here we can see all the interactive logon settings. All right, so what we need to find is the message title. So here's message text and here's message title. So I'm gonna open message title first and I'm gonna say define this policy setting. All right, now you can make this anything you want. You'll understand exactly what it is after uh, we configure the settings, but basically this is the line of text that's going to appear at the top, and then the interactive message text is going to appear below that. So generally this is only a couple words, and then the message text is a longer sentence. I'm just gonna say warning, you know, because I'm just making this up on the fly. It doesn't have to make sense. It's in my lab, so I'll just click OK. And now we want to configure the message text for users attempting to log on. Now I'll click define this policy setting in this template. Okay, so here's where we can type in multi paragraphs, multiple sentences, whatever we would like. So I'm just going to make something up like instructor. Paul is the best Udemy instructor. I'm going to say thank you for taking my course. Unauthorized access will result in dot 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 nothing okay so there's my my warning message i'm sure it's it would be very scary to potential hackers so i'm going to click apply and now i'm going to click okay and we're going to do what we always do which is run a gp update log out and log back in and see what happens so i'm going to close out of these settings here and i'm going to click start we'll open command prompt and I'm going to type in GP update forward slash force. Okay, so the GP update has completed. So a quick little tip here, we can type in log off and it will just log us off automatically. So you don't have to click through the button. All right, so now we need to press control alt delete to unlock. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And here is our interactive logon. It says warning, instructor Paul is the best Udemy instructor. I don't know why that's a warning. It says thank you for taking my course. Unauthorized access will result in nothing. So then you just click OK. Now I'm telling you, I haven't worked at one company where they didn't display one of these interactive logons. So it's really important that you know how to do this. Uh, generally, they will provide you a set of uh, what they want it to say. But if you have to make it up, you can just hop on Google and find some kind of standardized message. You know, depending on the country you're in, that just tells you what the laws are for you know getting unauthorized access to a computer. So I'm just gonna click OK. And that is how you set up a interactive logon with group policy. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello there, this is Instructor Paul from instructorpaul.com. And in this lecture, I'm gonna be showing you how to deploy MSIs to your network with group policy. Now, in this lecture, we're gonna deploy 7-Zip. And I have downloaded it and attached it under the resources of this lecture. So you can find it there. You could Google 7-Zip MSI download. Now I've had cases in the past where I created lectures like this and then the MSIs were taken off the internet. 
or they were taken offline to where you students couldn't access them. So I don't want to have that happen again. So I've attached it to this lecture under the resources. So once we've downloaded the file and it's accessed on a server, I have it here 7z1701. What we need to do is put it in a file share where our computers will have access, just like we've done before. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to choose cut and I'm going to go to my data drive and I could put it under the desktop backgrounds folder, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I'm just going to create a new folder and I'm going to do that by right clicking, choosing new and I'm going to call this software. Okay. So inside of this software folder, I'm going to paste that seven zip file. Now I'm going to go back one folder and I'm going to edit the permissions of the software folder by right clicking and choosing properties. And we're going to go to sharing and we're going to select advanced sharing, share this folder here at the top. We need to create some additional permission settings. Now I'm going to remove everyone and I'm going to add authenticated users. So I'm going to type in authenticated and then I'm going to click check names. That's going to auto populate the authenticated users group. So I'll select okay. And they only need read permission. So I'm going to select apply, hit okay once more, and I will hit apply again. And here we can see the network path to the share folder. Now this is important. So I'm just going to select it, right click, and I'm going to choose copy. All right. So now what we're going to do is open group policy by selecting under server manager tools, group policy management, which is about halfway down. Okay. So I have instructorpaul.com, my domain here. I'm going to expand this and I'm going to expand the organizational unit instructor Paul. Now there's a couple ways we could do this. We could install this on a per user basis or a computer basis. We also need to decide where we want to link the GPO. Now I want to install 7-Zip for every computer in my domain. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on instructorpaul.com and I'm going to create a GPO and link it under the root domain. That way my group policy object will apply to everything in my domain. If you're deploying software that you only want on a certain computer or only for certain users, make sure that you link the GPO to those desired OUs. Okay, so I'm going to right click on instructorpaul.com and I'm going to say create a GPO in this domain and link it here. And I'm going to call this software underscore deployment underscore and then I'm going to call it the name of the package. So 7-zip and it's version 1701. Now I'll double check that version number real quick. Uh, 1701. Okay, so I'm using a naming convention that will allow me to easily recognize what I'm doing in this group policy object. You could just make one software deployment GPO if you would like, but I like to be more modular. So if I decide that I later set up a group of computers and I have, you know, say Windows 7 computers, the workstations, all of those need 7-zip, I want to be able to easily add or remove certain products to the computers. And the easiest way that I can do that is to create a GPO for each application I want to deploy. Okay, and also if I want to do upgrades or things like that, I can just keep in mind what version I'm deploying here. So I'm going to select OK. And here is my group policy object. Again, we can see under the group policy objects is listed here and this is the link. So I'm going to minimize this group policy objects folder and I'm going to right click on software deployments and I'm going to choose edit. Okay, so now at this point, we need to either choose a computer configuration or a user configuration. Now we could do either because we're linking this GPO in my case to the root of the domain and below this domain are both user accounts and computer accounts. In fact, everything inside of my domain will receive this group policy object. So there's some pros and cons of using both and I'll just discuss them for a second. First, if I deploy it under the computer configuration, this group policy will require a reboot in order for the policy to take effect and the software to install. On the other hand, if we deploy it under the user configuration, every time that user logs into a different computer, it will install the software. Okay. So a little bit of a difference there. I prefer to use the computer configuration and just have it installed on all of my computers, regardless of the user accounts. So what I'm going to do is expand policies and I'm going to expand software settings and we're going to select software installation. Now we will right click and we will choose new and a new package. Okay, so what we're going to do now, instead of going to the data drive, 
We're going to do backslash backslash IPDC01. And we're going to hit another backslash. Now I'm just going to press enter. And there's a reason why we need to do this. And I'll get more into that in just a second. Let's just go to software and let's open 7zip.msi and we will click open. Okay, so right away we have the deployment method. First we have assigned and then we have advanced and we have published, which is grayed out. Now published is grayed out because we're under the computer configuration. If we were under the user configuration, we'd be able to choose this. What this means is that the user would have the option of installing the software. Since we're deploying this to the computer itself, it's not gonna be able to choose whether it does or does not want the software. So we have to choose either assigned or advanced. If we choose assigned, it's just going to sign the application without modifications. And if we choose advanced, this will allow us to configure the published or assigned options and apply modifications to the package. We're just going to do assigned and we'll hit OK. OK, so I'm going to expand this group policy window here. And here we can see that we are deploying our 7-zip package. And the source is the IPDC01 forward slash software and then the 7-zip 1701 MSI. Okay, so let me show you something really quick. You don't have to follow along. I'm just gonna demonstrate this. If I chose the data drive and went to software and hit, a, hit okay, we're gonna get this message that says, cannot verify the path is a network location. And it's gonna say, if the package is not available from a network share, clients will not be able to install it. Are you sure you want to deploy this package using this path? And if I say yes, and just choose assigned, we can see here that the source is now the E drive software and then the file name. Now, what this means is that every single computer will be looking for a local E drive. And this E drive is located locally on our domain controller. And since your clients won't have the same E drive as our domain controller has, because they're, they're physically different computers, it's not gonna be able to access the file. So on the other computer, the E drive could be the CD drive, it could be a thumb drive, or it might not even exist. So that is why we use a UNC or a network path instead of a local path like that. So I'm gonna do right click, all tasks and remove. And I'm gonna say allow users to continue to use the software. Um, it wasn't deployed anywhere anyways, but you don't wanna forcibly remove it because you might end up uninstalling this package up here. Okay, so now that I've removed that, um, we are ready to test this group policy object. So what I'm gonna do now is just close out of this and we can just check out the settings for this GPO. We can see the assigned applications and we can see uh, the options here. And what we're gonna do now is run a GP update on our domain controller. So I'm gonna minimize group policy, minimize server manager, and I'm going to hit the start button. I'm gonna type in command prompt, and we're gonna run a GP update forward slash force. Now, if you couldn't find command prompt, remember you can hit the start button and search for CMD, and that is how you find command prompt, okay? Okay, so it says the following warnings were encountered during computer policy processing. The group policy client side extension software installation was unable to apply one of the more settings because the changes must be processed before system startup or user logon. So what we have to do, like I said before, is reboot the server. And it says this may result in a slow startup and boot performance. Basically, when we reboot the computer, it's going to go through the client installation. All right, so we're just gonna wait for this group policy update to finish, and then we are going to reboot the server. Okay, so now I have this message saying, is it okay to restart? I'm gonna type in Y and press enter. And now it is rebooting. It says it'll shut down in less than a minute. Now I don't wanna wait a full minute, so I'm gonna type in the command shutdown dash R for restart, and then I'm gonna do dash T for time and I'm gonna enter the number zero. So I'm essentially saying shut down and restart, time is zero seconds. So I'm gonna press enter and now it is restarting my computer. So we're just gonna wait for this reboot to finish and then we will see if it deployed 7-zip like it's supposed to. Okay, now it's applying the computer settings which is the computer portion of our group policy objects. So right now it's installing the software that we just deployed. Okay, so now I'm gonna hit I'm gonna log in to the computer just like normal. So I'm logging in as administrator. I'm gonna press okay. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is hit the start button in the bottom left corner of the screen. And I'm going to scroll down and I'm gonna look for 7-zip. And we can see it right here at the top of the search results. 7-zip has been deployed to my computer. 
So now any computer that I log into within my domain that has refreshed its group policy will have the 7-Zip application installed. So that is how you install and deploy an application with group policy. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I am looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello, it's Instructor Paul from InstructorPaul.com. And in this lecture, we're going to be setting up the shared folder for our roaming profiles setup that we're going to have going on in Active Directory. Now, I've already showed you how to create a shared folder with File Explorer. So this time, let's do it within Server Manager. So the way we do this is by clicking File and Storage Services. And then we're going to select Shares. Now we just need to right click in the middle here and select new share. Okay, so we're gonna choose an SMB share dash quick because this is a basic profile represents the fastest way to create an SMB file share. All right, so we're gonna click next and we're gonna choose the IPDC01 server, which is our domain controller. I'm gonna put mine on my E drive or my data volume uh, generally, if you're doing rowing profiles, you're going to want more than 39 gigabytes of data as we're going to be storing all of their pictures, uh, documents, and desktop settings on this roaming profile setup. All right. But in my little lab with just one user account, it's going to be just fine. So I'm going to click next. Now we need to specify the share name. I'm just going to call this profiles and I'm going to add the dollar sign by hitting shift and the number four. Now what this does is it makes the folder hidden so that it's not easily viewable by people who are just browsing this share path right here, okay? All right, so on the other settings, we need to enable access-based enumeration. And what this will do is only set it up so users can only see folders or files that they have access to. Now we're gonna go down to encrypt data access. We'll click this checkbox here. And this is going to allow us to have a little bit more security by encrypting the remote file access. All right, you can read more information about each of these settings below the setting itself. So I'm gonna click next. Okay, now we need to specify who is actually gonna be able to access the file share. Now, by default, if we click on this customize permissions here, Microsoft recommends that we remove the user groups that are by default added to the permissions. And we can't do this until we disable inheritance. So if we click remove, we're gonna get an error saying you can't remove this. The only reason for that is because profiles is inheriting permissions from shares and from ease. So we need to disable the inheritance and we can do that by clicking this disable inheritance button at the bottom here. Now we need to choose convert inherited permissions into explicit permissions on this object. And all that does is takes the inherited permissions and it sets up a new set of permissions just for this profiles share. Okay. So that allows us to make changes to this permission settings. So we're going to remove users and the second set of users, and we're gonna hit apply. Okay, so now we need to hop into Active Directory and we need to create a user group. And this user group is gonna be called Roaming Profiles, and we're gonna give this group permissions to this Profiles folder. So to do this, let's open Active Directory by clicking Server Manager, Tools, Active Directory, Users, and Computers. Okay, I'm gonna expand instructorpaul.com and I'm gonna expand the OU instructor Paul. And I'm gonna right click here and create a new organizational unit by choosing new organizational unit. And I'm gonna call this domain groups. I'll click okay. And now within this organizational unit, I'm going to create a new group by right clicking and choosing new and group. We're going to call this group roaming profile users. Okay. And this is going to be a global group and it's going to be a security group. We want it to be global so that it's accessible to our domain and all trusted domains. And it needs to be a security group because we're going to be dealing with permissions. There's nothing. Distribution would be just for email. Security is anything security or permissions related with an active directory. So I'm going to click okay. And now I need to add a user account to this roaming profile security group. I'm just going to add my Paul.Hill group by double clicking on the group. I'm going to select members and I'm going to choose the add button down here at the bottom. And I'm going to search for all of the user accounts that I want to add. In this case, I'm just going to add Paul.Hill. So I'll type that in there and I'll click check names. And we can see that it found Paul.Hill at instructorpaul.com. You'll need to add in any users or groups that you want to be able to use roaming profiles within your Active Directory domain. So I'm gonna click okay. 
and I'll click OK once again. And now I can minimize Active Directory Uses and Computers, and I can click down at the bottom here and open our new share wizard. So now we need to add that security group to these permission entries. So I'm going to do that by clicking the Add button down here at the bottom. And under Principle, we need to select a principle. And now we're going to search for Roaming. And then I'm going to hit Check Names, and it should find the Roaming Profiles user group, which it did right there. So I'll select OK. And we're going to uncheck all these permissions. And we're going to select Show Advanced Permissions. And what we need to do is add list folder slash read data, create folders slash append data. So list folders, read data, create folders, append data. Make sure you don't choose create file slash write data. It needs to be create folders slash append data. Okay, so those two settings there are different. Okay, so now under applies to, this drop down needs to say this folder only. All right, so now we'll click OK. And we're going to hit apply. Now let's open up administrators and click edit. And we're going to change this applies to to this folder only. And we'll click OK. So system should have this folder, subfolders, and files. Administrators should have this folder only, like we just set. And the creator owner should have full control of subfolders and files only. So this has its special set of permissions that we configured. Now we're just going to click apply and click OK. And now that we have our permissions set up, we can click next and we can click create. And here we can see that the create SMB share completed and the set SMB permissions completed. So we're going to click close. And now we can see the profiles folder located under our E drive. So that is how we're going to create the file share in server manager. Okay. So now what we're going to do is go back to active directory. And we're going to open this roaming profiles user group. We're going to go to members and we're going to double click on each of the members in this list. Now I only have one, but what we need to do is open up the user properties. So Paul Hill, I'm going to go to the profile path and this path needs to match the UNC of our share. So if we go back to our share, we can see here that it's E shares and profile then the dollar sign. Okay, so the profile path is going to be backslash backslash IPDC01 backslash profiles backslash percent username percent. And this little last bit here is a wild card for the username of the current user. So if I click apply, we can see that it changed it to paul.hill. So now we have the profile path, we're specifying it on the domain controller. And now what we need to do is test that. So it's going to click OK. All right, so what I'm going to do now is switch over to one of my member servers and attempt to log into my paul.hill user account and test the roaming profiles. OK, so here I am at my member server. I'm going to log in to my paul.hill user account, press Enter. And I'm brought to the local server dashboard. Now, like I said before, this is a member server. It doesn't have any kind of roles installed. OK, I'm going to hit Start. We're going to search for a control panel. And here it is, the best match, the number one result. I'm going to click on control, control panel. We'll select System and Security. Again, we're looking for a system. And on the left hand side, we have advanced system settings. We're going to select on this. And here under advanced, we can see user profiles. We need to click settings here. And now, if we go under instructor Paul backslash Paul.hill, we can see the type is a roaming profile. So this account is now using a roaming profile. So if I click OK, and if I, for example, create a new folder on the desktop, call it test or just make up some kind of name, press enter and say, I'll just open up this folder and create a new text document inside of it and press enter. Now, if I sign out of this user account, clicking the profile here and sign out. Now I am at my windows 10 workstation. What I'm going to do is log in with paul.hill. And since we're using a roaming profile, I should be able to view the new folders and files that I created. So we're going to test that now. Okay, so here I am. Here's my instructor Paul background. And here is the folder that I made on my member server. And if I open up this folder, 
we can see here's the text document that I made. So the roaming profiles has been deployed and is working as expected. So one thing to keep in mind that I experienced when I was testing his roaming profiles was that I was logged into the paul.hill user account on my member server and the account was simply locked. So when I logged back in, the account type was local and it wasn't roaming. So you need to sign out of your user account and then sign back in. So if you're ever wondering about changes, the same thing goes for when you create the folder. Once you create the folders on one computer, sign out and then sign into another computer to test it. All right, so that is how you set up roaming profiles. Great job getting through this lecture and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hey, it's Instructor Paul from InstructorPaul.com and in this lecture, I'm gonna be showing you how you can create a network share or a project drive for different user groups and how you can map them for those user groups automatically. We're also gonna be restricting access between the different user groups so that group A cannot access the share drive for group B and vice versa. Okay, so we're gonna start this lecture by creating the user groups and then we're gonna add users to the group. So I'm gonna open server manager and I'm logged into my IPDC01 server. So we're gonna open Active Directory by selecting Tools, Active Directory, Users, and Computers. Okay, so I already have my domain expanded here. What I'm going to do is select my domain groups organizational unit, and I'm gonna right click and choose New Group. And I'm gonna call this just Group A. Now this is just for demonstration purposes. Your group might be called Sales, it might be called uh, IT, it might be called Security, whatever the case may be. Uh, I'm just gonna call it Group A to keep things really clear. So it's gonna be a global scope and a security group. So I'm gonna click OK. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing, create another group, except this group is going to be called Group B. So I'm right clicking, choosing New, Group, and I'm gonna call this group B, and we'll click OK. All right, so now I need to add users to each of these groups. I'm gonna add paul.hill to group A, so I'm gonna go under members, click add, and we'll type in paul.hill. I'll click check names, and I'll hit OK. I'm gonna select apply, and now I need a user for group B. Now I only have one user account in my domain, so under domain users, I'm going to right click and create a new user account. And I'm gonna call this Robert Hill. There we go. So the username will be robert.hill at instructorpaul.com. I'm gonna click next. Uncheck that password box there. I'll type in a password for this user. Okay, so now I have Robert Hill. So back under domain groups, I'm gonna open up group B and I'm gonna add Robert Hill as a member. So robert.hill, I will click check names. And here we can see robert.hill at instructorpaul.com. I will click OK. And now I have my two user groups created. OK, so that's the first bit of this step. The next thing we need to do is to create a shared folder for each of these user groups. So under Server Manager, we're going to go to File and Storage Services. We're going to go to Shares. And just like we have done before, we're going to right click and we're going to select New Share. All right, so I'm going to do SMB share dash quick and I'll click next. And I'm going to do it for IPDC01 and I'm going to choose the E drive. I'm going to call it group A just like that and I will click next. And we can leave all these things default. Uh, you can change this if you would like and I will click next. And we're going to select customize permissions. First, we need to disable inheritance by clicking this disable inheritance down here at the bottom. We're gonna to choose to convert the inherited permissions into explicit permissions on this object. Basically means it's creating its own set of permissions and we can modify them. Now I'm gonna remove all these user accounts and we should be left with creator owner, system and administrators. Now we need to add group A. So I click the add button there and under principle, I'm gonna choose select a principle and I'm going to type in group A. Now I'll click check names, and we can see that it resolved group A, so I'll select OK. And we're gonna leave the options at read and execute, list folder contents, and read, and we're gonna check right. So now we're just gonna click OK, and we'll click apply, hit OK, 
And now I'll click next and create. And we'll click close. Okay, so now we need to repeat those steps for group B. So again, we're gonna right click and choose new share. And we're gonna do an SMB share quick. So I'll click next. I'm gonna choose the E drive, click next. Share name is going to be called group B. I will click next, click next. We're gonna customize the permissions, disable the inheritance. And we're gonna remove these user accounts. And we're gonna add group B. So under principle, I'm gonna select group B and I'll hit check names, hit okay. We're gonna add the right permissions and I'm going to click okay. And we're gonna click apply. And again, we will hit okay. So now we're just gonna click next and the create. Hit close. Okay, so now we have these two file shares. So now we need to test that the file shares are working. So the way I'm gonna do that is I'm going to log into a domain joined workstation or in server in this case, I'm gonna log into my IPMS server. And once I log in with that Paul.Hill user account, which is a member of group A, I'm gonna make sure I can access the group A folder and I can create files within that directory. So I'm gonna log into that other server right now. Okay, so I'm on my member server here and now I'm going to log into my paul.hill user account. Okay, so now once this desktop fully loads, I'm going to hit the file explorer button and I'm going to go to IPDC01. Let's see if I can type that in. So backslash backslash IPDC01 backslash. We'll press enter. And here we can see that we cannot access group B, okay? So if I click close, I can now try to access group A. Okay, so I'm now able to open group A. Okay, so th these permissions are working as expected. So now I'm gonna log out and sign back in with robert.hill, the other account I created, and I'm going to see if I can access this group B share. So I'm gonna choose other user, robert.hill, and I'll type in the password for that user account. Okay, it's loading the profile service. Bring me to the desktop. Okay, so now I can open File Explorer and I'm going to go to backslash backslash IPDC01 and now we have Group B. So if I double click on Group B, I'm able to access it, but I'm not able to access Group A. And I can do things like creating you know, a new text document or something like that, I can delete a file if I would like. Uh, so we know that the permissions are working as expected. So now what we need to do is automatically map these as a network drive. Now I could go under this PC and I could hit computer and I could say map network drive and I could specify the path to that folder if I would like. But ideally when you're working with thousands of users, you don't want to have to walk them through how to set up or how to map a network drive. You want to do it automatically, especially since you have the ability to do that with an Active Directory. So we're gonna do that by popping back over to our domain controller. All right, so I'm back on my domain controller and what I'm going to do now is under Instructor Paul in Active Directory Users and Computers, I am going to create the file shares or an object that represents the file shares. Now the way we do that is right click on the desired OU or you could do it under the domain if you would like. Uh, I'm just gonna create it under Instructor Paul. You could create a new organizational unit if you would like, I'm not gonna do that. So, so I'm going to right click and I'm gonna choose new and we're going to select a shared folder about all the way down at the bottom. All right, now the name of this shared folder is going to be called group A. Now we need the UNC of the group A folder path and we can find that by just opening file explorer, navigating to our domain controller and opening the desired folder. If I just copy this path here at the top I can go under the network path and I can paste it in right there. Now I can click OK. And just like that, the shared folder has been created. So I'm gonna repeat this step for group B. So right click on instructorpaul.com, select new, and we're going to choose group. And we're gonna choose shared folder. Again, I'm gonna use this file explorer to help me make sure I don't have any typos. I'm gonna right click and choose copy. And I'm gonna paste it under the network path. And then we're just gonna type group B here at the top. 
Okay, so now we have these mapped with Active Directory. Now that's gonna come in handy when we're trying to set this up through group policy, which we're going to do right now. So we're gonna minimize Active Directory, and I'm gonna close out of this file explorer, and under Server Manager, we're gonna open group policy by selecting Tools, Group Policy Management, which is about halfway down. Okay, so in this scenario, we have Instructor Paul, and we have our domain users group, which contains users from two different user groups, and we want to map a network drive to each of these user groups. So you might be wondering how we're going to do this since both user accounts are sitting in the same organizational unit. We don't wanna map group A to users of group B and vice versa. So the way that we're gonna do this is by creating a GPO. We're gonna link it either to this domain users OU or the instructor Paul OU, or we could even link it to the instructorpaul.com domain and we're gonna use security filtering to only apply the GPOs to members of the respective domains. So we're gonna create two GPOs, and one GPO is gonna to apply to group A, and one GPO is gonna to apply to group B. Okay, so I'm gonna right click on Instructor Paul, and I'm going to choose create a GPO in this domain and link it here. We could just as easily do this anywhere else, it just needs to be somewhere that's above the user accounts that we're trying to affect. And by above, I mean Instructor Paul is above domain users, just like instructorpaul.com is above Instructor Paul, the organizational unit. So I'm gonna right click and choose create a GPO and link it here. And I'm going to call this group A mapped drive. You can call it whatever you want. I just want it to be pretty clear that we're mapping the group A drive with this group policy object. So now I'm gonna click okay. So now I'm gonna right click on this GPO and I'm going to choose edit. All right, so under user configuration, we're gonna select preferences, Windows settings, and we're gonna select drive maps. All right, so we're gonna right click on drive maps and we're gonna say new mapped drive. And the location of the drive, we can just select browse. And right away, it has found our two shared folders that we created in Active Directory. So this is for group A, so we're gonna select group A and then click okay. All right, so we need to check this reconnect checkbox as we want it to be available every time the user logs in. We're gonna use the first available starting at A. Okay, so now we need to go under the GPO security filtering. So I'm gonna select group A mapped drive and I'm gonna remove authenticated users and we'll click okay. We're gonna add group A. So this will only apply to members of the group A group. That is how we prevent mapping group A to group B and vice versa. It's all done with the security filtering. So now we're gonna repeat this step for group B. So we're gonna create a new GPO in the same location. We're gonna call it group B mapped drive. We'll click okay. And I'm gonna edit this GPO. We'll go under policies. We'll go under preferences, Windows settings, drive maps, right click and choose new mapped drive. We'll select the browse button here and we're going to choose group B. We'll select okay. We're gonna say reconnect and we're going to use the B drive. And now I'm going to click apply and okay. We'll close out of this group policy management editor. And again, we're going to remove authenticated users from the security filtering of group B. And we're going to add group B. We'll click check names. We'll hit OK. Okay, one last thing we need to do for both of these group policy objects is that we need to add read-only permissions for authenticated users. So the way that we do that is we're gonna select group policy, we're gonna select group A, choose delegation, and we're gonna hit add, and we're gonna type in authenticated users. We'll click check names, we'll click OK, and we're going to go under read permissions. Now this is different from security filtering. We're allowing authenticated users to be able to read the GPO. Okay, so nothing's changing on the security filtering. It's still only going to apply to group A, but we're allowing any authenticated user, including the computer account and the user account to read the GPO, okay? So we're gonna do the same thing for group B. So we'll go under delegation, we'll click add, and we'll add authenticated users. So I'm just gonna say, okay, 
and that is the last thing that we need to do. Now we just need to go to our test workstations, update our group policy, and see if the drives were mapped. Okay, so I'm logged into my instructor Paul account, so I'm going to open command prompt, and I'm going to run a GP update. And I'm logged into robert.hill, so this account should have access to the group B file share. All right, so the policy has applied, so now we need to open File Explorer, go to this PC, and here we can see that the group B drive has been added under B. So if we open the file, we can now access it. All right, so that drive is now automatically mapped. Let's make sure that we can access the group A file share from our paul.hill user account. Paul.hill, type in the password. We're gonna hit File Explorer, we'll go to this PC, and the Group A drive has been mounted, and it is mounted to the B drive. So Group A is called B, which is a little bit confusing, so I'd probably choose something different there. But if we open it up, we can access it, we can drag files into it if we like, etc. So that is how you map share drives over the network using group policy. Great job getting through this lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello there, this is Instructor Paul from InstructorPaul.com and in this lecture, we're gonna be setting up our domain password policies. Now this is something you're gonna to have to do if you're working for a company that is security conscious. It will prevent your users from using simple or unsecure passwords within your domain. Some people are just not security conscious at all and they'll use you know, simple passwords over and over and over again. They won't reset their passwords, they won't change them from time to time because as we all know, it's just a pain to do that. So we're gonna set this so that it's not an option for users. They're gonna have to reset their passwords. We're gonna set up things like account lockouts, et cetera, okay? So under Server Manager, we're going to go to Tools and we're gonna choose Group Policy Management. So group policy management has loaded and I have my domain instructorpaul.com open here. And one thing I want you guys to keep in mind that is that in the default domain policy, if we go under settings, password settings are already configured. So we can see account password policies and the lockout policy. All of these are already set inside of this default domain policy. So if you create a new GPO, it's important for you to know that there is the default domain policy which is also configuring these settings. All right, so I'm gonna make my changes inside of the default domain policy. So I'm gonna right click on the default domain policy and we're gonna choose edit. And I'm gonna make this full screen and we're gonna go under, expand this here a little bit. We're gonna go under policies, window settings. We're gonna go to security settings account policies, and the password policy. Now, here we can enforce the password history. We'll open the double click on this option. And I'll explain what it means. This setting will remember a user's 24 previous passwords, and it won't allow them to reuse those passwords if they're creating a new password for the user account. If they use password one, then they use password two, and they reset it 24 times, they eventually end up at password 24. If they try to use password one, or password five, or password seven, it's going to have remembered that password and it'll say, sorry, you can't use this password. All right, so we're gonna leave that at 24. That's a pretty good number right there. We're gonna to go to maximum password age. And this is gonna depend on your company. I see a lot of people require 30 days, some require 60 days. I'm gonna set mine to 60 days. And we will hit okay. Now, minimum password age. I'm gonna set this to zero because I like my users to be able to reset their password immediately if they want to. Say for example, they created a password and they typed in a word wrong and they're thinking, oh, I'll never be able to remember that, let me create a new one. You don't want them to not be able to create a new one. In my opinion, that's just not functional, it's not easy and not reasonable. So now we're gonna open minimum password length and I'm going to make this 14 characters. Some people may complain about this, but it is a lot more secure than just using seven. So I'm gonna set mine to 14 and click okay. Now, password must meet complexity requirements. This has to be set to enabled. We'll click OK. And storing passwords using reversible encryption. 
this should always be disabled. It's almost the same as storing your passwords in clear text. It's just not a good idea. That's a huge vulnerability. So make sure you set this setting to disabled. Now let's go under account lockout policy in the bottom left. So if a user comes to their domain computer and they type in a bad password three times, it could be someone trying to guess the user's password. It might not be the actual authorized user. So what we wanna do is lock the user account after a certain number of invalid login attempts. So account lockout duration is how long the user will be locked out. And I'm gonna set mine to 15 minutes. You can do 30 if you would like, whatever you want. When I click apply here, it says that we have to specify account lockout threshold and reset lockout counter after you know a certain amount of time. So these are just the other two settings inside of this folder. I'm just gonna click okay and we'll click okay. Basically that message was saying you can't configure this setting without configuring these two. So account lockout threshold, I'm gonna drop this down to three failed attempts. So if a user types in a password wrong three times, the account will then be locked out. Now we're gonna to go to reset lockout counter. I'm gonna leave that as 15 minutes. Again, we can open this explain tab if we're not sure what these are doing, uh, but I'm just gonna go ahead and click okay. And now what we wanna do is test the lockout policy. Now one thing for you guys to keep in mind is that we're making changes under the computer configuration. Group policy object password settings are a computer configuration. They're not a user configuration, which is confusing to some, but it's it makes perfect sense. Basically, let me minimize out of this group policy object. When we set up this password policy, it applies to computer objects and the user accounts that reside on the computer objects, okay? So you can set up different password policies for different types of computers, but with a GPO, you cannot set certain types of password policies for user accounts, all right? Now, that may be confusing because I've come into scenarios where we needed to use service accounts, and those service accounts needed to have a different password policy than the regular user accounts, and same for domain administrators and so forth, and we'll get more into that later, but for this lecture, we're just gonna use the group policy object here, and we're gonna close out of this GPO, and I'm gonna minimize group policy management, minimize server manager, and what I'm gonna do now is run a GP update. So I'm gonna click Start, We'll open command prompt by typing in CMD and we'll, cl we'll click command prompt and we're gonna run GP update forward slash force. So we're gonna update the policy on this local computer. And so I'm gonna attempt to log in with my paul.hill user account. So I'm gonna hit the start button here. I'm going to hit my profile and I'm going to say lock. Okay, now I'm gonna hit control delete and I'm gonna say switch user. And again, I will hit control delete and I'm going to select other user and I'm going to type in my name, paul.hill. And I'm just going to type in a random password here. And it says the username or password is incorrect. So I need to do this two more times. So I'm just typing in some gibberish here. Okay, one more time. And once more. Okay, so now we have the message. The referenced account is currently locked out and may not be logged onto. All right, so now I'm gonna switch back over to my administrator account and I will just log in here. Okay, so now I'm back on my administrator account. If we open Active Directory, Users and Computers, just taking a second to launch here, here we go. If I go to Domain Users, I can right click on Paul Hill and choose Properties. And under the Account tab, we can say that this account is currently locked out on this Active Directory domain controller. So I can either wait the 15 minutes or I can unlock it inside of Active Directory, which I will do now. Okay, so that is how you configure your password policies for your domain computers within group policy. Now, this is a pain to your users, but it really is for the best of everyone on the network because if a hacker compromises your network, it's gonna negatively affect you, it's gonna negatively affect your users and your company. So it's just for the best of everyone's interest if you set up a secure password policy. All right, so this has been Instructor Paul. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello, it's Instructor Paul from InstructorPaul.com and in this lecture, I'm gonna be showing you how to create a PSO or password settings object. Now the purpose of a PSO is to allow you to set a password policy on a per user or per security user group basis. So I've already showed you how to set up password policies 
on a per computer basis with a GPO. In this lecture, I'm gonna be showing you how to do it for individual user accounts or individual security groups. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna go into Active Directory and create a security group. So under Server Manager, I'm gonna to select Tools and we're gonna select Active Directory Users and Computers. Okay, so my domain has already been expanded. I'm under instructorpaul.com, I'm under Instructor Paul, and we're gonna select Domain Groups. I'm gonna right click on this group and I'm gonna say New Group. And now I'm gonna name this group something that will give me an indication that it's related to a password policy setting. So for example, if I wanted the password life to be 180 days, I would name it 180 day password age. Uh, in this case, I think I'm gonna give it a password age of seven days just for testing. So we're gonna call this seven day password age. All right, and it's gonna be a global group and a security group. So we'll select okay. All right, now right away I'm gonna open up this group and I'm gonna add my user as a member under the members tab. I'm gonna select add and I'm gonna add paul.hill. Now I'll click check names and we can see paul.hill at instructorpaul.com was resolved, so I'll select okay. And now I'll click apply and hit okay. And now I can minimize Active Directory. Now, essentially all we've done is created a security group and added my user to it. Now the security group has a name that's useful, letting us know that the password age is only seven days, but it really doesn't do anything to that effect. So the way that we create a PSO is not inside of Active Directory and it's not inside of group policy. And I think this is why most system administrators don't know how to create a PSO or a fine-grained password policy. I've talked to a lot of senior system administrators and I've never talked to one that has ever created a PSO or was even familiar with it. So the way that you do this is with ADSI edit, we're gonna select tools under server manager and we're gonna select ADSI edit. Okay, so under ADSI edit, we're gonna right click and choose connect to and I'm gonna leave all this default settings as is and I'm gonna click okay. And I will select default naming context and I'll expand my domain here. I can see instructorpaul.com. I'm gonna expand system by left clicking on system and then expanding it. And then we're looking for password settings container. So I'm gonna select password settings container and I'm gonna right click here on the new in the window here and I'm gonna choose new object. Okay, so the only class that we have is a MDDS password settings. This is the PSO object that we're looking for. We're gonna click next, and we need to create a name for the PSO. Now, this just needs to be a little bit descriptive to tell you what the object is doing, so I'm gonna call it seven day password age. And I'll click next. So for password settings precedence, we're gonna set this to one. And the PSO with the lowest number, the lowest value, the one closest to one, will take precedence over other PSOs. Now I haven't created another PSO, but if you had two PSOs that were applied to the same security group, the one with a lower precedence would take precedence over the other PSO. So I'm just gonna set this to one and I'm gonna click next. Okay, so just like in the group policy objects, we can see, do we want to use reversible encryption? So we're gonna type in the word false, all uppercase, and we will click next. And for password history, I'm gonna use 24, we'll click next. Password complexity, we're gonna say true. You remember these are settings that we also set inside of the group policy object. Minimum password length for user accounts, I'm going to set to 14. Okay, so this minimum password age, I'm gonna to set to zero, but to do that, we need to type in zero colon zero zero colon zero zero colon zero zero. And this is the format. So it represents, it represents seconds, minutes, hours, and then days finally. So I'm just gonna copy this and we'll click next. And now we have maximum password age for user accounts. Now remember, I wanted to set this to seven days, so I'm going to write it just like that. That represents seven days. So I'm gonna click next. Okay, so the lockout threshold represents how many times can a user type in a bad password before their account gets locked out. I'm gonna type in three because I like that number and I want the user accounts to be locked out after three failed attempts. The observation window is going to be 15 minutes. So I'm gonna paste that format that I copied earlier and I'm going to change this to one five. So there's 15 minutes and I will click next. 
Okay, under locked out duration, again, I'm going to do 15 minutes. And we'll click next. Okay, so now we're just going to click finish. And we need to now apply this password settings container to our security group that we created called seven day password age. So I'm going to right click on this and I'm going to choose properties. And we're looking for the MSDS applies to setting, which I can find right here. It's about halfway down. So I'm going to choose this and I'm going to choose edit. Now we're going to select add windows account and we're going to look for our seven day password group. And I'm just going to select check names here and we can see seven day password age. Now we will click OK. And we can see that it's inside of the instructor Paul container. And we can see the distinguished name here for that object. I'm not worried about all that. I'm just going to click OK. And if I click apply, we can now see that this PSO applies to our security object. All right, so now I'm going to click OK. And now, in theory, any user that is a member of the seven day password age group will have a seven day password policy. Okay, so there's two ways we can verify the password expiration. For one, we could wait seven days and see if the password expires. Two, we could update the PSO to expire after five minutes if we would like. Or three, we can run a PowerShell command to verify the password expiration date. So I'm gonna hit the Windows Start button here and I'm going to type in PowerShell and I will press enter. Okay, so now we have to type in this long, uncomfortable set of commands, which I have attached under the resources of this lecture. Now you'll need to edit it to make it work with your domain if you're using a different domain. But first thing we're gonna do is do import module active and I'll press enter. Okay, so we're going to start by typing the command get dash ad user. And we're going to type in dash f. We're typing an open brace and given name. Sorry, that's given with a capital G and name with a capital N. And we're going to do dash equals and then their first name. In my case, I'm testing against my user account, Paul Hill. So my given name is Paul. So now we're going to do a dash and grab a set of properties. So we're going to type in properties. And the properties I'm looking for is in quotes, display with a capital D and name, all one word, capital D and capital N. I'm gonna do a comma, and then we're gonna look for this attribute MS capital DS dash user with a capital U, password, capital P, expiry, capital E, time with a capital T and computed, computed with a capital C. Now we're gonna end that with quotation marks and we're going to pipe this by holding the shift key and the backslash key or the key above enter or below backspace on my keyboard. We're gonna enter a pipe and we're gonna say select dash object dash property and make sure you're matching the case sensitivity that I'm typing in here. So select dash object and then we're gonna do dash property inside quotation marks display name and quotation marks. We're going to do a comma and we'll do the next property. It's going to be the at sign and open brace. And we're going to do name with an uppercase N A M E. And we're going to do equals quote expiry date in quotation marks. We're going to do a brace. We're going to do ex and we'll type in expression equals another open brace and then a square bracket. And we're going to say date, time, close the square bracket, and do two colons. And we're going to say from file time, open parentheses, the dollar sign, underscore, and then dot. Then within quotes, we're going to type in msds-user, same thing we typed in before, user, password, expiry, time, computed, not computer, computed. And we'll end the quotation marks, end the parentheses, and end the braces. Okay, so we'll press enter. And here we can see the new expiration date of my user account is going to be October 30th. Now, if I was to go into Active Directory just to demonstrate this and reset my user password really fast,
Hit OK. So my password has been changed. Now if we run this command again, we can see that it's now seven days after the 30th, which is the 6th. OK, so November 6th is when my password will now expire. Now, if you didn't get this command quite right, you can find it under the attached resources of this lecture. Of course, I am doing this inside of my domain. Uh, if you have a different user account, you're gonna need to type in that name. Uh, you can also change this filter to, instead of given name, you could change it to surname or any of the other Active Directory attributes. But that is how we're going to demonstrate how to create a PSO within Active Directory. Now, I hope you found this lecture useful. I sure did enjoy making it for you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Hey, it's Instructor Paul from InstructorPaul.com, and in this lecture, I'm going to be showing you how to create firewall rules with group policy. Now, you don't have a need to just open firewall ports on your domain. So in this lecture, we're just going to be opening the ports 1, 2, 3, 4, and we're going to deploy it to the domain. We're going to test it on our computers, and we're going to see how it works and how you can do it inside of your domain. I don't recommend that you follow along in this lecture because you don't want to just you know, go willy nilly open ports in your firewalls of your domain computers as that's just asking for a hacker to come in and just cause all kinds of problems in your network. All right, so I am logged into my IPDC01 server and I'm going to, within server manager, select tools and open group policy. So group policy management down here about halfway down. Okay, next I am going to, you guessed it, create a new GPO and I'm gonna create this just for my domain computers. I'm gonna right click on this organizational unit here and I'm gonna say create a GPO in this domain and link it here. Now I'll call this my test1234 firewall dash test, it's not wanting to type here, there we go, firewall dash test1234. So if I click okay, now the GPO has been created. And the, remember the reason why I like to prefix these GPOs is so that when I'm looking under group policy objects, so that all the software deployments will be together, all the firewall policies, et cetera, okay? So now I'm gonna right click on this GPO and we're gonna choose edit. All right, so let's maximize the screen here and keep this in mind that firewall settings are a computer configuration. So you need to create this GPO and link it to an OU that holds computer accounts. So I'm gonna select policies, Windows settings. Now we're looking for security settings and we're looking for the Windows firewall with advanced security. I'm gonna click into this. There's another Windows firewall with advanced security. All right, we'll expand this here. So now we can make all kinds of configuration changes for the firewalls on our domain. Now, what I'm gonna do is just make a new inbound rule, but the process is the same for both outbound and inbound. Now we can also open the firewall properties if we'd like. We can change, you know, turning off the firewall, which I strongly would not recommend doing that. Uh, but we can do all kinds of things with the firewall here, just like you could as if you logged into the computer and opened Windows Firewall with advanced security. So to create a new inbound rule or outbound rule, we just need to select whatever we want to create, right click and choose new rule. And from here on out, it's just like what you've seen when you've created a firewall rule on a computer. You can choose a program, port, predefined or a custom. So I'm gonna just choose port, and I will click next. And I'm gonna open the port one, two, three, four. Again, this is strictly for demonstration purposes. I am doing this in a lab environment that's disconnected from the internet. So I have no threat of being hacked from the outside. You do not wanna do this in your domain. So just watch and you don't need to follow along in this one, okay? So again, up here at the top, you can choose TCP or UDP. You can do all local ports or specify certain ports. I'm just gonna do one, two, three, four. I'm gonna say allow the connection. And I will allow this to apply to domain, private, and public profiles. So now I'll click next. So now I need to name this new rule. And I'm going to call this test1234. All right. And I will click finish. So now we can see the setting is now listed under our inbound rules. What we're going to do is switch over to a computer that is in this domain computers organizational unit. And we're going to run a GP update. And we're going to look at how we can verify that those settings are being applied. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do here is run a GP update by hitting start, opening command prompt, or searching for CMD, as we've done several times, and we're gonna type in the command GP update forward slash force. 
Okay, so it's asking me to restart. This is in relation to the 7-zip installation. I'm just gonna say no, and I'm gonna press enter. And now I'm gonna close this, and I'm gonna hit start again, and we're gonna open RSOP. So rsop.msc, and we can see it is listed up here at the top. So I press the Windows button, I typed in rsop.msc, and it, it finds this resultant set of policy Microsoft Common Console document. So I'm gonna open this here. Now, under the computer configuration, uh, really quick, we can see a little exclamation mark there. Whenever you see those kind of exclamation marks, it means it's important. So if we right click on this and choose properties, we can see error information. And there's a software installation that did not complete. Uh, this is the seven zip that I had applied earlier. No big deal. I'm just gonna click cancel. The reason why I'm getting that message is that on this member server, I have not run a GP update and restarted the computer. So it's letting me know that under error information, the software installation did not complete because a system restart is required. So I'm just gonna ignore that. Okay, so a lot of you guys, and for good reason, are going to look for the firewall settings under Windows Settings Security and Windows Firewall with Advanced Security. But if you'll notice, it's not actually listed here. The firewall settings will actually be listed under Administrative Templates and Extra Registry Settings. So I'm gonna maximize this result instead of policy. And really quick, we can see the two items are listed here, test one, two, three, four, and test one, two, three, four. So if we double click on this, we can see the exact settings uh, for the GPO and the firewall rule. Okay, so we can see it's, the action is to allow, uh, active is true, and the port number and then the name. Okay, so that is how you apply a firewall policy to your domain computers with a group policy object. Great job getting through this lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello, it's Instructor Paul from InstructorPaul.com. And in this lecture, I'm going to be showing you how you can use group policy to create registry settings. Now, we're going to create a registry setting that will allow us to right click on any file and open it with Notepad. So we can right click anything that's not a TXT, you know, like a JPG or a zip file or a DLL or anything like that. And we're gonna have an option to open with Notepad. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do right now is just create the GPO on our domain controller. So I'm logged into my domain controller. I have group policy already open. So I'm just going to right click and choose create new GPO in this domain and link it here. So I'm gonna link it to the root of my domain. Okay, and I'm just gonna call this registry settings. All right, and I'll click okay. And now I'll right click on the registry settings and I'll choose edit. Okay, so we could either do this on a computer basis or on a user basis, it's either one. So we're gonna go under preferences, Windows settings, and we have the registry. So same thing for the computer configuration, Windows settings, we also have the registry. So we can do this for either or. If we wanted to do only a, a certain particular group of administrators would have this ability, we could do that under this user configuration. Now I'm just gonna do mine under the computer configuration and allow it to take effect for the whole domain. So what I'm gonna do is right click under the registry and I'm gonna choose new registry item. Now before we go any further, you should keep in mind that editing your registry is generally a bad idea if you don't know exactly what you're doing is you can cause a lot of problems with your computers and some of the issues are even irreversible. You'll have to reformat or rebuild the computer. So you need to be really careful when you're editing the registry. All right, so I don't recommend that you follow along with this lecture if you're in a production environment. I always wanna make that clear when we're doing something that's a little bit risky. You might wanna test it in a lab first or in an isolated OU with a computer that doesn't really matter that much before you deploy it into a production environment. Now, as you guys know, I'm working in my own little disconnected lab environment. So I can break things all day and I'm not too worried about it. Now granted, I don't think we're gonna have any problems with what we're gonna do in this lecture, but I just wanted to throw that warning out to you. Okay, so under the action, we're gonna choose create. And under the hive, we're gonna select the H key classes root. Okay, so now we're gonna hit this browse button and we're gonna select a hive path. And that's gonna be H key classes root. We're gonna open up the star here at the top and we're looking for shell. So now I'm gonna click select. And we're gonna append a little bit to this keypad. So we're gonna start with a backslash and then we're gonna say open with notepad. 
and then we're going to do backslash command. All right, so we're basically adding a new command that's going to say open with notepad. All right, now under the value, we're going to leave it at default, and we're going to leave this as a reg sz. So under the value data, we're now going to type in notepad.exe, which will call notepad the program, and then we're going to do space percent one. And what that basically does, this goes back to the old DOS days, but when we right click on a new file, it's going to allow us this opportunity to open it with notepad. And if we choose that option, it's going to open notepad.exe and this percent one stands in or is a variable for the file that we're right clicking on. Okay, so now we're gonna click apply and we're gonna click okay. All right, so we can test this out right away in our domain controller since I linked it to the root of my domain. Under instructorpaul.com, I have my registry settings GPO. So in theory, all I need to do is run a GP update and I should be able to begin to right click on any kind of file I want. Now I'm gonna start by testing this on my desktop background. So I'm gonna to go to my data drive and I'm gonna to go to desktop backgrounds. And you can choose any file that's not a TXT file. If I right click, uh, we can see I've edit, print, share desktop, set as desktop background, all the normal options. Now what we want to have happen with this new registry setting is we want to be able to edit it or open it with notepad. So I'm gonna run this GP update. I'm gonna hit the start button down here in the bottom left and I'll open command prompt. And I'm gonna run GP update forward slash force. Okay, so we'll just give this a second to complete. And then once it's done, we're going to right click back on that JPG and we're gonna see what happens. So the computer policy is complete and now the user policy is complete. So now I'm gonna right click on instructor Paul and we can see open with notepad is now an option. So if I click on this, it opens the instructor Paul JPG file with notepad. This obviously is not useful for JPEGs, but uh, it can be useful for the other files, config files, XML files, et cetera. So we've done a little bit of a nice little hack here. This is something that uh, you can really do a lot of useful things by adding in files or adding in registry settings. Uh, but I don't recommend you go too crazy with the registry as if you experiment too much, you can cause a lot of damage. So I hope you found this lecture useful. That is how you set up the registry settings with group policy. Now, great job getting through this lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hey, it's Instructor Paul from InstructorPaul.com, and in this lecture, I'm going to be talking to you about Windows PowerShell script execution. Now, this probably doesn't mean anything to you just yet, but when you create a script in PowerShell and you save it and then you attempt to run it, some of you guys are going to run into an error. And I'll show you what that looks like. So let's hit the start button in the bottom left corner of our server. And just as a side note, not that it's too important, but just for your awareness, I am logged into my IPDC. 01 server. I'm going to ignore that updates there. So I'm logged into IPDC 01. Doesn't particularly matter, but uh, I'm going to hit the start button now and I'm going to type in PowerShell. Okay, and we have this PowerShell ISC or we can just open the PowerShell client. So if we open this first PowerShell client here, it just kind of works like CMD does. Uh, but if we hit start and we open the PowerShell ISC, it's more like a code editor. So we'll open this up. For the first time when you launch it, it's gonna look like this. But if you click this script, drop down the right-hand side of the screen, we can now see we can write a script up here. So let's just type in a command here. Just say echo, and then in quotation marks, we'll just say hello world, just like everyone else does when you're first loading a coding language. Now if we hit the play button up here, we can execute the script, and we'll get the output down here in the bottom. All right, so I'm gonna hit run script. And we can see that it worked just as we expect. Here's the command echo world and, or hello world. And we can see the output of the command right there. Now, if we save this script, so if I hit file, save as, and let's just go to the C drive. And I call this test script or just test. And I hit save. Now, if I attempt to run the script, I'm gonna get this error saying, test could not be loaded because running script is disabled on the system. For more information, please see about execution policies. Okay, so you can try and run a command to elevate the execution policy or set it to unrestricted or allow all scripts to be written. But if your scripts are being blocked by group policy, none of that is going to work. 
So what I want to do is I want to hit the start button and we're going to run a resultant set of policy. So rsop.msc, just like you know, when we're troubleshooting group policy, this is one of the first things that we're going to want to do. All right. And we're going to look for a Windows component called power. And we're going to look for a PowerShell setting that is blocking. And we're going to look for the specific PowerShell setting that is blocking our script execution. So on a computer configuration, we're looking for administrative templates. It's going to be under Windows Components and Windows PowerShell. And here we can see turn on script execution is disabled. All right. Now, also, if you'll notice under the user configuration, if we expand administrative templates, Windows Components and PowerShell, here it's enabled. But if we click on this and scroll down here under this uh, explain tab, we can see here that this policy exists for both computer and user. And the computer configuration has precedence over the user configuration. So even though we've enabled it for their user accounts, it is disabled for the computer account. So in other words, the scripts are not going to be able to execute. Now I set this up in my domain on purpose to create this error. Uh, some of you guys who work in production environments where they're a little more secure, or maybe they're running stig checks, this setting will be disabled and it will prevent you from running your scripts. So you need to enable that uh, for your domain computers or, or wherever you want to run your scripts. I would set up like a member server and restrict access to that server to only certain members, you know, of the administrators group. And then I would enable the script execution on that server. All right. So we are going to open group policy and we're going to fix this setting. So I configured it under my default domain policy. So I'm going to right click and we can see here under RSOP that it tells us right here, the setting is being configured from our default domain policy. So under group policy management, I'm going to right click and choose edit. And I'm going to go to policies, administrative templates, and I'm looking for windows components. I'm going to expand this here. We're going to scroll down and we're going to select windows PowerShell and I'll maximize this screen. And here we can see turn on script execution is disabled. So we're going to change this back to not configured. If you have other GPOs that might be setting it to disabled, you might want to set it to enabled, but I know nothing else in my domain is configuring this setting. So I'm just going to put it to not configured, which is the default for the default domain policy. All right. Now I'm also going to go under the user settings under policies, administrative templates and windows components and PowerShell, which is all the way down at the bottom windows PowerShell. And I'm going to, again, open this turn on script execution and I'm going to set it to not configured. And I'll hit apply and okay. Now I'll close out of the GPO. And if I refresh this group policy object, we can see that I'm no longer configuring those settings. All right, so now we're going to run a GP update and we're going to attempt to run the script again. So I'm going to type in GP update forward slash force. And again, I'm just hitting start and I'm typing in the letter CMD and that brings up command prompt. And then I'm just typing the command GP update space forward slash force. Okay, so the computer policy is updated. Now we just need to wait for the user policy to update and then we'll attempt to run the script again. Okay, so user policy has been updated. I'm actually gonna have to close out of the ISE and launch it again. So I'm gonna hit the start button and I'm gonna search for PowerShell and we'll open the ISE and we're gonna hit file, open and we'll open that test one PowerShell script and now if we click the play button, we can see that the script is able to execute just like we would expect it to. So that is how you enable script execution on your domain. If you're running into that error or you experience that error, then that is how you fix it. So good job getting through this lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello there, this is Instructor Paul from InstructorPaul.com. And in this lecture, I'm going to be giving you an introduction to Windows PowerShell. Now we're going to be covering PowerShell in the light of Active Directory, or in other words, we're not going to be covering everything that you can do with PowerShell. Instead, we're going to focus on the Active Directory related commands. The first thing you need to learn how to do is start Windows PowerShell. So we can do that by just hitting the Windows button and keep in mind that I am logged into my domain controller here, which is IPDC01. So I'm going to hit the start button here and I'm going to type in PowerShell. And we have two options. We can either open Windows PowerShell or we can open the ISE. We could also open the 32-bit version, but there's no reason to do that. So I'm going to go with the first option, 
which is just Windows PowerShell. Okay, so I'm going to maximize the screen here. To get you started within PowerShell, the first thing that I would tell you to do is to enter the command start with a capital S and dash and type in transcript. And if you press enter, what this is going to do is it's going to record all of the commands that you type into PowerShell. All right, and we can see that it's going to be saved under this file here. So if you remember later that you wanted to use a certain command and you can't remember how to do it, this transcript will allow you to look back through your history and figure out what command it was that you're looking for. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do is list all of the commands with PowerShell that relate to Active Directory. And the way we can do that is by typing the get dash command. And we're going to do inside of a star, we're going to do dash ad. Okay, and then we're going to add a star at the end. And what this does is it finds any command that contains the text uh, dash ad. And these are all of our Active Directory commands. So I'm going to press enter. And we're going to get a pretty good idea of what we can do with PowerShell and Active Directory. So I'm just going to scroll all the way up here at the top. And we'll just take a quick look. So we can see command type, the name, the version source. Mainly all that's important here is the name. So uh, we can see that a couple of the things that we're doing just browsing through, uh, we're able to, let's see, add a group member. So we're able to modify groups within PowerShell. Uh, we can enable an Active Directory account. We can also disable the Active Directory account. We can get a computer information. Uh, we can get Active Directory domain information. We can get uh, AD Forest information and so on. So if we go down through here, we can see we can create a new Active Directory group or a new Active Directory object. We can create a new user with PowerShell. Uh, just scrolling down, we can do the same thing, but we, we can remove these objects as well. Uh, we can also set attributes for these objects, so we can set the AD for set the AD group. Uh, we can configure various parameters of objects with PowerShell. Now, you also have the CLS command in command prompt. Uh, it's an alias that will clear the screen when you have a lot of text like that. Sometimes it makes it easier when you're trying to look through commands and you don't want a bunch of text on the screen. So, for example, if I press enter down here a bunch and I want a fresh screen, I can just type in CLS and it'll reset everything. Okay. Now, a way we can look at all the aliases like CLS is by typing get alias. And I'm not going to finish the word here. I'm just going to type in get dash A L I A. And I'm going to press tab on the keyboard and it will auto complete the command for me. So now if I press enter, we can see here, if I scroll all the way up to the top again, we have all the aliases for all of our commands. So the command we just used was CLS, which is clear host. Okay. So these are all the aliases that you can use within uh, PowerShell. And we'll be using some of these, like the for each, for each object, et cetera. All right. So I'm going to run another CLS and just clear the screen. Now, this is really going to save you a lot of time. You can use the up and down arrows to navigate through your recent command history. All right. So if you typed in a command, a long command, for example, if you wanted to redo get uh, command AD, you could just use the up and down arrows to go back through your history and re-enter that command. That way you don't have to retype commands in PowerShell. PowerShell is really good with tab completion and with uh, command history in that you don't always have to type things out the whole way. So if we wanted to just say get dash, uh, we could just press tab and we can tab through all of the options that we have for get dash. Okay, so if I backspace here, if for example, we type in new dash AD and then just start pressing tab, we can see all of the options that we have for new dash ad. Okay, so I'm just going to hit backspace here. Let's talk about variables now. Now this is a crash course on coding. If you've never coded before, this is going to be pretty foreign to you. But I'm, I'm hoping you have some experience. First off, a variable is a PowerShell object that holds value. So I'm going to hit Shift in the for sign, and that puts down the dollar sign. And now I can create a variable. So I can call it anything I want. I could call it Paul is cool. Uh, I could call it instructor Paul, or I could just call it variable. And I'm going to call it my variable. So my variable, just like that. And then I'm going to say is equal to 15, just for fun. Okay, so my variable is equal to 15. So if I press enter, 15 is now the value for my variable. So if I echo my variable, and if I press tab here, 
I can see that it auto it'll auto complete the command for me. If I press enter, we can see the result is output is 15. Now I can also do my variable plus 30 and press enter and the result will be 45 because my variable represents 15. And of course, 15 plus 30 is 45. Okay, so let's move on to the next command, which I think is going to help you out a lot. And that is the get dash help. So if we type in get dash help, and then we type in a command name, like for example, if we type in echo, get help dash echo, we can see the exact syntax for the command and how we're supposed to use it. There's also aliases for this command. So we could just say write or just echo. And there's some remarks from the command. Okay, so let's learn about the command get ad user. So if I type in get dash help, get ad, and then press tab, we can see this auto populates get ad user. If I press enter, what it just did there at the top of the screen is it imported the Active Directory module. I don't know if you saw that. So if you're running on a computer that does not have Active Directory installed, you will not be able to run this command. If it gives you an error and says the module is not installed, you can just type in the command import dash module and we're going to type in active directory. This will allow us to run commands like get ad user. Okay, so I'm going to press enter and the module is already imported. So it's not going to run that command again. Okay, so for get help and get ad user, we can see that there's a couple ways we can run this command. First, we can run get ad user and then filter for the type of user we want. We can use the identity parameter to find the object we want, or we can use an LDAP filter. The easiest way to do this is with get ad user and the identity. So we're going to do that now. I'm going to type in get dash ad user and we're going to type in id and press tab and it'll autocomplete identity. And I'm going to type in administrator in quotation marks. And I'll press enter. Okay, so now it pulled out all of this information for my administrator account. Now, this is not all the information you can grab. Uh, this is just what is loaded by default when you run a get ad user command. So for example, we can see a distinguished name, which is the LDAP path to the object. We can see whether it's enabled, which is true. We can see the given name, which there's nothing there for that. We can see the name, which is administrator, the type of object that it is, etc. Okay, now let's run it with the filter command just so you get an idea of why using the identity is easier. So if I type in get dash ad user, and instead of doing identity, I do dash F and press tab. So now we're filtering. What we have to do is do an open brace. We need to search one of these parameters here. So we can either do distinguished name. We can do whether it's enabled, which isn't really a good search because it'll return more than one object because I know there's more than one object in my Active Directory domain that is enabled. We could search the name and I think that's the best bet we're going to have here. So I'm going to type in name dash EQ for is equal to. And then in quotation marks, administrator. And then I'm going to close the brace and I'm going to press enter. Okay, so now we got the exact same result, but we used a different method. You're going to find in PowerShell, there's a million ways to do the same thing. And some are easier than others. I'd much prefer to do this than to type in all of this information. But let's say we only had the object GUID or the SID. How would we find that? Well, we could do that by, I'm going to press the up arrow and just modify my code here. I'm going to delete administrator out of that quotation and I'm going to get rid of name. And let's say we only had the object GUID. So I'm going to type that in object GUID and I'm going to say is equal to, and I'm just going to copy this. There's no need to type that again. I'm going to select it, hit left control and C and now I'm going to right click and it will paste it right into here. So now I'm searching for any active directory object, which has the object GUID of this value. So if I press enter, we can see that it returned the same user account. So we can search and filter for different objects besides just the identity. So if you're stuck with something that is not, you know, human readable or human friendly, like the GUID or the SID, you can still search for that information using the filter property. You'll notice that all of these options here are actually the Active Directory objects attributes. So if we were to open Active Directory, which I'm going to do now, so pop over to Server Manager, I'm going to hit Tools, and I'm going to look for Active Directory users and computers. Okay, so I'm here in my domain. I'm going to hit view and I'm going to enable advanced features and I'm going to browse to the user account under users and I'm looking for administrator. So if I double click administrator, here I can see the attribute editor. Now, if I just click this value up here at the top, 
we can see all of the values or all the attributes that are set. Now, first thing we're going to notice is the object GUID, which is listed under our PowerShell session. So the things that we're seeing here are nothing more than object attributes. Now, let's say, for example, we wanted to search on another attribute that isn't listed here. Well, you can do that by simply specifying the type of property that you want to get. So say we want to get the description and the description isn't listed here. So what we would do is I'm just going to go back to, I'm going to hit the up arrow. Okay. So we're going for get AD user identity administrator. Now we can hit dash and type in properties or P R O P and then press tab. It'll auto complete it. Now we can enter one of the attributes that we're looking for. So in my case, I'm looking for the description. So if I type in properties and then description, and if I press enter, we can see now that the description has been added to the list of results. You can also set the properties or attributes for Active Directory objects with PowerShell. And you can do that with the set-ad user command. And you don't need to do an identity or anything like that. So we can just type in set ad user paul.hill. And this is going to find my paul.hill user account. And if I type in dash email address, paul at instructor paul.com in quotation marks. And if I press enter, now if we go back to Active Directory and we open my user account, we go to attribute editor. And if we scroll down, we should be able to find my email account has been added. So now the mail is listed at paul at instructor paul.com. Now it's a little bit confusing because it says mail and not email address like our PowerShell command specified. So you might be wondering, how did I know what I was setting? Well, you can run get dash help and set ad user. And if we press enter, we can see all of the properties that we can configure here and what their information is. So I can see right away that I can use dash email address and I can modify the user's email. We can do employee ID, home phone, etc. So that get dash help is extremely useful. So I want you to keep that in mind. All right. Now the last thing that we're going to do is use the get dash history command. While you can use the up and down arrows, sometimes it's just easier to have it displayed for you. So if I type in get dash history and press enter, we can see the last handful of user commands that we have run. Okay. So that's all we're going to cover in this lecture. Great job getting through this one. And I'm looking forward to teaching you more in the next lecture. Hey, it's Instructor Paul from InstructorPaul.com, and in this lecture, we're going to be learning how to list Active Directory users with Windows PowerShell. Now, first thing to keep in mind is I am logged into a computer that has Active Directory installed. Precisely, this is my IPDC01 server. So if you don't have Active Directory, you're not going to be able to follow along in this lecture. I'm going to start PowerShell by hitting the Start button in the bottom left corner, and I'm going to type in PowerShell. Okay, so I can either open the script editor, the ISE, or I can open the PowerShell command window. I'm going to select the ISE and it will launch. Okay, so this is the window that I'm brought to. If yours looks like this, you just need to click the drop down arrow on the top right hand corner of the screen. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is write a comment. And you can write a comment by hitting shift and the number three. This allows us to write any kind of text and it will not be executed once we're running the command. Now I'm just going to write a comment about the next line of code we're going to write, which is import the active directory module. Okay. So that just lets me know when I come back to look at the script later, uh, that I, this following line of code imports the active directory module. Okay. So we're just going to type in import dash module and I'm using tab completion there. So when I type in import and hit dash, these are all the options that I have for the import command. And I can just type in M. It'll narrow down the results to anything that includes M. So I'm just going to press enter and we're going to say active directory. Okay. So next thing that we're going to do is list all of our active directory users. So I'm going to write a comment and I'm going to say list all AD users. And then in parentheses, I'm just going to say that, you know, we're setting a max limit of 100 users. This is important for larger domains. Okay, so we're going to list every user inside of Active Directory, but we're not going to let it go past 100 users. And this is for those of you who work in a large enterprise domain with thousands or tens of thousands of user accounts. You don't want to just run a command that will list all of those. It'll really use a lot of unnecessary resources. Okay, so what we're going to do 
is we're going to type in the get dash ad user and i'm going to press tab to autocomplete and we're going to we're going to use dash f or dash filter and we're going to enter the star now this will grab any active directory user we don't want to grab everything like i said so we're going to do a result size result set size that is and i'm going to type in 100 so we cannot grab more than 100 users now if we hit play here we can see all of the user accounts in my domain, okay? And there's a max of 100, 100 that could be returned. So if I had 500 users, only the first 100 would be listed. All right, let's take an example. What if we wanted to do a list that was more user you know, friendly? We just wanted to glance over and see what users were in our domain. This isn't the easiest way to do that. So we can do that by piping this, or that is pressing shift and then the key below backspace or above enter on my keyboard. It's also the backslash on my keyboard. So if I hold shift and press that, it puts out the pipe command. And what we can do is now hand the results of this command, that is all of this, this output right here, all of this, we can hand that to another command. And the other command that we wanna use is select dash object. Okay, and we can select, we can specify only show the following information like given name or name whatever we'd prefer. So let's do a select object just for the name attribute, okay? So select object name. Now if I hit run, we can see that we get a list that's a lot easier to read. It starts with administrator, ends with John Wall. So we can see up here the same thing is happening, John Wall, and it's starting with the administrator account, which is somewhere up here, there it is, administrator. Okay, we can also select multiple objects. So if we wanted a user principal name, we could do that by just pressing comma and then typing user principal. You gotta spell it right, <laughs> user principal name, and then pressing run. And now we have all of our user accounts and their user principal names. Okay, so some of these aren't populated and that's fine. Uh, we could also select, for example, the surname, or we could do uh, you know, whether it's enabled or not. So if I type in, enabled and if i click play or the run button we can see here uh, that it's outputting the list of users in a more friendly format okay and like you already know we can select different properties so if we wanted the last logon we could do properties and then i'm going to type in let's say for example last logon okay and in a comma i'm just going to add last logon okay and then i'm going to hit play now this is an Active Directory time or an LDAP timestamp. This isn't human readable. This has it's like seconds after 1997 or 1970 or something like that. I'm not exactly sure, but this is the time that the user was last logged into. All right. Now let's take a scenario where we want to list all of the user accounts inside of an Active Directory OU. Now the way that we would do that is under Git AD user we would do dash filter and we would do star because we're trying to get all of the user accounts and we would also add a search base so if we hit dash and we type in search we can see that we have search scope and search base we want to use search base and then inside of this search base we can specify the organizational unit that we want to search in it needs to be the ldap path to the organizational unit not itflea.com slash users that is not a, a valid ldap path now the way, there's two ways you can find it. There's the, what I consider to be the hard way and then there's the easy way. The hard way is within PowerShell, you can change the directory to Active Directory. So just like you would change the directory to another hard drive, you can do CD and then AD and then the colon. So if I press enter, and now if I type in DIR, which will list the directory, here's everything inside of my domain. So I have my instructor Paul. So if I type in CD and then just start pressing tab, uh, this is a configuration we need to go down until we get to uh, one more. There we go. DC equals instructorpaul.com. It's that this first line here. So if I press enter, now I'm under DC instructorpaul.com. This is the format that we're looking for when we're specifying the search base. Okay, it's not exactly friendly. So if I type in another directory, we can now see that I'm looking at the Active Directory domain. Same thing you see when you're under advanced features in Active Directory. So if I open up Server Manager and I pop into Active Directory by selecting Tools, Active Directory Users, and Computers, if I minimize this window and hopefully Active Directory will load soon. Okay, here we go. 
Now I already have advanced view enabled, uh, but to see all this, you're gonna have to hit view and advanced features. So here we can see that we have TMP device, we have users, it's not exactly in the same format, but we have system that you can see here. We have the built-in, which is up here at the top, computers, et cetera, okay? So we're looking at the same structure here, but it's just inside of the Active Directory, okay? So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna type in CD, and we're looking for our organizational unit, which is Instructor Paul. So the first giveaways is going to be OU equals. So we have one here and one here. So OU, I'm just keep pressing tab until I get to OU. Keep going down. Okay, there's the domain controllers and there's the Instructor Paul. So now I'll press enter. And now we can see the path to my Instructor Paul organizational unit. Now if I press DIR again, we can see that we have disabled users, domain computers, domain groups, and domain users. If I want to search inside of domain users, I just need to type in CD and go down to domain users, which is there. And now I have the path. So I can select this path. I can select everything up to the AD in the backslash. So anything from OU and on, that is going to be the path. We're going to right click and we're going to choose copy. Okay, so now we're going to paste that up here into the search base. This is the distinguished name of the organizational unit that we're looking for. Now, in my opinion, that's the hard way to do it. So what I'm gonna do now is CD back over to the C drive just so I'm not inside of Active Directory and I don't make any mistakes. All right, the easy way to find it is go to Active Directory, enable advanced features under View, Advanced Features, browse the organizational unit that you're looking for, right click, choose Properties, and you can do this for any object, by the way. We're gonna select Attribute Editor, and right there at the bottom, we can see the distinguished name. So if I open this up, we can see here that this is the same distinguished name or the LDAP path that we're looking for. So if I right click and choose copy, I can hit OK. And I can paste that into my PowerShell command. OK, so now this will list every user inside of this organizational unit. Now, if we pipe this to a select dash object, we can make it look nice and pretty. So select object name. And then if we just hit play, we can see that Paul Hill and Robert Hill is all that's listed inside of this OU. And while we're looking in here, we can see that that is the case. Okay, so now let's take a scenario where we want to list all the group members of a particular security group. Now I have the roaming profiles user group, which I'm going to use only contains one user, but I ran into a scenario at work where I had about three or 400 user accounts inside of a group, and I needed to give them a list of all the users inside the group. And the easiest way for me to do that was just to open PowerShell. And I was just going to type in the command get dash ad group member. Okay. Then we're going to enter the name of the group, which is roaming profile users in quotation marks. And I'm just going to open Active Directory and double check that. Yeah, the group is roaming profile users. And now I'm just going to make it look pretty by doing a select dash object. And I'm going to go for name, distinguished name. And if I hit play, here we can see that it will list all of the members of that group. Now, there's only one user account in there. But believe me, when there was a couple hundred user accounts, it saved me a lot of work instead of having to go through here, go through members, and then write down each member that's listed here. Because there's no way to just copy this list that I know of anyways. I'm sure someone can figure out a way to do that. But the easiest way for me to do it was just with PowerShell by using the get ad group member user. All right, now one thing I want to show you guys, any of these searches that we've been doing, we can export them to a CSV. If I want to save this as a CSV, and even though it's only one user account, if I have several users and I want to save it to a file, I can do that by just piping this to export dash CSV. Okay, so if I press tab, now I just need to specify where I want to save the file. So I'll just put in the C drive and we'll call it roaming profile. And you can tell I've done this before, roaming profile users. We'll call it 2.csv. And once I run this command, it's going to get all the members of the Active Directory profiles user. It's gonna select these two properties and then it's gonna take all that information and it's gonna export it to roaming profile users 2.csv. I'm using 2 because I've already created the file before. So I'm gonna hit play or run the script and we can see that the script completed. Now there's no output here because we're just saving it to a CSV. Now if I open the my computer here, and if I go to this PC and the C drive, 
I can see here that Roaming Profile Users 2 has been created. So if I right click and choose Edit, I can see here that we have the name, the distinguished name, and then we have the list of our user accounts. All right. You could open this in Excel, which I don't have installed. Um, that would make things easier for you. I'm just going to go ahead and delete those. Okay, so you can do all kinds of things when you're trying to create a list of Active Directory users. We can also list all Active Directory accounts that are locked out, which I don't have any in my domain that are currently locked out, so it's going to return zero. But if I type in search dash ad account and I type in dash, we can see that we can do account disabled, account expired, account inactive, computers only, locked out, password expired, etc. So we can find all the user accounts that match any of these parameters. So if I do account dash disabled, and if I hit play, that should return some users. And it did here. So if we wanted to make it pretty, we could do select dash object. We could pipe it to a select object and we could just say name. And if I hit play, so here are all the accounts that are disabled in my domain. Of course, I could export that to a CSV by doing piping that to export and then CSV and then the name of the file. So C disabled users dot CSV. And then if I run this, go back to the C drive, we can see disabled users that CSV. If I click edit, we can see here that here is all of the users that have been disabled. Okay, so that concludes this lecture of listing users in Active Directory. I hope you found this useful. There's a lot that you can do here with PowerShell. So anytime you need to create a list inside of Active Directory, I hope you'll consider using PowerShell to do that. Great job getting through this lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hey, it's Instructor Paul from InstructorPaul.com, and in this lecture, I'm going to be showing you how you can use Windows PowerShell to configure or to set the Active Directory profile path. Now, I already have my PowerShell ISE open, and I'm logged into my domain controller. I also have Active Directory open, and I'm navigated to the organizational unit where my Paul.Hill user account resides. Now, this is the user account that's part of the Roaming Profiles group. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind. So I'm just going to be testing this on my Paul.Hill account. Now, there's a couple ways that we could do this. First thing we know we have to do is import the Active Directory module. So down here, we can just type in import dash module Active Directory. Okay, so we can do it directly from the command line like this. And we could just say, uh, using the set ad user command, we can say set ad user, and the identity is Paul.Hill. And we can just hit dash and see all the options that we have here. We can do the company, display name, et cetera. Well, if we decide we want to do the profile path, we can just do that here by typing in profile path and then in quotation marks, backslash, backslash, IPDC01, backslash profiles, which we can see is populated here, and then backslash Paul.Hill. Oops, Paul.Hill. Now, if I press enter, we see the command completed successfully. And if I open my Paul.Hill user account and go to profiles, we can see that the profile path was indeed populated. So I'm going to delete that and hit apply. Now, that's all good. But what if we have 5,000 user accounts that we just added to the roaming profiles group? We can't just go through and add them in all one at a time. So we're going to handle doing that by writing a script. So I'm going to hit the pound button here. And... I'm going to type in, a. we're going to say that we're importing the Active Directory module. Now, it's important that you write comments as much as possible uh, because you don't want to come back later and forget, you know, why, what a line of code does or what you entered it for, okay? So it's a good idea just to put in informative comments. So we're going to do this based on the group membership because if we remember, our group policy object applies to members of the roaming profiles user group. So what we can do, like how we listed all the users inside of the roaming profiles group, we can get that list of users and then perform actions on each of those users inside of the group. So we're gonna use the get AD member group and I'm just gonna say get all members of the roaming profile group. And we'll type in get dash member We'll do get dash ad group member. And the group is roaming profile users. And if I just press, if I just execute this code, it's gonna list my user account there. So we know that it's working already, okay? Now just for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna open this up and I'm gonna add another user. 
So we're going to add robert.hill and I'll click check names. We'll click OK. OK, so now I have two users as members of this group. So if I hit the play button, we can now see that it lists Paul Hill and Robert Hill. OK, so now what we're going to do is complete an action for each of these users. And we do that by piping the results of this get ad group member command. We're going to hit the pipe and I'm going to go down to a new line and press tab. And we're going to type a comment and say loop through each user. And we're going to say for each dash object. And we're going to do an open brace. OK, and then we'll do a closing brace. So we're saying grab all the users that are a member of the roaming profile users group. And then for each of these users, do the following set of actions. OK, do this for each member. All right. Now, you might remember using the set dash ad user command. This allows us to modify properties for each Active Directory member. So we're going to do the dash profile path. And the profile path is going to be ipdc01 backslash profiles, and then the dollar sign backslash, and then username percent. Now, this isn't going to work because PowerShell does not take this variable username percent like command prompt does. So we need to enter another variable. So I'm just going to close this and we're going to add this attribute down here at the bottom called the SAM account name. Okay. And we can do that by hitting the plus button and we're going to hit the dollar sign underscore and then we're going to enter a period. And what this reference is, is the object. So we're running a for each object and this represents the current object that we're looping through, which is an active directory object. So it allows us to call any of these parameters down here. Okay. So if I type in dot, if I type in Sam account name. Okay. So what this is going to do is going to be IPDC profiles and then our Sam account name, which is going to be Paul.hill for this user. And it's going to be Robert.hill for that user. Now we need to put this in parentheses. So it'll be considered one unit. Okay. So the last thing we need to do before we're ready to execute this is specify the identity. So I'm going to do dash identity. And the identity is going to be the same as this. So Paul.hill or Robert.hill, whatever account that we happen to be on. So set ad user dash identity is whatever the same account name is for the current object. And then we'll set the profile path for that user. So now I'm going to hit play. And we can see that it, com it completed the command without any errors. Now what we need to do is go to our domain users and see if it set the profile path for us. So I'm going to open Paul.hill and I'll go under profile. And we can see here that IPDC01 slash profiles slash Paul Hill has been set. Now let's check Robert Hill. And we'll go to profile. And we can see again, this user account has been configured. Okay, so now if we just save this script, so we can type it in as, you know, set profile path. And if we go to the desktop, we could set this up to run as a scheduled task, or we could just right click and run it whenever we want. Now, if you're using an active directory domain, you'll probably want it to run automatically. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to set up to be a scheduled task to run every night or every hour, whatever you would prefer. Uh, but this is one way that you can automate the profile path with Windows PowerShell. So great job getting through this lecture. I had a lot of fun making this for you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello there, this is Instructor Paul from InstructorPaul.com, and in this lecture, I'm going to be showing you how you can create Active Directory users with Windows PowerShell. Now, I'm logged into my domain controller here, and as I've said before, the most important thing for you if you're following along in this lecture is that you're on a computer or a server that has Active Directory or it has the Active Directory toolset installed which is called RSET, so Remote Server Administration Toolset. Now, if you have RSET installed, you still need to be connected to a server that has the Active Directory Domain Services installed, okay? So what I'm going to do is hit the Start button here, and I'm going to search for the PowerShell ISE. And we could do either one that we'd like. I prefer the PowerShell ISE because it gives me the ability to write a script, and I can also use the command prompt below, okay? So the first thing we're going to do since we're working with Active Directory is import the Active Directory module. So import AD module. Of course, we're going to make a comment so we'll know what's going on. So import module, and then we're going to say Active Directory, all one word. I can just press tab and auto complete that. 
And next we're going to create the AD user. And if you remember, we can type in the git dash command and we could do star dash AD and start and we'll get all the commands that are related to Active Directory. So if we look through here, we'll find a command called new AD user, which is right here. So we're gonna use this new AD user command. Now we can also type in get dash help new dash AD user. And we can see how this command is supposed to be run. So we can see the name here and the syntax. So we're specifying the name, uh, account expiration date if we wanted to, and so forth. So change password at long on, all this kind of information. So what we're gonna do is type in new dash AD user. And I'm gonna show you a trick. We could type this all as one long line. The text would go off the screen and it would just get a little bit hard to manage. You can hit the button to the left of one. I'm not exactly sure what this is called off the top of my head. If I hold shift, it's the tilde, but if I just press the key, it gives me this little uh, character right here. And it's to the left of my one key and above tab on my keyboard. So if I press that, I can continue the script on the next line. So I'm just gonna press enter and I'm gonna press tab and I'm going to continue the script. So we're gonna specify the name, which we can see that down here. So name, and then in quotation marks, I'm gonna write the user's name. So we're gonna call this, we're gonna go with Bradley Beal. Okay, so I'm gonna hit this character and I looked it up and it's called the grave accent. So I'm gonna hit a grave accent and I'm gonna press enter. And now we're gonna specify their first name, which is referred to as the given name. So given name would be just their first name, Bradley. We're gonna do the grave accent and we're gonna say surname, which is the last name, and that'll be Beal. Again, another accent. And now we need to specify the username. So that is user principal name, just like that. Remember, you can use tab auto completion. So user principal name, I like to use first dot last. So Bradley dot Beal in quotation marks. And we're going to hit a space and then do the grave accent. Now we need to type in the account password. And this is not as simple as you would think it would be. If we do account password, uh, we can't just type in something like this we have to convert it to a secure string. So we can do that by typing in the command convert to secure string right there at the bottom. And then we're gonna do in quotation marks P and then I have to match the uh, security requirements for my domain. So password, I'm gonna spell it like that. One, two, three, and then in quotation marks. And we're going to do as plain text and we're gonna say force. Now, since we're doing these operators and this is for the actual convert to string and it's not for the account password, it's gonna confuse the new AD user command. So we need to wrap this inside of parentheses. So PowerShell will look at this all as one unit, okay? Now we're gonna hit space and do the grave accent again. And we're gonna specify the path. Now, if you remember, there's a couple ways to get the path. The easiest way is to open Active Directory. So I'm in Server Manager, I'm gonna to hit Tools, Active Directory, Users, and Computers. And I'm gonna right click on the desired LU that I want, which is under instructorpaul.com, instructorpaul, and domain users. So I'll right click and I'll choose Properties. I'll go to the Attribute Editor, and I will select the distinguished name and I'll copy this text. Now, if you don't see the Attribute Editor, it's because under View, you don't have Advanced Features enabled. So you have to go to view, advanced features, and then you'll be able to get the distinguished name of your organizational unit. Okay, so the distinguished name is gonna be the path. So inside of quotation marks, I'm gonna paste that distinguished name. And we're gonna do another grave accent. And then change password at logon. I'm gonna set that to one. And then we're gonna do another grave accent. And finally, we're gonna say enabled is one. So we could either do a zero, we could do a zero or a one, or we could also do true, or we could say false like that. So, but I'm just gonna use the, the one to say that it's gonna be enabled. So now if I hit play, it'll run this script and it'll attempt to create the new Active Directory user. So I'm gonna hit play and we can see that it executed the command. So let's check, uh, let's check Active Directory and see if it was created. Now, we don't see the user account yet, but we need to refresh the page. So I'm gonna hit refresh and there we can see Bradley Beal has been created. Okay, so now if I delete this account, we can do things like, you know, obvious things. 
we could, uh, for example, create it as not, not being enabled. Also, if we don't specify the enabled option, and if we just hit play, we can see the account will be created, but it will be disabled by default. So the default for new Active Directory users who are created with PowerShell is to be disabled. So if you don't specify specifically that you want it to be enabled, it will come through as not being enabled. Now, the reason why this is helpful is we could make a script that would have the user type in a first name, last name, and then just create the user account. I'll show you how to do that. First, we would want to grab some variables. So up here, I'm going to make a comment and say, grab variables from user. Next, we're going to assign some variables. So we're going to say first, we're going to say first name equal to read dash host. And then we're going to say a prompt and we're going to say, please enter the first name. Okay, so the first name variable is going to be assigned to the value that the user will input because we're reading the host and we're going to prompt the user to enter the first name. Let's copy this line, paste it, and we'll change this to last name. So last name is equal to, and then we're going to say, please enter the last name. Now if we go down to our new AD user string and we just swap this out to first name space last name, put that in quotation marks. That will echo the variable first name and echo the variable last name. And then we change the given name to be first name. Now the given name does not need to be wrapped in quotation marks like this does because there's no space, all right? Now the surname is gonna be just last name. And then the user principal name will be just like the name. It'll be first name dot last name. Okay, so now if we run this script, we can see that we're prompted to please enter the first name. So if I just type in auto, go with another Wizards player, auto porter, press enter. It then created the Active Directory user. So if I refresh it here, there's auto porter. We can run it again and just make up another name. Mark Shelton, press enter. And now we have our Mark Shelton user account, okay? So that is why creating user accounts within PowerShell might be a good idea for you. Later, we can talk about creating users with CSV files, but I'm not gonna cover that right now. Okay, so now that we've got this script, I'm gonna hit file and save as, and I'm gonna save it to my desktop and we'll just call it create AD user. And I'll click save and I'll close out of this PowerShell prompt. And now I can just select, it's a little bit hard to see because my desktop's white. I can right click on create AD user and say run with PowerShell. And let's see, I can just type in a name, whatever I want, um, whatever, we'll just, whatever. And then if I go to Active Directory refresh, there's that user account. And of course I can modify the script so that the user account would be enabled and not be disabled by default. But uh, I hope you found this lecture useful. Great job getting through it. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. get dash host no hey it's instructor paul from instructorpaul.com and in this lecture i'm going to be showing you how you can create active directory users from a csv file now i'm going to show you what the csv file looks like you can find it under the resources of this lecture it's called newusers.csv and it contains some information like first name last name the job title phone numbers email address description the target organizational unit of where they need to be placed within Active Directory. And you can see this is a distinguished name of the OU. And you can see whether or not the account should be enabled once it's created. Okay, so we're gonna use PowerShell to automatically create all of these user accounts. Now this is only 10 users here, but if we were working with 500 or a couple thousand, this would also work, okay? So we can see here on my IPDC01 server, I have the file already saved to my E drive. So if I go to this PC and I go to the data drive or the E drive, we can see that the new users.csv file is located right there. 
Okay, so we could modify the script that we created earlier to create new Active Directory users. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to make a new one. So I'll hit the start button here. And I'm going to open PowerShell. Okay, so here we have the PowerShell ISE. I'm going to select this. So first thing is always we're going to import the Active Directory module. So AD modules. And we're going to say import dash module. Press tab and it should auto complete. It's going a little slow right now. There we go. Import module, active directory. Again, I'll hit tab and auto complete. So we need to get the path to the file that contains the user accounts. In this case, it's new users.csv. So I'm going to make a variable called file path, and it's going to be equal to read dash host. Let me put a space in there. Read dash host. And the prompt is going to be please enter the path to the CSV file that contains the new user accounts. Okay, there we go. All right, and I'm gonna make a comment above saying, get the path to our target CSV file. Okay, now we're gonna import the CSV file to PowerShell. So we're gonna say import the CSV as an array. So basically we're gonna take the file path and we're gonna import it into a new variable that will be able to understand the CSV file structure. So we're gonna make a new variable and we're gonna call it users. And we're gonna say users equals import dash CSV. And the CSV file that we're gonna import is the file path. So let me explain what's going on here. First, we're gathering the file path from the user because they're entering that information. Next, we're taking that file path and we're importing the CSV contents into a variable called users. All right. Now, if this import CSV file wasn't there, we would have to write a function that would import all the first names, all the last names, all the office managers. You would have to keep them all together. But thankfully, that import CSV command will do all of this for us. Okay. So going back to PowerShell, we're just going to execute this command to see if we get any kind of error. So I'm going to hit play. Okay, import the Active Directory module. Now it's saying please the path. It's supposed to be please enter the path to the CSV file that contains the new user accounts. Okay, I'm just going to go up here and say like, please enter. Okay, so I'll fix that typo. So please enter the path. And the path to my CSV file is the E drive and new users.csv. So I'll type that in. E colon backslash. And then we're going to say new users.csv. And now if I press enter, okay, so now the code exits and we're able to import the file as a CSV. Okay, so now we need to do something with that information. And we're going to do that with a for each command. So for each, and then in parentheses, we're going to say user in users. We're going to close the parentheses, we're going to open a brace, and we're going to go down a couple lines and end the brace. All right, so what we're doing is we're saying for each user inside of the user's file, okay? So we have all that information loaded, and now we're going to go row by row and complete an action on each row. All right, so we're saying for each user. So it's going to take this mic, it's going to take Terry, it's going to make all this information accessible for us, and it's going to go one row at a time. So we can do things like create an account with the first name, last name, job title, and all that information, and repeat it for each row inside of the CSV file. And thankfully, the import CSV file is smart enough to detect when you have a header. So it's not going to try and create a user called first name dot last name or anything silly like that. All right. So switching back to our PowerShell command, we're going to make a comment up here. Complete an action for each user in the CSV file. Okay. So for each, and we're going to say, do this for each user. So we can do things like echoing out the usernames. We can create new active director users, which is what we're going to do. But let's start with just echoing out the information. So I'm going to say echo and then user dot. And let's find one of the column names. So if I switch back over here, echo, we're going to say user dot first name. So user dot and then in quotation marks, first space name. Make sure I get that right. Okay. So for each user and users, we're going to echo the user and then we're calling the dot column first name. So if we hit play, you'll see exactly what's going to happen here. So we need to open the CSV file, e slash new users.csv. And it output the first name of every user inside of that CSV file. 
we can see that it starts with Mike and it ends with Ernest. So if we open this, we can see that we're starting with Mike and we're ending with Ernest. Okay, so we can do things like write echo user dot description. And we can see it's auto populating all these things for us. So we're just going to pick description. These are all the columns in the script. Like we have job title, last name, office phone. If we look inside of the CSV file, we can see that we have email address, office phone, job title. So PowerShell is trying to make our lives easier with auto completion by giving us these options. So we can just say description. And you'll notice that it's not wrapped in quotation marks because it does not have a space in the name. First name has a space right here. So we have to wrap it in quotation marks so there won't be any confusion. So if I hit play now and we say enter the path, and we're gonna say new users.csv. We can see that Mike is output and then Mike's description is output next. Okay, so Ernest's description is provide tiers one IT support to, ID, to the IT flea office, which is just random stuff that I made up. Uh, so if we look at the CSV file and we go to Ernest and we look at his description, provides tier one support to the IT flea office. All right, so we can see this is working as we'd expect. So what we're gonna do now Instead of just echoing out this information, we're actually going to create a new user account. So just like before, we're gonna do a new dash ad user. And I'm just gonna add this grave accent. And I'm gonna say dash name. And in parentheses, I'm gonna say user dot first name. And then we're gonna say plus quote, and then we're gonna add a space. So there'll be a space between the first name and the last name. And we're gonna say plus user if i could spell this right user dot last name and then we're going to end the quotation marks and we're going to add a grave accent so the name is going to be the first name and then with a space in between we're going to have the last name so now we'll go and we'll do a dash and we're going to say given name and this will be user this will be user dot first name Add a grave accent, go to the next line, next line, surname, and that's gonna be equal to user dot last name. So where's last, there it is. Okay, now add a grave accent, and we'll go to the next line. And we're gonna say user principal name, using auto completion there. And this is gonna be very similar to this name line, so I'm just gonna copy this. So I'm gonna copy and paste this for the user principal name. And instead of having a space, we're just gonna have a dot, just like that, okay? So now we'll go down to the next line and we're going to say account password. And we're going to say in parentheses convert to dash secure string. And then in quotation marks, we're going to say password just like we, we've done before. Password one, two, three. And then we're going to say as plain text and force. And then we'll close the parentheses and do a grave accent. So account password, convert to secure string, and then we're gonna type in the password characters. We're gonna say as plain text and force. Now, if we do a password that's too simple, it'll be rejected by the domain. So it's important that we make it a secure password, okay? Or make sure the password's compliant with our domain policy. So now we're gonna do the description, and this is gonna be user.description. If you remember, if you take a look at this CSV file, we're just following all of these different uh, columns that we have here. So, so far we've done the first name, we've done the surname, or this is the given name, uh, surname, and we've done the description. Okay, so we're gonna add the grave accent and we're gonna say email address, and that's gonna be user. Okay, so now that I'm looking at this section, it needs to be a lowercase u, it's a bad habit of mine, so go up and make these lowercase u's. Okay, so we got the email address, we're gonna do a grave accent, and we need to do the title. So title is equal to user dot job title. There we go. Do a grave accent, and I'm putting a space in between this grave accent. So make sure you're not just putting the grave accent against the character, it's a space and a grave accent. And we're gonna do the office phone, and that'll be equal to user user dot office phone space and a grave accent. And now we're going to do the path. Now this is the organizational unit path. Um, that's already put into the CSV file. So we're just going to say path 
user.organizational unit. It would be helpful if you name these exactly the same. So instead of calling it name, first name, last name, give call it given name, surname, uh, user principal name, that would be a good idea. That way it's not so confusing. Like path instead of organizational unit, it would make sense in the CSV file. If you named it instead of organizational unit, you named it path, okay? That was a little bit of an oversight on my part, but this is your script and you are free to change it however you want. So we're gonna do change password at logon. We're gonna say one for all these user accounts because that's not represented in our CS. There's no change user at, at password logon. Now you're free to add that in if you would like, but I did not add that to my script. Now we do have the enabled true or false Boolean. So uh, what we need to do is go to our PowerShell and account for that. So by default, remember all the accounts will be disabled. So we're just gonna say enabled. And unfortunately we can't just say user dot enabled because it won't read it as a Boolean like it's supposed to be. So we have to convert it to a Boolean. So we're gonna wrap this inside of parentheses and we're actually gonna do another set of parentheses. So we'll do two sets of parentheses and then right here we're gonna say open brace system dot convert, close the brace. And we're gonna add two colons and we're gonna say two Boolean. Okay, so what this is gonna do is it's gonna convert this string, which it'll be read as a string, this true string, it's gonna convert it to a Boolean so that it will know whether the account is supposed to be enabled or not. All right, so now I think we're ready to go. So what we have to do is hit play and then see if there's any errors with our script. So I'm gonna hit run script and you can see why I'm using this grave accent because otherwise it would just be one extremely long line of text and it's really hard to read. So I'm gonna hit the play button and we're gonna see what happens. So now we have to enter the path to our CSV file. So it's under the E drive and it's called new users csv and we're gonna press enter okay so i had to fix the spelling of system.convert i spelt both of those words wrong so my mistake so now i'm gonna press uh, e backslash new users.csv and i'll press enter and it's creating the user accounts or i hope it is okay so it looks like it created the user accounts and what we're gonna do now is just go inside of active directory so in server manager we're gonna hit tools Active Directory, Users, and Computers. And it's taking us good old time to load, there we go. And now we can see that all the users have been created. So we have Mike Terry, uh, Stan Ken Kenzie, which is not supposed to be enabled, and we can see his account is disabled. And we have Joel Clifton, et cetera. So now we have some user accounts inside of our Active Directory domain. And these were all created off of the CSV file. Okay, so that is how you create users an Active Directory with PowerShell using a CSV file. So I'm gonna save this script, hit save as, I'll save it to the desktop, and we'll call it create AD users from CSV. And I'll hit save. And you can find this script attached under the resources of this lecture. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello, it's Instructor Paul from instructorpaul.com and in this lecture, we're gonna be learning how we can automatically move disabled users to our disabled users organizational unit. This is a little bit of a cleanup script that we're gonna write, and it can come in handy when you have several disabled users. For example, we have three listed here, Conway, Ernest, and Stan. If you have thousands or hundreds of disabled users in your Active Directory domain, and they're not in the disabled users organizational unit, we can write a script that will automatically move them there. Okay, so what we're gonna do is open PowerShell by hitting the start button. We're gonna type in PowerShell and we're gonna open the PowerShell ISE. Okay, I'm gonna hit the script drop down and I'm going to import the Active Directory module. So we'll just state that top. Okay, so import dash module Active Directory. And I'm using tab completion to write that fast. Okay, so first let's list all of the disabled user accounts. So list all disabled AD users. We're gonna do this with the search dash AD account command, okay? And we're gonna use the option account disabled. And we're gonna select dash object. We're gonna select the name and the distinguished name 
which is the actual organizational unit and the name of the user account. So if we click run, so we can see they're all over the place. So we have some in the user's container, some in our user's organizational unit. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move all of these user accounts. So we'll make a new comment and we're gonna say move all disabled AD users to disabled users OU. Okay, and the way we're gonna do this is with the same command, search AD, sorry, search dash AD account, and we're gonna say dash account disabled. And instead of piping this to a select, we're gonna pipe this to a move dash AD object command. All right, and this allows us to take whatever account that we have found, any of these accounts down here, and we can move that object. So we're gonna say move AD object, and we're gonna say target path. And then in quotation marks, we're gonna enter the distinguished name of the organizational unit we want to move these users to. So I'm gonna do this in Active Directory. I'm gonna select disabled users. First, I need to make sure advanced features is on under view. So view, enable advanced features. Next, I'm gonna select disabled users by right clicking and choosing properties. Okay, now we're looking for the attribute editor here and we're looking for the distinguished name. So I'm gonna double click on the distinguished name, right click and I'll choose copy. I'll click okay, and I'll close out of this window. So going back to PowerShell, okay, so now we're gonna paste in that path here. So right click and choose paste. And what we're doing is we're selecting all of the Active Directory user accounts, we're finding all of them rather. So we have all these user accounts here, and then we're gonna move all those user accounts to the target path, which is the disabled users organizational unit. Okay, so you can use these, these little searches to complete actions by just piping them to other commands. So what I'm gonna do now is hit the run script. Okay, so now if we open Active Directory and we refresh our disabled users OU, we can see now that all of our disabled user accounts have been disabled, okay? So another thing that we could do, is say for example, we have a user that's been placed in the disabled users organizational unit, but the account is not disabled. So if I take, for example, Ridley Quinn, and I move that to the disabled users organizational unit, but I forgot to disable the user account, see here it's not disabled, we can also make this script disable user accounts that are inside of the disabled users OU. So I'm gonna run a CLS here. So let's make a comment, disable all users in the disabled users OU. Okay, so we're gonna say, so we're gonna say get dash AD user, and there's a million different ways that you can do this. I'm gonna say filter, we're gonna say enabled equals true. So any, new, any enabled user accounts, and we're gonna say the search base is gonna be the same as this target path here, so we're gonna select this target path. Okay, so we're selecting all of the users that are inside of this disabled users OU and are enabled. So if I pipe this to a select dash object and I just type in the name here, and I'm just gonna go ahead and comment out all of these uh, code above. So if I just click play, we can see that we are selecting the account Ridley Quinn because it's in the disabled users OU and it's enabled. So instead of piping this to a select object, we need to pipe this to a disable dash AD account. Okay, so now if we hit run, we can see that we disabled the Active Directory user account. So if I go back here and I hit refresh, Ridley Quinn is now disabled. Okay, so one thing that I wanna mention is that we're running this command search AD account and we're just saying if the account is disabled, move it to this OU. Well, what about the accounts that are disabled and already are in the OU? We're kind of completing actions that don't need to be taken. So what we need to do is in here add another pipe and we need to exclude that organizational unit. And we can do that by typing in the command where, and then an open brace, and we're gonna say, we're gonna use the dollar sign, underscore, and a dot for referencing the current object, and we're gonna say distinguished, distinguished name, dash not like, and then we're gonna paste in star, and we're gonna grab this disabled users, OU. So we'll grab dis OU equals disabled users. And then we're gonna add star after that and then quotation marks. So we're grabbing any disabled user account where the, user, where the distinguished name 
does not contain or is not like the OU equals disabled users, okay? So now we will execute this code again. Oh, and then we need to close the brace, okay? So now we're gonna execute this code again and we're moving any user account that's not like this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna drag some of these accounts into domain users just to test this. Okay, so now we're gonna execute the code and it says it completed, so I'm gonna refresh and we can see those accounts were moved back in. So that's how we can create a little bit of an Active Directory cleanup script where we're listing all of our disabled users, we're moving all the disabled users to the disabled users OU and we're disabling all users inside of the disabled users organizational unit. So if someone moves someone in here and forgets to disable it, this script will take care of that. Okay, so now I'm gonna save this script and we're gonna call it AD disabled user cleanup. And I'll hit save. And we could set this up to be a scheduled task and run every night if we would like, or you know, every couple hours, whatever you would prefer. But this script can be very useful for cleaning up your Active Directory domain. And I'm hoping I'm giving you ideas and principles that you can use for other things that you might wanna run inside of your Active Directory domain. So great job getting through this lecture. I enjoyed making it for you and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hello there, this is Instructor Paul. And in this lecture, we're gonna expand our PowerShell script that creates user accounts from our comma separated value files. Now I received a message from one of my students and he wanted to create users on a first initial last name basis. So instead of using what we did, first name dot last name here, you can see that right here, he wants to do the first initial and then the last name of the user account. Additionally, he might have a scenario where he has Paul Hill and Patrick Hill. Now they would both have the same username, P Hill. He wanted to be able to append a number to the end of the username so that he can create the accounts for both users and they'll still both have unique usernames. I'm gonna show you how to do this. I figured instead of just responding to his message one-on-one -on -one or, or on, even if I had him post it on the discussion board, I figured a video lecture is better. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna walk you guys through this and we're just gonna expand the script that we already have. Okay, and the way that we're gonna do this, we're gonna write two functions. So I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna declare a function and we're gonna call this verify with a uh, lowercase verify verify and then an uppercase username. Okay, and we're gonna accept username as a variable that we pass through the function. And we're gonna write another function, and this is going to be called username taken. And we're gonna pass username. Okay, so we have these two functions. Now let's, let's write comments about what these are supposed to do. So this first function is going to see if a username is already in use. If it is, then return the number that should be appended to the end of the name. To the end of the name. Else, return an empty string. And I'm gonna make this go down a new line. There we go, we'll just make it easy to read. Okay, so we're gonna see if the username is already in use, whatever we pass to this function here. If the username is in use, then this function is going to return a number. So in our example, if we have Patrick Hill and P Hill, so if we created P Hill first and then we're trying to create Patrick Hill, we wanna append a one to Patrick Hill's user account. So it'd be P Hill one for Patrick Hill. Okay, now if the user account is not in use, for example, Paul Hill, then we're not gonna return anything. We're gonna return an empty string so that nothing will be appended to the username. All right, now before we write these functions here, we're gonna have to do a little bit of work up here at the top. So let's go ahead and declare a couple variables. First thing we wanna do is we're gonna do account number. Okay, and that's gonna be equal to, we'll write that in a second. The next variable we're gonna declare is the username. All right, and that's gonna be equal to, uh, we'll, and we'll write that in just a second. So first, this account number is going to call this function verify username. So I'm just gonna copy that, come up here and paste that. And we're going to pass the first name and last name, okay? So I'm just gonna copy this name here and then we'll just edit it instead of typing it out, okay? Now we'll get rid of this space because we don't need that space. So what we're gonna have here is you, first name, plus last name. Now remember, we're gonna be working on a first initial 
and then last name basis. So let me give you a little tip here. So down here in the bottom, we're going to do F name and we're going to say my first name is Paul. We'll use my information here. I'm going to press enter and I'm going to declare last name is equal to Hill. Okay. Now if we say echo and then in parentheses, we say F name, let's go down here, select F name plus, and then we do L name and then close parentheses, we get Paul Hill. Now, if I want to get the first initial of that name, the easiest way to do that is to do a square open brace and then put the zero and then a closing square, square brace. What that's going to do is get the first string in this character or in this, this variable. So if I press enter now, now we get P Hill. And I could change that number to get the second, which would be P-A-U-L, so it would be P-A. So I could get the A, so it would be A Hill. Um, I could get you know U if I wanted to. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use this to get the very first initial or the first letter of my name, which would be my first initial. So now we have P Hill. And then we're going to combine this with like a one or a two or a three, you know, depending on how many users there are. Okay, so the username is going to be equal to, again, we're going to go ahead and copy this line up here, this first name plus last name. Uh, also, we're up here, we're going to put in that zero. So we're doing the first initial of the first name, not the whole first name. So I'm going to copy this line and I'm going to go username and I'm going to paste that. And then we're going to say plus and we're going to do the account number variable. So plus account number. Okay, so the username will be, you know, first initial, if I pass Paul.Hill or Paul Hill rather, it'll be P. This section will represent P. This section will represent Hill. And this will represent the number that my username needs to have on the end so that it doesn't create a duplicate account. Okay, now real quick, we need to update this code down here. And the name here is also going to be exactly the same, almost exactly the same as this. So we're going to have the first name plus a space. And we're going to copy the space here, plus the last name. And then we're going to put in plus account number. Okay, because you can't have a duplicate name just like you can't have a duplicate username down here. All right, now we're going to replace this line here. This, instead of putting in first name dot last name, we're just going to replace that with username. So we'll go down here. So user principal name is going to be equal to the username. And the username is going to be created up here. Now, one thing that you want to do is not only define the user principal name like we have in the past, you also want to define the SAM account name. So I'm going to copy this line and paste it, and I'm going to change this to SAM account name. And the reason for this is that when you create a user account in Active Directory, by default, you know, if you use the GUI, it's going to enter the SAM account name. Now, like before, when we were using PowerShell, we only defined the user principal name, and this was left blank. So it's a good idea just to define both of these variables and setting the username for both of these when you're creating an account with PowerShell. I'll show you an example here. If I right click and I say new user and I'm under instructorpaul.com and my instructor Paul OU and domain users, if I say new user and I create P or Paul Hill and I call it P Hill for my username and I click next and I'll just make a password here really fast. Okay, and I'll say user must next uncheck that checkbox, hit finish. Okay, so if I double click on this, uh, really fascinating to make sure action under view, advanced features. This needs to be enabled to be able to do what I'm about to do. So I'm gonna double click on this user and I'm gonna go to the attribute editor. And if we type in the user principal name, so right here we can see it's P Hill at Instructor Paul. Now the SAM account name is just P Hill. So if we're searching for P Hill, you know, and we created this user account using the user principal name and not the same account name, this will be defined as not set, all right? So we're gonna go back to our PowerShell here, and I think we're about ready to move on down to these functions and complete these functions. So what we're gonna do is under verify name, we're gonna set an initial variable for i. So i is gonna represent the number that we're gonna to add to the end of our username. Now remember, this function is the only goal of this function is to see if a username is in use. If it is, return the number that should be appended to the username. So what should be added to the end of the name? If nothing is, or if the username is not in use, we want to return a blank string or something like this. And I can just elaborate on this. So example, p hill, p hill one, p hill two, etc. 
okay? So we're either going to return a number, like one, two, three, four, five, whatever, or we're gonna return an empty string, which would make our username look exactly like this. All right, so i is equal to one. Now we're gonna write an if statement, and we're gonna say, see if username is taken. Or in use, okay. So we're gonna say if, and we're gonna call this function down here, username taken. So if username taken, and we're gonna pass the username that we're checking. So if this is equal to true, this username is taken, then what we need to do is run a while loop. So we're gonna say while username taken, I gotta make sure I spell that right, otherwise it won't work. While username is taken is equal to, oops, we need to write username is equal to true. Okay, repeat this. And what we're gonna repeat is incrementing i. If I can type that right, there we go. Okay, now let me elaborate on what we're doing here. So what we're doing is we're running a check to say if the username is in use or if it's already taken, which is the function we haven't written down here yet but this is gonna return a true or false based on whether that user already exists. And it's just gonna be a get ad user query that we're gonna run. And then if we find a match, we'll say, hey, that user already in use, you can't use it. So if that happens, if it's equal to true and that user already exists, then we need to increment i. And that little, if you're not familiar, we define i equals one like we're doing up, up here at the top of the code. If we say i equals one, we can echo i. Again, there's my keyboard not wanting to work. So we can echo i and that outputs one down here in the bottom left. Now, if we type in the command i plus plus, that's gonna increment one by one. So now if I echo i, it's equal to two. And I can type that again and it's gonna equal three, okay? So what we're doing is essentially we're incrementing the number that we're gonna add to the end of the username because that user's still in use. Okay, so now what we're gonna do under this if statement, we're gonna write else and we're gonna say, return quote quote or an empty string so if the username is is taken then we're going to increment i and we're going to try and use that if it's not taken we're going to return you know just an empty string all right and this loop is going to break once once we've looped or once we found a username that is not taken all right so once we we find p hill 3 or p hill 4 you know it's not in use then what we need to do also real quick, we need, to, we need to add the I to the end of this, so plus I. So while username taken, let me get rid of that there, that doesn't belong there. Okay, sorry about that. So while username taken and then username plus I is equal to true, we're gonna increment I and then else return blank. And then once it breaks this loop, it says, hey, I found a username that is not used to P hill three or P hill four, we're going to return the number I, okay? So again, if you remember, the whole point of this function is to see if a username is in use. If it is, return the number that should be appended to the end of the name, which is this line right here. Okay, if the username is not in use, return an empty string, which is gonna be completed right here, all right? Really, I think we could probably put this return i up here inside of this else statement, but I'm just gonna leave it down there because I'm not too worried about that. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is comment that for this function and we're gonna say check to see if username already exists, all right? And we're gonna run a couple tests. The first thing we're gonna do is we'll just call it test one and then we're gonna write test two. Oops, test two. Okay, so test one is equal to get ad user. And we're gonna say filter and then we're gonna do an open brace and we're gonna say user principal name. Make sure I spell this right. Principal name is equal to, and then we're gonna say username. And we're gonna do the closing brace there. And we're gonna copy this. Uh, let me fix that right there. I didn't mean to press enter. Let's copy this little line of code right here and we'll put it down on the next line. And we're gonna change this to Sam account name. Okay, so if I copy this line of code right here, and I just paste it down here below. And if I change this to, in quotation marks, P Hill, and press enter, I can echo test two. And I can see that I was able to find Paul Hill or P Hill. Now, if I run that again and I look for P Hill one, and if I try to echo test two, 
and press enter, it returns nothing. So and essentially it wasn't able to find that user account. This is how we're going to determine if the user account exists. So up here under this function, what we need to do is write an if statement. So we're going to say if test one is equal to null, and I'm using a capital N there, and we're going to say and test two, I need to make sure I spell this stuff right. My keyboard is kind of, we're going to blame it on the keyboard. Of course, it's not the user. It's definitely the keyboard. So test one and and test two is equal to null. Then we're going to return false. So we're going to say this user account is not in use. And then we're going to close this with a brace here. And we're going to say else return true. Okay. So let's go ahead and test this function by dragging, selecting the entire function, right clicking and choosing copy. Now we're going to come down to the blue code here and we're going to right click and choose paste and we're going to press enter. Okay, so now we can run this function. So I'm going to expand this a little bit so we can see what's going on here. So we're going to type in username taken and then in quotes I'm going to say phill and I'm going to press enter. Okay, and I messed up again. We need to do a capital F and let's just move that cursor so you can see. We need to do the dollar sign and a capital F. So it's dollar sign, capital T, and then true, and then capital sign, or um, dollar sign, and then capital false, with the first letter being capital. So I'm gonna write, I'm gonna recopy this. And that's why it's good to just run your code down here in the bottom, because you catch little mistakes like that. So, okay, we're gonna run username taken, P Hill. And we can see that it returned true. So it thinks that P Hill is already in use. And we know that it is in use because I'm looking at the account right there and we just made it. So now if we try phill1, it returns false. Okay, so now we have a good way of testing of whether our user accounts have been created um, or not, or whether they're not in use. So I think we're about ready to run this script now. So let me just double check everything here. Let's just run over everything really fast. I'm gonna save this at the top. Okay, so we're, this is all the same. We haven't changed anything here. We have our account number, uh, which is going to be equal to this verify username. And our verify username is returning this interval or this variable called I, or it's returning a blank string. So this, this variable could end up being nothing, but we're still appending it to the end of our name. All right. So down here under name, we're updating this because you cannot have duplicate names, just like you can't have duplicate usernames. So we're having first name, space, last name, space, account number. Then we're going to have given name, first name, you know, surname. That's all the same. And then we're going to have username, which is first name and the first initial or the first character of the first name. We have last name and then the account number. Then we have, we're declaring the uh, user principal name and the SAM account name. Okay. And that's all that we have changed so far. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hit the play button and I'm going to type in the path to our CSV file. So it's new users.csv and I'm going to press enter. Okay. So now I'll go over to Active Directory and I'm going to hit F5. And we can see that the user accounts have been created. So we have Clyde, Braden, and if I open this account and I go to account, we can see that it's using first initial, last name, so C, Braden. Now, if we run the script again and we do the same path, new users.csv, it should append a one to all of those usernames. So now we're gonna open Active Directory and we're gonna hit refresh. And now we can see that we have two Clyde Braden. So Clyde Braden one, and if I double click on this and go to account, we can see we have C, Braden one. Now let's just for fun run it one more time and see if we end up with Clyde Braden 2 new users.csv press enter and refresh and it's not working off the F5 so I'm going to right click and let's see how I can do this there we go I had to click over here on the left and hit F5 so now I have Clyde Braden 2 so if I hit account I can see that it appended a 2 to the username all right so that is how you would switch the usernames to first initial dot last name and how you would append a number to the end of the script. So these functions are really, really useful. You can see that instead, I could have really done this in one function, but it was just easier for me to write this username taken function and then call it a bunch of times while I'm looping through these, these intervals. So hopefully you found this lecture useful. I hope it taught you some more about PowerShell and working with Active Directory. I sure did enjoy making it for you and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next lecture. In this lecture, you will learn how you can use Windows Server Backup to safely backup your Active Directory data. Having and maintaining Active Directory backups is a critical aspect of administrating your network. It's very important that you take proper backups and that you understand how to restore those backups 
should a catastrophic failure occur. So in this lecture, you'll be learning how to create the backups. So what we're gonna do is in Server Manager, we're gonna click Tools, and we're gonna go down to Windows Server Backup. Now, if you don't have this installed, you can quickly install this by clicking Manage, Add Rules and Features. Then when you get to the Features page, you're gonna go down to the bottom, and you're going to install the Windows Server Backup feature. This will not require a reboot, and you should already be familiar with this as this was covered in the previous module uh, for Windows Server. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that I have a shared drive created on this server, on the C drive, called Backups. So if I go backslash, backslash, SADC01, I can go to slash backups, and I can store the backups inside of this folder. Just to demonstrate where this is located, go back to the C drive, and I'll open the backups folder, and I can see that new text document that I just created. So the way that Windows Server Backup works is that it wants to either use an entire drive on your local computer that is attached to your local computer, this server only has the C drive, so what we're going to do is use a network share, which is the alternative, and that network share will be this backups folder. Okay, so I'm going to select tools and open Windows Server Backup. You'll want to wait until it loads, and then once the load is complete, right click on local backup and choose either backup once or backup schedule. Now, if you're in a production network, I really recommend that you set up a backup schedule. However, since we're in a test lab environment, I'm only going to say backup once. Now we don't have a schedule backup created, so we're just gonna say different options and we'll click next. We're gonna say custom because we don't wanna back up the full server. All we really wanna back up is our Active Directory. So I'll click next and we're gonna select add items. And to back up Active Directory, we need to choose the system state. Now we'll click okay and we're gonna click next. So now we need to choose where we want to store the destination file. Now we could choose a local hard drive if we had one attached. If I try to select this option and I click next, it'll say it cannot create a uh, backup because there are no backup storage locations available. So it wants us to create another partition or add another disk, uh, which we don't have at this time. So we're just gonna say remote shared folder and we can kind of bypass this uh, safety check by using a remote shared folder that's on the C drive. So the location is gonna be SADC01 backslash and then it auto completes for me. We're gonna choose backups. Now under access control, I'm just gonna leave it at inherit to inherit the uh, security permissions of this folder. I'll click next and I will click back up. So now we just need to wait for the backup to complete. So go ahead and take a break. I expect this will take anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. We'll go ahead and wait for that to complete and we'll come back when it's ready. Okay, so our backup is now complete. Here I can see that uh, we have another backup schedule from March 31 at 9 p.m. This is all just stuff that I had created before I started this lecture. Um, additionally, you'll see that I have a total of two backups. That's because I ran a backup before. Uh, the oldest copy was from uh, 6-7-2019. Um, the latest copy was the one that I just ran today on March 31. So what we can do now is open Windows Explorer and we can go to the C drive and I can go to backups and I can open the Windows image backup folder. I have SADC01 and the backup that was created on this date, okay? So this is where our backups are located. If I just go back here and right click on the folder and go to properties, I can see that it's 8.19 gigabytes. So that is how you can back up your Active Directory infrastructure with Windows backup. I hope you enjoyed that lecture. Great job getting through it and I will see you in the next one. In this lecture, you're going to learn how you can restore an Active Directory system state backup following a catastrophic failure of your server, or maybe just someone goes into Active Directory and blows a bunch of stuff up. In this lecture, you're going to learn how you can restore one of your backups that we created earlier. So to get started, what I'm going to do in Active Directory, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just delete this organizational unit. Okay, so I need to do as much damage to this as I can. So first thing I'm going to do is turn on advanced features. And I'm going to go to Server Academy, and I'm just going to start removing all of the protections. So I'm going to Object, Protect from Accidental Deletion. I'm going to uncheck that and click OK. I'm going to repeat that for all these other organizational units as well. OK, so now what I'm going to do is right-click this OU, and I'm just going to delete it. So I'll say, yes, I want to delete it. And we're going to say, use subtree server control. And I'll say, yes. And we just blew away the entire organizational unit that holds all the infrastructure, all the users, all the computers for our domain, uh, not including our domain controllers. And uh, that doesn't matter too much. But we just created a big problem for ourselves. None of our user accounts can now log in. And we're going to have a big headache because we'd have to go back in, try and recreate that OU uh, structure. 
and it's just going to be a lot of work that you probably won't be able to do very successfully. So thankfully we've taken a backup, so what we need to do now is go ahead and restore that backup. So we have to boot the server in DSRM mode or directory services restore mode. So we can do that a couple different ways. First, we could just reboot the server and keep button mashing F8 until we get to the, uh, the boot menu, then we can select DSRM, or we can hit start and type in msconfig, and we can open system configuration. We can go to boot, we can say safe boot and active directory repair, then we can click OK, and we'll say we want to reboot. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and restart the server since I have physical access, and I can just keep button, button mashing F8. So I'm going to hit restart, and from the moment the screen goes black, I'm going to start pressing F8 on the keyboard. Okay, so now I'm pressing F8 repeatedly on my keyboard. As you might not actually see the prompt, but then we'll get to this advanced boot options. We're going to go all the way down to directory services repair mode, and I'll press enter. All right, so now I'm back at the login screen. You'll notice that there's a little disconnect uh, icon here in the bottom. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and hit control delete. And by default, I was using a domain administrator account. However, if I try to log into this, I'm gonna get an error saying there's no logon servers available. We need to use the local administrator account. Okay. So I'm gonna do dot backslash administrator. And you can see now that it says signing into SADC01. That's the name of this local server. So now I'll type in the password and I'm going to click the next arrow and it's going to allow me to log in. Right away we can see that we're booting into safe mode. So what I'm going to do is just wait for the server to finish loading up. Okay, so now we're going to launch command prompt. So let's hit the start button and let's go to Windows system and we're going to select command prompt. And let's use the WB admin command and we're going to say get versions. And this is going to list all of the updates that we have on our server. It'll take just a minute. And here we can see the two backups that I've run against the server, one in 2019, and then one that I ran earlier today on March 31. So what we need to do is copy this version identifier. So I'm just gonna select it. And this is the version that I want, March 21 at the time that I want. So once we have it copied, we're gonna run another command, WB admin. We're gonna say start system state recovery. We're gonna say dash version. And I'm gonna highlight this version and right click two times and that will paste it in there. And we can say dash auth sys vol. So this is important if you have multiple domain controllers, it will set our uh, sys vol as the authoritative sys vol. Okay, so if you're doing replication or you're dealing with replication, you have multiple domain controllers, you'll wanna run this command. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and press enter. Now it's gonna say, are you sure you want to start the state recovery option? I'm gonna say yes, press enter. Now it's just letting us know that, hey, we might lose network connectivity. Right now we do have an uh, internet access, but we may lose that during the recovery. So it's important that you have a tunneled connection if at all possible, or a way to actually access the physical server. Uh, in this case, I'm just gonna say yes, continue. And it's saying it will cause all replicated content uh, to resynchronize after recovery. This is just letting us know there's gonna be a lot of network traffic, all right? Um, so it's just saying we could cause latency or outages issues depending on the size of our Active Directory. Are you sure you want to do this? We're going to say yes. Obviously, you ideally want to do this kind of recovery out of regular business hours. So you'd want to do this overnight or on a weekend. I'm going to say yes. Now it's just letting us know that, hey, it can't be paused or canceled once it's started and it will need to restart the server. Again, I'm going to say yes and I'm going to press enter. So now that the actual backup is taking place, so now we need to just wait. And uh, this is not gonna be a particularly fast process, just like creating the backup wasn't very fast. I expect this to take anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. And this is just on my little test network. So if you have a larger Active Directory, you can expect it to take longer. So I'm just gonna speed up this video so you guys don't have to sit here through this, but we'll come back once it's done. Okay, so here we can see that it says the recovery of the system state successfully completed on and then it has today's date. And then it has a log here under the uh, Windows logs, Windows Server Backup, System Restore, and then today's date. So it says we need to restart to complete the operation. And then it just lets us know that we should wait while the system state recovery operation attempts to recover system files. Now it's saying that this could take a few minutes. So when we reboot the server, it's going to take a little bit longer before it's done. Also, keep in mind that if you used msconfig to configure the server to boot into Active Directory Restore mode, you're going to want to go back, open msconfig, and undo that setting before you restart the server.
So I'm going to say yes, and now we just need to wait for the system to successfully recover all the files. Okay, so the backup is now complete, so I'm going to go ahead and press Control Delete, and I'm going to log back into my server. Now you'll notice right away I'm using the domain administrator account, and I have connectivity to the internet. So when we boot up the server, we get this message from command prompt just saying the system state recovery operation started at 331 has successfully completed. So I'm just going to close this. So let's go ahead and open Active Directory and let's see if the OUs and the user accounts that I destroyed earlier have now been restored. So I'm going to expand Active Directory local and I can see right away the OU is still here. So if I go here and just for example open users, I can see that those user accounts have been indeed restored to the Active Directory. So that is how you would go about restoring a system state backup of your Active Directory servers. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I will see you in the next one. Hello, my name is Paul and I will be your instructor for this course. I want to give you a brief introduction so you know a little bit more about me and what I've been working on the past few years. I've been working as a system administrator for the past seven years in the U.S. I began my career as a volunteer systems administrator. Basically, I worked in exchange for experience, not for money. And while some would not agree to such an arrangement, it was the best opportunity I had at the time. And it turned out to be a good decision because it led to a part-time job that eventually led to a full-time job. My primary strengths are in the Windows family, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, although I do have experience with the free flavors like Ubuntu, and Cisco switches. Now for those of you who don't know, a systems administrator is a professional who manages IT resources, meaning information technology resources. It could be physical servers, virtual servers, desktops, or other IT related gear. A systems administrator is also often in charge of building and maintaining all IT related operations. And many times I'm given a set of requirements and asked to build a network accordingly. So they might say, you know, we need to have five servers, three switches, and they need to operate in this function, and I will build it out for them and deliver it to them. So now let's talk about what can you expect from this course. I'm going to give you solid experience that you can add to your resume. You're going to gain knowledge that will stand up in an interview. And what I mean by that, I'm not teaching you abstract concepts that don't apply in the field. What you'll learn in this course will be strong talking points, and it's going to aid you on your job interviews. You're going to sound like you know what you're talking about because you will know what you're talking about. Okay, so this is knowledge and experience that will help you level up your career and advance to the next level. Throughout this course, we are going to cover Active Directory and Group Policy Basics. And in these early sections, I'm going to assume that you know nothing about either of these tools. After you learn the basics, we're going to learn how to use these tools to manage your workstations. This includes deploying software remotely, which will come in very handy when you come to a situation where you have a few thousand computers and they all need software installed. You can do that remotely through group policy, and I'm going to show you how to do that. We're also going to cover a few ways you can use group policy and Active Directory to secure your domain. We're also going to cover a scenario where you have two projects within your company, and each project needs their own share drive, and they need to be separate from each other and secure from each other. So project A can't access the files for project B, and vice versa. So we're covering a lot of information in this course and it's very condensed. So if you have any questions, you're free to ask me at any time. Now you'll notice there's a discussion board and I expect you to at least ask one question per section on the board, at least one question. Unless I'm on travel, I always get back to my students as fast as I can. Usually it's within an hour, sometimes it's longer, but definitely you're free to post on the discussion board. You can also send me a private message, although I prefer the discussion board because there may be other students that also had the same question. The last thing I would like to say is please don't forget to leave a review on the course. Whenever a student leaves a review, it comes straight to my iPhone and it always makes my day when someone has something positive to say. Now with that being said, if you find some problems and you think something needs to be fixed, send me a private message and we'll address the issue. So that is all we need to cover before we begin. Let's get to work and start learning. Active Directory Users and Computers is a directory service that operates on Windows domain controllers and can be installed on most copies of Windows Server. Active Directory handles user access and authorization to domain and domain resources. It stores user account information, computer information, printer information, share drive information, general permissions, and much more. Now what you need to know is how to start Active Directory. And this is simple. First you need to start Server Manager. So you can either click on the Server Manager icon in the bottom left corner of your screen, or if you don't see it there, you can click the Windows icon and type in Server Manager. Select the appropriate icon that appears. Now select Tools, Active Directory, Users, and Computers. 
All right, so now we can see all the objects that are in our domain and continue on to the other lectures in this section and I'll be teaching you much more about Active Directory users and computers. An organizational unit, often referred to as OU, is a subdivision that holds objects such as user accounts, computer accounts, groups, and they can also have their own respective group policy objects applied to them. In this case, we're going to create the OU right under the domain. So right click on the domain and select New Organizational Unit. Now you need to type in a name. In this case, I'm going to use the name Test1. Ensure Protect Container from Accidental Deletion is checked and click OK. Now we can see our new OU has been created. If we want, we could create an additional OU underneath our newly created OU, but that's fine for now. I think you get the idea. There may come a time we need to rename an OU, and this is really simple. So all you need to do is right click on the OU and select Rename. Type in your new name and press Enter. And you can see there that it changed the name. You will also need to delete OUs from time to time. In order to delete an OU that is not protected, simply right click on the OU and select delete. Choose yes at the prompt. Now since our OU is protected from accidental deletion, we're receiving an error saying we don't have sufficient privileges or it's under protection. So in order to delete the OU, we need to remove protection. Now to remove the protection, we need to enable advanced features. So select view, Advanced Features, and now right click on the OU that we want to delete, select Properties, choose the Object tab, and uncheck the box which reads Protect Object from Accidental Deletion. Click OK, and now right click on the OU and select Delete. Now we can see the OU has been deleted. So that's all you need to know about OUs. I will see you in the next lecture and let's keep on working. A container in Active Directory can hold objects such as user accounts, computer accounts, or groups. They are installed by default and cannot be deleted or renamed. You cannot apply group policy objects or GPOs to containers and you cannot create a container. Let's look at some examples. Start Server Manager and select Tools, Active Directory, Users and Computers. Under the root domain we can identify our containers by viewing the property type under Active Directory. If the object is labeled container, you know this is one of the objects that comes with Active Directory by default. Let's sort by type by clicking at the top of the pane. The containers that are installed by default are as follows. Computers, Foreign Security Principles, Managed Service Accounts, and Users. The Computers container is used when a new computer joins your domain. By default, the new computer will be placed into this container. The Foreign Security Principles container is used for trust between external domains. We won't be joining any external domains, so we will not see this container used. The Manage Service Accounts container holds virtual accounts. And virtual accounts are managed local accounts that can access network resources. The Users container holds additional default user and group accounts and tie into the built-in object type. Now there's another type of object called built-in. This object is very similar to containers in that it is created by default and has the same limitations as mentioned before. This object holds all the required security groups for your domain. You cannot delete any of the groups that are inside of this container because they are all required by the domain. Now that wraps up our lecture on the object types container and built-in, so I will see you in the next lecture. Creating a user account in Active Directory is the most basic task you'll need to complete if you're a help desk professional or system administrator. To begin, we select the OU in which we want the user account to reside. I'm going to choose a custom OUs I've created called Managed Users, Domain Users. If these OUs do not exist for you, feel free to create them or just choose another OU. However, do not place the users under the user's container as we want the ability to apply GPOs to the OU in which we place the user. Right click on the OU and select New, User. Type in the first name middle initial, if you have it, last name, and user logon name. Every company will have their own preference on the username format. I'm going to use first initial and last name. Select next and type in your password. If you are creating the account for another user, make sure you leave the user must change password at next logon box checked so they cannot continue to use the temporary password you created. Select next and click finish. We can view the account inside the OU we selected. Right click on the account and select properties. If you would like, you can enter information to the various fields and tabs 
but it is not required in order for the account to be functional. Click OK, and that's all we need to do to create an account in Active Directory. There will be times when you need to locate an object in Active Directory, whether it's a user account, computer account, or organizational unit, but you may not know exactly where to look. Now, this may not be a problem if your domain is pretty simple, but if you have a huge enterprise with several hundred OUs, it's a real problem. Thankfully, Active Directory users and computers has a search feature. To do this, we select the Find Objects button at the top of our window. The first thing that we need to do is decide what we're looking for. Is it a computer, a user, a group? etc. Select the Find drop-down list and choose the appropriate option. Let's choose Users, Contacts, and Groups. Next we need to decide where we want to search. So we can search in particular OUs or particular domains, etc. If you know which OU the object resides in, select Browse and select the appropriate OU. Active Directory will search this OU and all sub-OUs. And this also applies to domains if you have multiple domains and you know the account resides on this domain, or you know, domain A or domain B, then you can select that domain and it will search all the objects, all the OUs underneath that domain. If you have no idea where the object may be located, select entire directory from the in drop-down list. Next, we need to type in information into the name or description field that relates to the object we're searching for. Since we're searching for a user account, we can type in the first name of the user in the name text box and select find now. You can see that it lists the user in the search results box below. You can also type in a partial name and still find the account as long as you've entered the first few characters correctly. For example, you cannot type MMY and find the user account with the name Jimmy. You can also find all object types you want if you leave the name text box empty. Remove the text and select Find Now. Now we see all the users, contacts, and groups that we have in our directory. Now this applies to any object type that we happen to be looking for, whether it's users, contacts, and groups, or computers, or printers, and so forth. So that's how you find objects in Active Directory. Great job, and I'll see you in the next lecture. To reset a user's password in Active Directory, the first thing we need to do is find the account. We can search for the account by searching for the user's first name or last name or description of his account, or we can navigate to the OU where the account is located. I'm going to search for the user account for Jimmy Martin. Now right click on the account and select Reset Password. Type in a new password and check all the boxes that apply. Take note of the account lockout status. If your domain has a policy where three failed login attempts will lock an account, You'll need to check this box to allow anyone to log in the account even if they have the correct password. In this case, the account is not locked so we do not need to check this box. Click OK and notice the pop-up that declares the password has been changed. That's all you need to do to reset a password in Active Directory. Many times when you are tasked to create a new user account, you need to add the user to a specific group. Groups can be set up to give users different permissions throughout the domain. For example, adding a user to the Domain Administrators group will give them Domain Administrator privileges, and so forth. To add a user to a group, right-click on the user and select Properties. Select the Member Of tab and choose Add. Type in the name of the group you would like to add the user to. I'm going to choose a group that I created in a previous course named Group B, and I'm going to search by the keyword group. If I type the exact group name, then the selection will be made automatically. Since I only typed group, I'm presented with the groups that match my query. I will select group B and click OK. Notice now the group is listed in the member of pane. Now let's navigate to the group B object and view the members. Click the find objects in Active Directory domain services and search for group B under the entire directory. Right click Group B and select Properties. Choose the Members tab and notice that Jimmy Martin is now listed as a group member. You can also add users from this window by clicking Add and searching for the user you would like to add. It works exactly the same as the way that we added Jimmy to Group B. That wraps up our lesson on managing user account memberships. I will see you in the next lecture. To disable a user account, simply right click on the account and select Disable Account. Click OK at the prompt. You'll notice the icon of the user account changes to reflect the account's new condition. Accounts cannot be logged into while they are disabled. Most of the time companies will have a special OU for disabled user accounts. I have created such an OU underneath the root domain. Now drag the user to the disabled users OU if you have one and if you don't just go ahead and create the organizational unit. 
Select yes when you are prompted to confirm your choice. This account is fully disabled and has been moved into the disabled user's OU. The reason why we move the user into the other OU is because we can apply special policies inside of that OU that will not allow the user to log in even if the account is not disabled. It's a second layer of security in case the administrator forgets to disable the account. If we wish to re-enable the account, we would right click on the account and select enable and then we would move the account back into the other OU. If you wish to delete an account, right click on the account and select delete. Select yes at the prompt. The account is now deleted from your domain. Now if you delete an account, there's no way to undo that action. So be sure that you're supposed to delete the account. Nine times out of ten you just want to disable an account and move it into the disabled users OU. But just know that there's no undo action for deleting a user account in Active Directory. All right, I'll see you in the next lecture. Group policy is part of the Microsoft Server features that are installed when Active Directory domain services is installed on the server. Group policy provides centralized management of computers, applications, and users. With the Group Policy Management Console, you can control who can access what files on your network, what people can visit what websites, what programs can be installed on your computer, desktop backgrounds, registry settings, and much, much more. Active Directory and Group Policy work hand-in-hand -hand to control and secure a domain and is essential to any Windows environment. To start Group Policy Management, open Server Manager and select Tools, Group Policy Management. Here you can manage all the GPOs that are in your domain. In a few of the following lectures, we'll delve more into GPOs and configuring the settings, so I'll see you there. A group policy object contains settings that can be applied to users and computers in Active Directory. In order for a GPO to affect objects, they need to be linked to a particular OU. Right-click on the OU you would like to link the new GPO and select Create a GPO in this domain and link it here. Type in a name for your new GPO and click OK. You can now see the new GPO has been created and is linked to the corresponding OU. To edit a GPO, right-click on the GPO and select Edit. We'll get more into editing GPOs later, so go ahead and close this window for now. You can also set a GPO to be enforced. To do this, right-click on the GPO and select Enforced. This will cause the GPO to take precedence over other GPOs if they both configure the same setting. Now I'll explain this in a lot more detail later on. For now, right click on the GPO and turn off Enforced. If you need to remove a GPO from an OU, right click the GPO and select Delete. Click OK and note that you did not delete the GPO itself, but only the link between the GPO and the OU. If you would like to relink a GPO, right click on the appropriate OU and select Link Existing GPO. Select the newly created GPO from the list and select OK. GPOs can be linked to multiple OUs at once. To link a GPO to multiple OUs, click another OU and repeat the previous steps. To delete a GPO itself and not just its links, expand the Group Policy Objects folder. Right click on the GPO and select Delete. Select Yes at the prompt. Notice that the GPO has been removed from all of the other OUs that we had linked it to. You can also disable GPOs by right-clicking on the GPO and unchecking Link Enabled. Notice how the icon changes. To re-enable the link, right-click on the GPO and choose the same option. That's all you need to know right now for managing GPOs, so good job and I'll see you in the next lecture. As you've learned before, to edit a GPO, you need to right-click on the desired GPO and select Edit. We will choose the default domain policy. You are presented with a new window which shows you the two primary configuration settings, computer configuration and user configuration. The user settings will only apply if there are user objects inside of the OU. These settings will also apply to any user objects that reside in sub-OUs. So if the GPO is linked to the domain, it'll apply to everything that's beneath the domain. If it's applied to a particular OU, it'll apply to everything inside of that OU and in sub-OUs. This also applies to computer configuration and computer objects, meaning if you edit settings under user configuration but link the GPO to an OU that only contains computer objects, the settings will not be applied. So let me try to be a little bit clear about this. If you set a GPO and you link it to an OU that only contains computers, and then you edit settings under the user configuration, those settings will not be applied to anything under any circumstances because there's only computer objects in the SEB OU. If you want to edit user settings, you need to link the GPO to where the particular user account resides. 
Both the user and computer configuration options have two sub-options titled Policies and Preferences. Policies contain software settings, Windows settings, and administrative templates. Preferences contain Windows settings and control panel settings. Each of these categories contain too many settings to cover each individually, but I'd like to encourage you to go ahead and browse through all the different settings and see exactly what kind of settings you can change with Group Policy. To edit a setting, first decide whether you're linking the GPO to an OU that contains user accounts, computer accounts, or both. Since we're adding the default domain policy, which is linked to the whole domain, there will be both user and computer accounts which reside in sub-OUs. Let's configure this GPO to block domain users from using remote desktop. To do this, select Computer Configuration, Policies, Windows Settings, Security Settings, Local Policies, and User Rights Assignment. Look for the setting that reads Deny Logon Through Remote Desktop Services. Right click and choose Properties. Check the checkbox which reads Define These Policy Settings and click Add User or Group. Select Browse and type in Domain Users. Now select Check Names and select OK and click OK again. Please note that in my domain, my domain admins do not have the Domain Users group, so they will still be able to use Remote Desktop. But if you just go in and make this change and your domain admins already have the domain users group, which is likely unless you've changed it, this will cause a problem. Select Apply and click OK. Notice that under the policy settings, we can see what we have configured. Now go ahead and close the GPO. Now if the GPO isn't highlighted in the little explore window on your left, go ahead and select the GPO and under default domain policy, click on settings. And you may receive what looks like an error titled Internet Explorer. And this is okay, this is normal. It's just a security setting that is set to block certain types of content. So if it really bothers you, you can go ahead and allow this content. Uh, but we're just gonna go ahead and ignore it and click close. Here we can view all of the settings that are applied by the particular GPO. Look under the computer configuration settings for the setting that we configured. We can see that it has been configured and saved to the GPO and will be applied to our domain the next time our domain workstations refresh their policies. And that not just domain workstations, but any computer object that resides under the parent domain, which is everything in our domain, obviously. Now that concludes our lecture on how to edit and apply group policy object settings. Now, great job, and I will see you in the next lectures. Sometimes you will want to create an OU that will not take any settings from GPOs that are not directly applied to the OU. For example, when you're testing a troubleshooting group policy, you may want to have an OU that won't take settings from all of your domain policies, maybe just one group policy object, or whatever the case may be. To do this, I'm going to open Active Directory Users and Computers, and I'm going to create a new OU under the Manage Users and Domain Users OUs I have set up, and I'm going to clearly label it as Test Non-Inheriting. And the reason for this is that you don't want other administrators or yourself coming back later and adding in users to this OU when it doesn't inherit all of your group policy objects. Just as a side note, you can create test OUs for computer accounts as well. It's not just limited to user accounts. Just in this example, it's easier for me to show you on a user account. So I'm going to create a new user account under this new test OU that I made. And I'm going to name it just test and I'm going to set up a password that's easy for me to remember. Remember to uncheck the user must change password checkbox when you create the account. So all we've done so far is created an OU named test and we've created a user account under that OU. At this point, the OU will function like all other organizational units, meaning that it's going to grab all the GPOs that are applied to anything equal at its level or above at its level. So all these GPOs that I have linked in the top root of the domain and in the manage users folder, these are all going to be applied. So we need to open group policy management and once that comes up, we need to navigate over to where the OU is, and we need to right click on the OU and choose Block Inheritance. Now any unenforced GPOs that are linked above this OU will not take effect. Note that you can link GPOs directly to this OU and they will work, just anything above the OU will not take effect unless it is enforced. So if you enforce any of the policies that are linked above this OU, those settings will apply to anything inside the container. All right, so now that we understand that, let's log into our test account and see if any of our policy objects like WUDME default domain or default domain policy are being applied. Now I'm gonna log into my Windows 10 workstation and I'm gonna open command prompt and I'm gonna type in GP result space forward slash R. And if we look under applied group policy objects, we can see that it says N slash A. 
So now we're free to create new group policy objects and link them directly to this test OU, and there will not be any interference from GPOs that are linked at the root domain. This is great for troubleshooting, and this is great for testing. All right, so I wanted to show you that little trick. I hope it comes in handy later. Great job, and I will see you in the next lecture. Group policy will not always function like you expect. Most of the time when group policy appears to be malfunctioning though, it's usually an error on the administrator side and not a bug with Microsoft. However, in either case, you need to know how to troubleshoot group policy and that's what you're gonna learn in this lecture. The first thing you want to check is the scope of the group policy object. The first thing that you should do is make sure that it's linked to the appropriate organizational unit. And like we said before, computer configuration settings will only apply if the OU they are linked to contains computer objects and likewise for user configuration settings and user objects. We can also check to see what GPOs are applied to our computer and user accounts from the command prompt. To do this, log into the target user account or computer. Click the Windows button and type in CMD. Now you'll see command prompt pops up, right click on that and select run as administrator and select yes if you're prompted by user account control. Now once that comes up, type in gp result space forward slash r. Now go ahead and maximize the window as it'll make it easier to view the information. The first thing we see is some basic information about the computer including profile paths and OS settings. Next we can view the computer settings that are being applied by our GPOs. The first line directly after computer settings is the OU where the object resides. The rest of the information in this section will tell you what server group policy is being applied from as well as your domain name and domain type. Next we see a list of all the applied group policy objects. Note that these are objects that apply computer configuration settings as we described in the editing group policy objects lecture. After this is the GPOs that are filtered out. This will also list a reason as to why they were filtered out. If it says empty, this means that the entire GPO is filtered out because there are no computer configuration settings inside of this particular GPO. Next is listed all the security groups that the computer object is a member of. After that is the exact same set of categories but for the user account instead. So this is the user account that you're currently logged into, which I'm logged into udemy, wudemy slash ebarboza. You can see what server the group policy is coming from, you can view all the GPOs that are applied or filtered out, and what user groups the account is a member of. Now go ahead and close command prompt by typing in exit or just clicking on the close button. Now let's say we need a little more detail and we want to know what setting is being configured by what GPO. To do this we use a tool called RSOP. To use this tool, click the Windows button and type in rsop.msc and then choose the appropriate option when it pops up. Now go ahead and wait for the RSOP to be generated and once that's done you'll notice that this one is very similar to the group policy management window. However, you cannot edit any of the settings so this is a read only type of deal. Now the purpose of RSOP is to show you what GPO is configuring what setting. Now this will be useful in scenarios where you create a GPO and you configure a setting but it's not being taken on the machine. So this will show you exactly what GPO is configuring the setting. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the remote desktop setting we configured in an earlier lecture. Click Computer Configuration, Windows Settings, Security Settings, Local Policies, User Write Assignment, and look for the Deny Logon through Remote Desktop Services setting. Notice that it shows the computer setting and the source GPO. You can double click on the setting to view more information if you want to. So that's it for this lecture. Now you know how to troubleshoot it from the server side, whereas you're making sure that it's applying to the right OU, and now you know how to check it from the client side, reaching back to the server and seeing what settings are actually being applied on the workstation. So good job learning that. That's very valuable information, and I'll see you in the next lecture. A logon banner is often a requirement in corporate environments. In the Windows world, this is called an interactive login. This banner is displayed right before a user attempts to enter a username and password. Most of the time, companies will want you to display a message that alerts the user that if they try to log into a machine they're not supposed to, they can get into legal trouble. Let's go ahead and set up one of these banners. I'm going to do this inside of my WUDEMY domain policy. Now, if you didn't follow my Windows System Administration for Beginners course, then you probably don't have this group policy object, which is fine. You can either create the object right now, or you can use the default domain policy. Now the reason I'm choosing this particular group policy object is that it's linked to the domain and it's going to affect all my domain systems. So I'm going to right click on the desired GPO and select edit. Under computer configuration select policies, window settings, security settings, local policies, 
and security options. Now scroll down until you find interactive logon message text for users attempting to log on. Right click on this setting and select properties. Choose define this policy setting in the template and type in a message into the large text box. I'm going to type prepare to be pooned if you do not belong here. Now if you're in a corporate domain I wouldn't recommend necessarily typing this in maybe go with something more professional but it's up to you. Click OK and choose message title for users attempting to log on right below the last option. Right click and choose properties. Again choose define this policy setting and type in a title. I'm going to type in all caps warning. Select OK and close the group policy management editor. Now I've switched to a workstation which is running Windows 10 and is joined to my domain. I'm going to open command prompt as you've learned before and I'm going to type in gp update space forward slash force. This forces the computer to refresh its group policy settings. Once this is completed I'm going to type in log off. Now once you've logged out of the machine attempt to log back in and notice the message appears just as we configured it in group policy. Alright, so that is how you set up a logon banner using the interactive logon settings in group policy. Great job, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Now, many of you have requested a lecture on controlling user access to websites. Group policy has Internet Explorer settings, but many times you will have other browsers such as Chrome or Firefox. So if we're trying to block websites, we need to get to the root of the problem. When a user types in an address such as Facebook.com, the computer will ask the local DNS server for the IP address first. If it can't find it there, then it will go out to the Internet and find the IP address. What we need to do is tell our local DNS server that the IP address is something different than it actually is. So our users will type in Facebook.com and our DNS server will apply back with a different IP address that will route them to something other than Facebook.com. Most of the time you'll be routing them to a web server on your local network and a web page that says they're trying to access a link that is not allowed or this web page is blocked, etc. Now, just as a side note, hackers use this method and they call it DNS poisoning. And they use DNS to point you to a malicious website. So, for example, they might reroute Facebook.com to their own web server that looks like Facebook.com and it even works like Facebook.com, but when you type in your username and password, it records that and emails it to the hacker and it might even really log you into Facebook and forward you onto the real site at that point, but you wouldn't know the difference because the link still says Facebook.com even though it rerouted you to a different IP address. Now when you're on the job, if you rerouted someone to a malicious web page, you can almost guarantee that you're going to get fired. Not only that, but there's going to be legal ramifications as well. So when you're rerouting someone's DNS, you really want to make sure that you're pointing them to a page that says the page you're trying to visit is blocked or it's not accessible or you're not supposed to be looking at it. Or you can just loop them back to the local IP address as we're going to do. Let's hop onto our workstation and ping Facebook.com. So I'm going to open command prompt and I'm going to type in ping space Facebook.com. Now my workstation is inside of an internal network, meaning that it cannot reach the outside world. So if I went to my web browser and typed in Facebook.com, it would say the page is unavailable. So when I try to ping Facebook.com, we're going to see that it's just going to hang and finally say that it could not find the host. If this computer was connected to the internet, it would show the replies from the web host Facebook.com, or at least it would show the IP address of Facebook.com. Now if we go on our domain controller and we change the record for Facebook.com to 127.0.0.1, and then we come back to this computer and we try to ping Facebook.com, we're going to get replies from 127.0.0.1, and that's because our computer this workstation completely believes our domain controller when it says Facebook.com address is 127.0.0.1. Now, of course, we know that that's not the case because that address is the loopback address. So basically, we're sending the user back to his own computer. But this is the fastest way to start blocking websites if you need to get it done fast. Now, there are a few loopholes with this method. And one of them is that the user can type in the actual correct IP address of the server. So if somebody has memorized Facebook.com's IP address, they can just type in the IP address and access the site that way. However, IP addresses change from day to day or from week to week or month to month. So it's up to you if you wanted, you could go into Windows Firewall and create blocks for certain IP addresses, but you would need to check and see if the IP addresses have changed and update them accordingly. Okay, so now that you understand how this works, let's go ahead and get it done. Now on your domain controller, open Server Manager and click Tools and DNS. Expand your server and right click on Forward Lookup Zones. Choose New Zone and click Next. Make sure Primary Zone is checked 
and click Next. If you followed my Windows System Administration for Beginners course and built these servers, choose To All DNS Servers Running on Domain Controllers in this domain, wudemy.local. If you're in a forest, choose that option or whatever the appropriate option is for your network and click Next. Under the zone name, type in the website that you want to block without the www or the http. I'm going to type facebook.com. Click Next, choose Do Not Allow Dynamic Updates, click Next, and Finish. We can see that the new forward lookup zone has been created. Right click on the new zone and choose New Host. Leave the name blank and type in the IP address that you want to reroute users to when they type in facebook.com. If you have a local website server, you can reroute the user there, or you can type in 127.0.0.1, which is obviously a loopback address, and I'm going to go ahead and type this in. Click Add Host and click Done. Now let's switch over to our workstation and test. Like I said before, my computers are not connected to the internet, but we can still test to see if our computers will think the IP address of Facebook.com is now 127.0.0.1. In command prompt, type in ipconfig space forward slash flush DNS, and this will refresh our DNS records from our domain controller. Now try to ping facebook.com. Notice now there is a reply from the IP address 127.0.0.1. Now even if I was connected to the internet, I could not visit facebook.com because I have a reroute in place to a loopback IP address. So that's all you need to do. Great job, and I will see you in the next lecture. We're going to deploy roaming profiles in two steps. The first step is to create the share drive where the roaming profiles will be stored. The next step is to create a GPO that will tell the computers where to find and store their roaming profiles. Okay, so it's pretty simple, so let's get into it. I'm logged into my domain controller and under Server Manager, click on File and Storage Services. Click on Shares and in the Shares pane, right click and select New Share. Choose SMB Share, Quick, and click Next. I'm going to choose an alternative drive. I have a D drive set up, but you can choose the C drive if you wish. Click Next. Go ahead and type in a share name. Now, Microsoft recommends that you add the dollar sign to the end of the share name, as this will hide the folder from the casual browser. Take note of the share path, as this is the path we're going to need to configure in group policy. Okay, so you might want to write that down. All right, now click Next. Uncheck Allow Caching of Share. Click Next. Click Customize Permissions. Click Disable Inheritance, then click Convert Inherited Permissions into Explicit Permissions on this object. And remove any unnecessary users you see in this list. Now select WUDEMY slash users, or whatever your domain is, slash users, and select Edit, and click Show Advanced Permissions. Uncheck everything except for List Folder slash Read Data, and Create Folders slash Append Data. Under Applies To, select This Folder Only. Click OK and click OK again, click Next, and then click Create. Next, we need to create a GPO called Roaming Profiles. We're going to configure computer settings, so this GPO needs to link to an OU that contains the computer objects where we want to have Roaming Profiles applied. Now I have an OU I've already created and set up called Manage Computers, and this is where I put all my domain workstations. So I'm going to link the GPO to this OU, and all the computer settings will apply to all my workstations in my domain. So I'm going to create the GPO, and I'm going to name it Roaming Profiles, click OK. And now what we want to do is right click on the GPO and uncheck Link Enabled. Now this is because we don't want settings being applied until we're completely done setting up Roaming Profiles. Right click the GPO and choose Edit. Now under Computer Configuration, navigate to Policies, Administrative Templates, System, and User Profiles. Look for the Set Roaming Profile Path for all users logging onto this computer setting. Right click and select Edit. Click on Enabled. Now this is where we're going to enter in that path to the share drive that we created earlier. Remember the one I told you to write down. So I'm going to go ahead and type in that path and then type in backslash percent sign username in all caps percent sign and backslash. Now this is a wild card for whatever username happens to be. So if you're logged into B Guten or E Barboza, it'll insert that into the file path. Click OK and close the GPO. Now the last thing that we need to do here is right click on the GPO and select link enabled. 
All right, so that's all we need to do on the domain controller. So we can close all these windows and we can lock the domain controller. Or we can log out, whatever you'd like to do. Now I'm going to switch over and um, both of my workstations, I have two Windows 10 workstations joined to my domain. So I'm going to log into both of them, run a GP update and reboot both workstations. Okay, so now that I've updated the policies on both the workstations and I've rebooted them, I'm going to log into my first workstation and I'm going to create a folder on the desktop. And I'm just going to call this folder test. Okay. So I can go inside that folder and make a new text document. Uh, just call that like test file. And okay, so I'm done with that. I'm going to close all these windows and I'm going to log out of the workstation. Now I'm going to switch over here to my second workstation and I'm going to log in. And we can see that the files that I created on the first workstation are accessible from the second workstation. So good job. You've successfully set up roaming profiles and I will see you in the next lecture. Group policy can greatly simplify the process of installing software on your network. Instead of going to each computer individually and downloading and installing the software, you can create a GPO that will install the software on the next reboot of the workstation. So this is really valuable if you have two or three hundred workstations, not to mention, you know, having over a thousand. The first thing that we need to do is download Flash. Now open Internet Explorer and search for Adobe Flash MSI download. The first link is the Adobe Flash Player Distribution Adobe page. Click on this page and scroll down to Downloads. Choose the latest MSI version that you want. There's Internet Explorer and then there's Plugin Base, which would be for Firefox or, or different browsers. Chrome comes with its own Flash and the Internet Explorer version is for IE. I'm going to download the Plugin Based version. Now that I've downloaded Flash, I need to get it onto my shared drive so it'll be accessible from my domain workstations. I could burn the installer to a disk or place it on a thumb drive and transfer it that way, but since my domain is built entirely on virtual machines and I'm using VirtualBox, I can just drag and drop the file to my server desktop. Now I need to place the file on the shared drive. Now open Server Manager on your domain controller and navigate to File and Storage Services. Click on Shares, and if you followed my Windows System Administration course for beginners, you're going to have this share already created called Group Policy. If you don't have it, you can create a new share, and I'll right-click on the share and select Properties so you can see what permissions I have set up. All authenticated users need to have the ability to read and execute files in the directory. So now that you've seen how my share drive is set up and you can create your own with the appropriate permissions, I'm going to go ahead and copy this MSI to the share drive. Next, I'm going to open Group Policy Management and create a new GPO named Software Installation. And it's going to be for my Managed Computers OU, because like I've said before, this is where I keep all my domain workstations. Right-click on the GPO and select Edit. Under Computer Configuration, choose Policies, Software Settings, Software Installation. Right-click in the pane and choose New, Package. Navigate to the share drive by typing in the network path to the share drive. So don't go to C drive or the D drive and group policy. You need to do backslash backslash your server name and then the share drive name. Select the MSI and click open. Choose assigned and click OK. So now we can see the MSI is in the list of software packages. So we can close out a group policy and we're done on this domain controller. Now let's switch over to the workstation, open command prompt and run GP update forward slash force. When this is updated, you should receive a message saying the policy was unable to process all the settings because they need to be run at startup or log on. When you're prompted to restart, type in Y and either wait for the computer to restart or type in shutdown forward slash R forward slash T zero. This tells the computer to shut down and it tells it to reboot and then it says in time zero seconds. So it basically says restart right now. So now that the computer is rebooted, let's log in and let's open control panel and click on programs and features. And there we can see that Flash has been installed. So that is all we need to do to deploy Adobe Flash with group policy. Great job and I'll see you in the next lecture. To deploy Java with group policy, we need to extract the MSI from the EXE installer and then place the download in a share drive and add the deployment package in group policy. Open Internet Explorer and navigate to java.com forward slash en forward slash download forward slash manual dot jsp. Under Windows, choose one of the offline installers and download it to your computer. Transfer the file to the DC and start the executable. 
When the Welcome to Java window comes up, ignore it, don't click Next, and open Windows Explorer. Navigate to C slash users slash percent username percent, notice the wildcard again, slash app data slash local low slash oracle slash Java. Look for the latest version of Java and open that folder. Inside that folder you can find the MSI file. Copy this MSI file to your share drive and close Windows Explorer. Next we need to open Server Manager and open the Group Policy Management Console. Open the Software Installation GPO and like we did before, we need to add a new software package. Select the new MSI and click Open. Now once you're done with that, close Group Policy Management and switch over to your workstation. Open Command Prompt and type in gpupdate forward slash force. When you receive the prompt, go ahead and reboot the workstation. Now that that's done, log back into the workstation and check the installed programs to verify that Java has been installed. And that's it for this one. Great job and I'll see you in the next lecture. Deploying the latest version of Adobe Reader is a bit more complicated than what you've done so far. Adobe usually offers EXEs for the .0 releases, that is 11.0.0 for example, and every 10th release, or 11.0.10. The rest of the versions, 11.0.1 or 11.0.2, are delivered in MSP format, so there's no way for us to deploy them with group policy. So if you wanted to deploy the latest version of Reader, which at this moment is 11.0.14, you would need to download the latest executable from the Adobe Reader FTP site, extract the exe, extract the extracted files, patch in the MSP files, and then transfer those files to your shared drive and deploy them with group policy. Now a lot of people struggle with this, but it's really not as bad as it sounds. So let's get into it and I'll show you how it's done. Open your preferred web browser and navigate to ftp.adobe.com forward slash pub slash adobe slash reader slash win. The latest version, like I said before, is 11.0.14, so I'm going to open the 11.x folder. I'm going to open the 11.0.10 since that is the 10th release and that would be the latest executable download. And I'm going to navigate to en underscore us and I'm going to download Adobe Reader 11.0.10 enus.exe. Next I'm going to navigate back and go to the 11.0.14 slash misc folder since this is the latest version that's available at this point in time. Now I'm going to download the Adobe Reader update 11.0.14.msp file. Now that I have both files downloaded, I'm going to transfer them onto my domain controller and I'm going to place them in the same folder. I'm going to choose the C drive in a folder called Adobe 11.0.14 deployment. Once that is complete, I'm going to open command prompt and I'm going to cd into that path. Now I'm going to run the following command and just as a little bit of side information, I'm going to be using something called tab completion. And it's when you press the tab button, if you've typed in, let's say you're on the C drive and there's a folder called test, and you type in TE and you press tab, tab completion will go ahead and put in the ST so it'll complete the word for you. So you're going to see me using that. So when I'm typing and all of a sudden it just fills in the information, I'm pressing tab. Now if there was a folder called test and another folder called test2 and I press tab, it would first go to test. And then the next time I press tab, it would go to test two. So you can kind of cycle through items in the directory. Just a little side information, that'll make your life a lot easier when you're typing in these long commands. So this is a command you need to type in. A-D-B-E-R-D-R-1-1-0-1-0 underscore E-N underscore U-S dot E-X-E space dash N-O-S underscore N-E space dash N-O-S underscore O and then no space, quotation marks, C colon backslash, Adobe space 11014 space deployment, backslash Adobe space 11014 space AIP, end quotation mark. 
Run that command and notice this has extracted the exe. Now we need to extract the extracted files. Go back to command prompt and cd to the newly extracted files inside of the Adobe 11014 AIP folder. Type in the following command. MSIEXEC stands for MSI exec space forward slash a space open quotation marks acro read dot msi end quotation mark execute that and when the installer begins click through the prompts and choose an installation path i'm going to choose c adobe reader 11014 and i'm going to use underscores instead of spaces click install and once the setup is complete close the window in command prompt CD to the directory where you store the MSP file. Once you are in that directory, type in the following command. MSI exec space forward slash a space open quotation mark C Adobe Reader 11014 slash acro read dot MSI end quotation marks space forward slash p space open quotation marks, Adobe Reader Update 11014.msp, end quotation marks. Enter the command and click next to the setup wizard and wait for it to finish. Once that's complete, open Windows Explorer and navigate to the C Adobe Reader 1114 directory. Double click on acroread.msi and check the version to verify it reads 11.0.14. And here we can see it does. So now we have an MSI, when we run it, it will install the latest version of Adobe Reader. Perfect. Now we need to copy this new folder, the Adobe Reader 11014 folder, to our share drive where we deploy MSIs from. Once you're done with that, open Server Manager, click Tools, Group Policy Management, and edit the software installation GPO that we've been using for the last few lectures. Now like we've done before, we need to add the acroread MSI file to the list of deployed packages. So navigate to Software Installations, right click and select New Package, select the new MSI and choose Assigned. Hit OK and we can see the new package has been assigned. Now it's time to log into our workstations and test to see if the software is actually installed and to see if it's 11.0.14 or if it'll come up as 11.0.10. Log into one of your workstations and open command prompt and run a gp update forward slash force. Reboot when you are prompted. Once the reboot is complete, log back into the workstation. There we can see that Adobe Reader is on the desktop, so that's great, installed. But is it the latest version? So start up Adobe Reader, and right away we can see the version here is 11.0.14, which is great. So if you want, you can log all the way in and click on Help and About Adobe Reader, and you can double check the version again. But here we can see that we have installed Adobe Reader at the latest version. Great job on that, and I will see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to learn how to prevent users from creating insecure passwords, and we're going to set up a rule that will lock out accounts after three failed attempts. Open Group Policy Management and either create a new GPO or edit an existing GPO. I'm going to edit the default domain policy. One very important thing to keep in mind is that these settings are already configured in the default domain policy. So if you create a new GPO and you configure these settings, you're going to end up with two GPOs that are fighting over the same settings. Now you could just right click on your new GPO and say enforced and that will cause that GPO to have precedence over all other GPOs, but ideally you don't want two GPOs trying to configure the same setting and having different settings. So either just edit the default domain policy like I'm going to do, or once you've created your new GPO and set up all the settings, go back into the default domain policy and clear out all the configured settings. And that of course will resolve all the conflicting issues. Now once you have your GPO open, navigate to Computer Configuration, Policies, Windows Settings, Security Settings, Account Policies, and Password Policy. First, I'm going to choose Enforce Password History. This will cause the system to remember the previous passwords that they have used and prevent them from using them again. I'm going to choose to remember 10 passwords. Now you can set this to whatever you'd like and once you're done hit OK. Next we're going to choose Maximum Password Age. This setting determines how long a user can use their password before they need to change it. 
I'm going to enter 34 days. Click OK again. I'm going to change the minimum password age to zero because I want my users to be able to change their password whenever they want. Next I'm going to choose the minimum password length and I'm going to set this to the highest it can go at 14. Click OK and choose the password must meet complexity requirements. Of course we're going to enable this setting. Open the store passwords using reversible encryption setting and set this to disabled. Basically this is like storing a password in clear text. It's not a good idea. Next navigate to account lockout policy on the left. Choose Account Lockout Duration and choose the desired amount of time for the account to be locked out. I'm going to choose 15 minutes. Click OK. You'll get a pop-up for suggested value changes and click OK again. You can see that I configured the other required settings for you. I'm going to go ahead and change the account lockout threshold to three and valid attempts. So now that we're done configuring these settings, close Group Policy Management and log into one of your workstations and run a GP update. Next, log out of the machine and attempt to log in with a bad password. Enter three bad passwords and you'll receive a message stating the account is locked out. Next, we can attempt to create a simple password and we can see how the GPO is preventing this from happening. Now that's it for this lecture. Great job and I'll see you in the next one. To configure Windows Firewall Group Policy, I'm going to create a new GPO and I'm going to call it WUdemy Firewall Policy. I'm going to link it to my domain and I'm going to edit the policy and navigate to Computer Configuration, Policies, Windows Settings, Security Settings, Windows Firewall with Advanced Security, and again Windows Firewall with Advanced Security dash LDAP. Now I'm going to right click on inbound rules and select new rule. Now here you can specify whether you want to create you know, an exception for a port, program, or whatever. I'm going to choose port and I'm going to create an exception for port 1234. Now I'm opening these ports only for an example and once I'm done with this lecture I'm going to go back and I'm going to remove these ports because you don't want to have open ports on the firewall unless you need them open for a particular service. The only reason I'm opening these ports is so you can learn how it's done. Just want to make that clear. Don't leave these ports open unless you're actually going to use it for something. Now click next to the prompts and give the rule a name and finally click finish. Close out of group policy management and log out of the server and we're going to log into one of our domain joined workstations. Once you're logged into the workstation, open command prompt and run a GP update. Once this is complete, press the Windows key and type in rsop.msc. Now RSOP will show all the policies that are being applied to the workstation and it will show you which GPO is applying what policy. It's great for troubleshooting. So once it's generated all the data, navigate to Computer Configuration, Administrative Templates, and Extra Registry Settings. We need to look for the Extra Registry setting that is being applied from the new group policy object. Here we can see it and if we double click on the item you can view the related information. So we can see port 1234 was opened and etc. Now great job on this and I'm going to go back and turn off these firewall exceptions and if you do not have a service running on these ports that you just opened then I suggest that you go back and turn off the exceptions as well. Alright great job and I'll see you in the next lecture. Before we get into this lecture, I want to warn you that if you are changing random registry settings, you can cause serious and irreversible damage that will require you to reformat your computers in order to get them working properly again. So I strongly recommend that before you make any changes, you know exactly what the result will be and you test the changes in a test environment before deploying them to a production environment. With that being said, we're going to create a new registry setting that will allow us to right click on any file type and choose open with notepad. Now to do this we're going to need to create a new registry setting. In order to create a registry setting with group policy, open the GPO where you would like to add the registry setting. Now I'm going to create a new GPO called WUdemy Registry Policy. Now right click on the desired GPO 
And in my case, I'm gonna click on the new GPU I just made and select edit. Now, once the console opens, navigate to either computer configuration or user configuration if you only wanna apply this to admins or domain users, for example, and navigate to preferences, window settings. Now, right click on registry and select new registry item. Now you can choose create, replace, update, or delete, but for this example, we're gonna choose the create action. Under Hive, select H key classes root. And under key path, select the browse button. Next, navigate to H key classes root, star, and shell. Now click select. Now append backslash open space with space notepad backslash command onto the key path that was already created. Under the value name, check the default checkbox. Under value data, enter notepad.exe space percent one. Click OK and close out of group policy management. We can first test this on domain controller since we linked our GPO to the root of our domain. I'm gonna check the image file I am using in my domain wallpaper. So for you, just navigate to any file that does not have the .txt extension. Right click. And now you can see there that I have an option to open in Notepad. Now we need to test on our workstations and make sure the setting is taking effect. So log out of the domain controller and log into your domain workstations with a domain admin account. Now, as always, open command prompt and type in gp update forward slash force. Once this is complete, type in R-E-G-E-D-I-T, stands for registry edit and select yes if you're prompted by user access control. Once you have regedit open, look for the new key that we created. Here we can see that the registry value does indeed exist. Now let's test and see if it works. As an example, I'm gonna open Windows Explorer and navigate to C, Program Files x86, Windows Mail, and I'm gonna right click on one of the DLLs in this directory. Note that it gives me an option to open with Notepad. And when I click on this, I can successfully do so. And that's how you edit registry settings in group policy. Great job, and I'll see you in the next lecture. In this section, we're going to create two folders under our projects drive, and we're going to call them group A and group B. Our goal is to only allow members of group A to access the files in the folder called group A, and the same for group B. To do this, open Active Directory Users and Computers, Select or create an OU in which you would like to create your groups. I have an OU called Managed Groups where I will create my two groups. Right click and select New Group. Enter the name for Group A and click OK. Right click and select New Group again. Enter the name Group B and click OK again. Next we need to add users to the two groups. Open Group A and click the Members tab. Add your desired domain user account. Note that we're not adding a domain administrator account. Open Group B, click the Members tab again, and add another domain user account. Click OK, and that's it for this lecture. I will see you in the next one. Now that we have the group set up, we need to create the folders, set up the folder permissions, and publish the shared drives to Active Directory. To do this, we'll open Server Manager and click File and Storage Services. Next, click on Shares, and in the Shares pane, right-click and choose New Share. Choose SMB-Quick and click Next. Choose a custom path and select your desired path. Once you're in the desired path, select New Folder and make the folder for Group A. I'm going to make this easy and call the folder Group A. Click Select Folder at the bottom of the window and click Next. Click Next again and choose Customize Permissions. Click Disable Inheritance and then Convert Inherited Permissions into Explicit Permissions on this object. Next, remove domain users from the list and your domain account that you're currently logged on to. Remember to allow system and administrators full control as you don't want users hiding files from domain admins. Now let's add in the new group that we created for group A. Select add and choose select a principal. Now type in group A and click OK. Check the full control checkbox and click OK. Select OK again and complete the new share wizard. Now we need to complete these steps for group B. So right click on the shares pane and click new share. Choose SMB share dash quick and click next. Specify your desired path and create the folder for group B. Click next, select next again and choose customize permissions. 
Again, click Disable Inheritance and convert inherent permissions into explicit permissions on this object. Remove domain users and your own personal account that you're logged into. Choose Add and click Select a Principal. Add Group B and click OK. Make sure you check Full Control and click OK. Now select OK through the prompts and complete the new share wizard. Now you can see that we've created the share drives for both Group A and Group B. So what we need to do now is publish them to Active Directory. Open Active Directory Users and Computers. And once that comes up, right click in the desired location and I'm going to use the root of my domain and choose New Shared Folder. Type in the name and the path to the Group A Share Folder. The easiest way to get the path is to navigate with Windows Explorer and just copy and paste. Remember to use a network path to your server and don't include references like C drive or the D drive. For example, C colon backslash uh, projects or D colon backslash. So in my case, I will use backslash backslash WDC 111 backslash and then group A or group B. Okay, so click OK and then we'll create the new shared folder for group B. All right, so now that we have both shared folders created in Active Directory, you're done with this lecture, and I will see you in the next one. Now we need to create a GPO to automatically map the new folders as drives for the target users. Open Group Policy Management, and once that opens, navigate to an OU above or level with where your target user objects reside. We need to create two new GPOs, the first called WUdemy Group A, and the second called WUdemy Group B. Select the group policy object for group A and under security filtering, remove authenticated users and add group A. Next select the GPO for group B and repeat these steps. Edit the GPO for group A and navigate to user configuration, preferences, Windows settings, drive maps. Right click and select new drive. Select the browse button. Click the Find Now button if nothing is in your list and choose Group A. Choose the drive letter and check the Reconnect checkbox and click OK. Close the Group Policy Management Editor. Now we need to do the same thing for Group B. So again, open that GPO and navigate to User Configuration, Preferences, Windows Settings, Drive Maps. Right click and select New Drive. Select the Browse button. Click the Find Now button if you need to and choose Group B. Choose a drive letter and check the reconnect checkbox and click OK. Alright, so that's it for this lecture. You can close group policy management and you can log out of the domain controller. Now all that's left is testing, so I will see you in the next lecture. So the last thing that we need to do is to make sure that our new share folders are secure and that other groups cannot access you know, the wrong group's folders. So log into one of your domain workstations with a user account that you added to group A and open Windows Explorer and click this PC. Notice you can see that the network drive A is listed. Open the drive and attempt to create a new text document. And there you can see that we can. And this, the reason for this is because we gave the users in group A full control. Now I'll try to access group B's folder. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type in backslash backslash WDC 111 backslash group B. And you can see that we get access denied, and that's just what we want. So now we need to repeat these steps for group B and make sure they can't access group A, but they can access their own folders. So I'm going to log out, and now I'm going to log in with the account that I added to group B. And I'm going to attempt to create a file under the group B folder. Okay, and that works great. The next thing I'm going to try and do is try to navigate manually to group A's folder. And you can see that we get access denied, which is exactly what we want. So that wraps it up. Great job, and I will see you in the next lecture.